Section 1 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari. Translated by Gaston de C. de Vere. Section 1. Life of Niccolo, called Tribolo, Sculptor and Architect. Raffaello the Carpenter, surnamed Il Riccio di Pericoli, who lived near the canto a Monteloro in Florence, had borne to him in the year 1500, as he used to tell me himself, a male child, whom he was pleased to call at baptism like his own father, Niccolo and having perceived that the boy had a quick and ready intelligence and a lofty spirit he determined although he was but a poor artisan that he should begin straightway by learning to read and write well and cast accounts sending him to school therefore it came about since the child was very vivacious and so high-spirited in his every action that he was always cramped for room and was a very devil both among the other boys at school and everywhere else always teasing and tormenting both himself and others that he lost his own name of niccolo and acquired that of tribolo to such purpose that he was called that ever afterwards by every one now tribolo growing his father in order both to make use of him and to curb the boy's exuberance took him into his workshop and taught him his own trade but having seen in a few months that he was ill-suited for such a calling, being somewhat delicate, thin, and feeble in health, he came to the conclusion that if he wished to keep him alive, he must release him from the heavier labors of his craft and set him to wood-carving. Having heard that without design, the father of all the arts, the boy could not become an excellent master therein, Raffaello resolved that he should begin by devoting all his time to design, and therefore made him draw now cornices, foliage, and grotesques, and now other things necessary to such a profession and having seen that in doing this the boy was well served both by his head and by his hand and reflecting like a man of judgment that with him niccolo could at best learn nothing else but to work by the square raffaello first spoke of this with the carpenter chiappino who is the very familiar friend of nani ungero and with his advice and assistance he placed niccolo for three years with the said nani in whose workshop, where both joiner's work and carving were done, there were constantly to be found the sculptor Jacopo Sansovino, the painter Andreo del Sarto, and others who afterwards became such able masters. Now Nani, who had in those days a passing good reputation for excellence, was executing many works, both in joinery and in carving, for the villa of Zanobi Bartolini at Rovisano, without the Porta alla Croce, for the palace of the Bartolini, which Giovanni, the brother of that Zanobi, was having built at that time on the Piazza di Santa Trinita, and for the house and garden of the same man in Gualfanda, and Tribolo, who was made to work by Nani without discretion, always having to handle saws, planes, and other common tools, and not being capable, by reason of the feebleness of his body, of such exertions, began to feel dissatisfied, and to say to Riccio, when he asked for the cause of his discontent, that he did not think that he could remain with Nani in that craft, and that therefore Raffaello should see to placing him with Andrea del Sarto or Jacopo Sansovino, whom he had come to know in Angero's workshop, for the reason that with one or the other of them he hoped to do better and to be sounder in health moved by these reasons then and again with the advice and assistance of chiappino 
Riccio placed Tribolo with Jacopo Sansovino, who took him willingly, because he had known him in the workshop of Nani Ungero, and had seen that he worked well in design, and even better in relief. Jacopo Sansovino, when Tribolo, now restored to health, went to work under him, was executing in the office of works of Santa Maria del Fiore, in competition with Benedetto da Rovenzano, Andrea da Fiesoli, and Baccio Bandinelli, the marble statue of St. James the Apostle, which is still to be seen at the present day at that place, together with the others. And thus Tribolo, with these opportunities of learning, by working in clay and drawing with great diligence, contrived to make such proficience in that art, for which he felt a natural inclination, that Jacopo, growing to love him more and more every day, began to encourage him, and to bring him forward, by making him execute now one thing and now another. Whereupon, although Sansovino had in his workshop at that time Solasmio da Settignano and Pippo del Fabro, young men of great promise, seeing that Tribolo, having added skill in the use of chisels to his good knowledge of working in clay and in wax, not only equalled them, but surpassed them by a great measure, he began to make much use of him in his works. And after finishing the apostle and a Bacchus that he made for the house of Giovanni Bartolini in Gualfanda, and undertaking to make for Monsignor Giovanni Gaddi, his intimate friend, a chimney-piece and a water-basin of hard sandstone, for his house on the Piazza di Medana, he caused some large figures of boys in clay, which were to go above the great cornice, to be made by Tribolo, who executed them so extraordinarily well, that Monsignor Giovanni, having seen the beautiful manner and the genius of the young man, commissioned him to execute two medallions of marble, which, finished with great excellence, were afterwards placed over certain doors in the same house. Meanwhile, there was a commission to be given for a tomb, a work of great magnitude for the king of Portugal, and since Jacopo had been the disciple of Andrea Cantucci of Monte Sansovino, and had the reputation not only of having equalled his master, a man of great renown, but of having a manner even more beautiful, that work, through the good offices of the Bartolini, was allotted to him whereupon Jacopo made a most superb model of wood, all covered with scenes and figures of wax, which were executed for the most part by Tribolo. And these proving to be very beautiful, the young man's fame so increased that Matteo de Lorenzo Strozzi, Tribolo having now left Sansovino, thinking that he was by that time able to work by himself, commissioned him to make some children of stone, and shortly afterwards, being much pleased with them, two of marble that are holding a dolphin which pours water into a fish-pond, a work that is now to be seen at San Casciano, a place eight miles distant from Florence, in the villa of that Monsignor Matteo. While these works were being executed by Tribolo in Florence, Monsignor Bartolomeo Barbazzi, a Bolognese gentleman, who had gone there on some business, remembered that a search was being made in Bologna for a young man who could work well, to the end that he might be set to making figures and scenes of marble for the façade of San Petronio, the principal church of that city. Wherefore he spoke to Tribolo, and having seen some of his works, which pleased him, as also did the young man's ways and other qualities, he took him to Bologna, where Tribolo, with great diligence and with much credit to himself, in a short time made the two sibyls of marble that were afterwards placed in the ornament of that door of San Petronio, which leads to the De la Morte Hospital. These works finished, arrangements were being made to give him greater things to do, and he was receiving many proofs of love and affection from Monsignor Bartolomeo when the plague of the year 1525 began in Bologna and throughout all Lombardy. 
whereupon Tribolo, in order to avoid that plague, made his way to Florence. After living there during all the time that this contagious and pestilential sickness lasted, he departed as soon as it had ceased, and returned, in obedience to a summons, to Bologna, where Monsignor Bartolomeo, not allowing him to set his hand to any work for the façade, resolved, seeing that many of his friends and relatives had died, to have a tomb made for himself and for them. And so Tribalo, after finishing the model, which Monsignor Bartolomeo insisted on seeing completed before he did anything else, went in person to Carrara to have the marbles excavated, intending to rough-hew them on the spot, and to lighten them in such a manner that they might not only be easier to transport, as indeed they were, but also that the figures might come out larger. In that place, in order not to waste his time, he blocked out two large children of marble, which were taken to Bologna with beasts of burden, unfinished as they were, together with the rest of the work, and after the death of Monsignor Bartolomeo, which caused such grief to Tribolo that he returned to Tuscany, they were placed with the other marbles in a chapel in San Petronio, where they still are. Having thus departed from Carrara, Tribolo, on his way back to Florence, stayed in Pisa to visit the sculptor Maestro Stagia da Pietra Santa, his very dear friend, who was executing in the office of works of the Duomo, in that city, two columns with capitals of marble, all in open work, which were to stand one on either side of the high altar, and the tabernacle of the sacrament and each of these was to have upon the capital an angel of marble, one braccio and three-quarters in height, with a candelabrum in the hand. At the invitation of the said stagio, having nothing else to do at that time, he undertook to make one of those angels, which being finished with all the perfection that could be given to a delicate work of that size in marble, proved to be such that nothing more could have been desired for the reason that the angel, with the movement of his person, has the appearance of having stayed his flight in order to uphold that light, and the nude form has about it some delicate draperies which are so graceful in their effect, and look so well on every side and from every point of view, that words could not express their beauty. But having consumed much time in executing this work, since he cared for nothing but his delight in art, and not having received for it from the warden the payment that he expected, he resolved that he would not make the other angel and return to Florence. There he met with Giovanni Battista della Palla, who at that time was not only causing all the sculptures and pictures that he could to be executed for sending to King Francis I in France, but was also buying antiques of all sorts and pictures of every kind, provided only that they were by the hands of good masters, and every day he was packing them up and sending them off. Now, at the very moment when Tribolo returned, Giovanni Battista had an ancient vase of granite, of a very beautiful shape, which he wished to arrange in such a manner that it might serve for a fountain for that king. He therefore declared his mind to Tribolo, and what he proposed to have done, and he, setting to work, made him a goddess of nature, who, raising one arm, holds that vase, the foot of which she has upon her head, with the hands, the first row of breasts being adorned with some boys standing out entirely detached from the marble, who are in various most beautiful attitudes, holding certain festoons in their hands, while the next range of breasts is covered with quadrupeds, and at her feet are many different kinds of fishes. That figure was finished with such diligence and such perfection that it well deserved, after being sent to France together with other works, to be held very dear by the king, and to be placed as a rare thing in Fontainebleau. Afterwards, in the year 1529, when preparations were being made for the war against Florence and the siege, 
Pope Clement the Seventh, wishing to study the exact site of the city, and to consider in what manner and in what places his forces could be distributed to the best advantage, ordained that a plan of the city should be made secretly, with all the country for a mile around it, the hills, mountains, rivers, rocks, houses, churches, and other things, and also the squares and streets within, together with the walls and bastions surrounding it, and the other defences. The charge of all this was given to Benvenuto de Lorenzo della Volpaia, an able maker of clocks and quadrants, and a very fine astrologer, but above all a most excellent master in taking ground plans. This Benvenuto chose Tribolo as his companion, and that with great judgment, for the reason that it was Tribolo who suggested that this plan, for the better consideration of the height of the mountains, the depth of the low-lying parts, and all other particulars, should be made in relief, the doing of which was not without much labor and danger, in that, staying out all night to measure the roads, and to mark the number of braccia between one place and another, and also to measure the height of the summits of the belfries and towers, drawing intersecting lines in every direction by means of the compass, and going beyond the walls to compare the height of the hills with that of the coppola, which they had marked as their centre. They did not execute such a work, save after many months, but they used great diligence, for they made it of cork, for the sake of lightness, and limited the whole plan to the space of four braccia, and measured everything to scale. Having then been finished in this manner, and being made in pieces, that plan was packed up secretly, and smuggled out of Florence in some bales of wool that were going to Perugia being consigned to one who had orders to send it to the Pope, who made use of it continually during the siege of Florence, keeping it in his chamber, and seeing from one day to another, from letters and dispatches, where and how the army was quartered, where skirmishes took place, and in short, all the incidents, arguments, and discussions that occurred during that siege all greatly to his satisfaction, for it was in truth a rare and marvellous work. The war finished, during the progress of which Tribolo executed some works in clay for his friends, and for Andrea del Sarto, his dearest friend, three figures of wax in the round, of which Andrea availed himself in painting in fresco on the piazza, near the condata, portraits from nature of three captains who had fled with the pay chests, depicted as hanging by one foot. Benvenuto, summoned by the Pope, went to Rome to kiss the feet of His Holiness, and was placed by him in charge of the Belvedere, with an honorable salary. In that office, having often conversations with the Pope, Benvenuto, when the occasion arose, did not fail to extol Tribolo as an excellent sculptor, and to recommend him warmly, insomuch that, the siege finished, Clement made use of him. For, designing to give completion to the chapel of Our Lady at Loreto, which had been begun by Leo, and then abandoned on account of the death of Andrea Cantucci of Monte San Sovino, he ordained that Antonio de Sangallo, who had the charge of executing that fabric, should summon Tribolo and set him to complete some of those scenes that Maestro Andrea had left unfinished. Tribolo, then, thus summoned by Sangallo, by order of Clement, went with all his family to Loreto, whither there likewise went Simon, called Mosca, a very rare carver of marble. Raffaello da Montalupo, Francesco de Sangallo the Younger, Girolamo Ferrarisi the Sculptor, a disciple of Maestro Andrea, Simone Cioli, Ranieri da Pietra Santa, and Francesco del Tada, all invited in order to finish that work. And to Trebolo, in the distribution of the labors, there fell, as the work of the greatest importance, a scene in which Maestro Andrea had represented the marriage of Our Lady. 
Thereupon Tribalo made an addition to that scene, and had the notion of placing among the many figures that are standing, watching the marriage of the Virgin, one who in great fury is breaking his rod, because it had not blossomed, and in this he succeeded so well that the suitor could not display with greater animation the rage that he feels at not having had the good fortune that he desired which work finished, and also that of the others with great perfection, Tribolo had already made many models of wax, with a view to executing some of those prophets that were to go in the niches of that chapel, which are now built and completely finished, when Pope Clement, after seeing those works and praising them much, and particularly that of Tribolo, determined that they should all return without loss of time to Florence, in order to finish, under the discipline of Michelagnolo Buonarti, all those figures that were wanting in the sacristy and library of San Lorenzo, and the rest of the work, after the models of Michelagnolo, and with his assistance, with the greatest possible speed, to the end that, having finished the sacristy, they might altogether be able, thanks to the proficience made under the discipline of so great a man, also to finish the façade of San Lorenzo. And in order that there might be no manner of delay in doing this, the Pope sent Michelagnolo back to Florence, and with him Fra Giovanni Angelo de Servi, who had executed some works in the Belvedere, to the end that he might assist him in carving the marbles, and might make some statues, according as he should receive orders from Michelagnolo, who caused him to make a San Cosimo, which was to stand on one side of the Madonna, with a San Damiano allotted to Montelupo on the other. End of section 1《Of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Life of Niccolo, Part 2. These commissions given, Michelagnolo desired that Tribolo should make two nude statues, which were to be one on either side of that of Duke Giuliano, which he himself had already made. One was to be a figure of earth crowned with cypress, weeping with bowed head and with the arms outstretched, and lamenting the death of Duke Giuliano, and the other a figure of heaven with the arms uplifted, all smiling and joyful, and showing her gladness at the adornment and splendor that the soul and spirit of that lord conferred upon her. But Tribolo's evil fortune crossed him at the very moment when he was about to begin to work on the statue of earth, for whether it was the change of air, or his feeble constitution, or because he had been irregular in his way of living, he fell ill of a grievous sickness, which, ending in a quartan fever, hung about him many months, to his infinite vexation, since he was tormented no less by his grief at having had to abandon the work, and at seeing that the friar and Raffaello had taken possession of the field, than by the illness itself. However, wishing to conquer that illness, in order not to be left behind by his rivals, whose name he heard celebrated more and more every day, feeble as he was, he made a large model of clay for the statue of earth, and when he had finished it, began to execute the work in marble with such diligence and assiduity that the statue could be seen already all cut out in front, when Fortune, who was always ready to oppose herself to any fair beginning, by the death of Clement at a moment when nothing seemed less likely, cut short the aspirations of all those excellent masters who were hoping to acquire under Michelagnolo, besides boundless profits, immortal renown, and everlasting fame. Stupefied by this misfortune, and robbed of all his spirit, and being also ill, Tribolo was living in utter despair, seeming not to be able either in Florence or abroad to hit upon anything that might be to his advantage. But Giorgio Vasari, who was always his friend, 
and loved him from his heart, and helped him all that he could consult him, saying that he should not lose heart, because he would so contrive that Duke Alessandro would give him something to do, by means of the favor of the magnificent Ottaviano de' Medici, into his service Giorgio had introduced him on terms of no little intimacy. Wherefore Tribolo, having regained a little courage, occupied himself, while measures were being taken to assist him, with copying in clay all the figures of marble in the sacristy of San Lorenzo, which Michelagnolo had executed, namely dawn, twilight, day, and night. And he succeeded in doing them so well, that Monsignor Giovanni Battista Figiovanni, the prior of San Lorenzo, to whom he presented the knight in return for having the sacristy opened for him, judging it to be a rare work, presented it to Duke Alessandro, who afterwards gave it to Giorgio Vasari, who was living with his excellency, knowing that Giorgio gave his attention to such studies which figure is now in his house at Arezzo, with other works of art. Having afterwards copied, likewise in clay, the Madonna made by Michelagnolo for the same sacristy, Tribolo presented it to the above-named Monsignor Ottaviano de' Medici, who had a most beautiful ornament in squared work made for it by Battista del Cinque, with columns, cornices, brackets, and other carvings very well executed. Meanwhile, by the favor of him who was treasurer to his excellency, and at the commission of Bertoldo Corsini, the proveditor for the fortress which was being built at that time, out of three escutcheons that were to be made by order of the duke for placing on the bastions, one on each, one for Braccia in height was given to Tribolo to execute, with two nude figures representing victories which escutcheon finished by him with great diligence and promptitude with the addition of three great masks that support the escutcheon and the figures so pleased the duke that he conceived a very great love for tribolo now shortly afterwards the duke went to naples to defend himself before the emperor charles v who had just returned from Tunis against many calumnies that had been laid upon him by some of his citizens, and having not only defended himself, but also obtained from his majesty his daughter Signora Margherita of Austria for wife, he wrote to Florence that four men should be appointed who might cause vast and splendid decorations to be prepared throughout the city in order to receive the emperor who was coming to florence with proper magnificence and i having to distribute the various works at the commission of his excellency who ordained that i should act in company with the said four men who were giovanni corsi luigi giocardini palla russelle and alessandro corsini gave the greatest and most difficult labors for that festival to tribolo to execute which were four large statues the first was a hercules that had just killed the hydra six braccia in height in the round and overlaid with silver which was placed at that corner of the piazza de san felice that is at the end of the via maggio with the following inscription in letters of silver on the base at hercules labor et aromnes monster edumuit ita caesar vertut et clementia hostibus victus su placatus passum orbi terrarum et quietum restituit two others were colossal figures eight braccia high one representing the river bagrada which was resting upon the skin of the serpent that was brought to rome and the other representing the ebro with the horn of amalthea in one hand and in the other the helm of a ship both colored in imitation of bronze, with inscriptions on the bases, below the Ebro, Hiberas ex Hispania, and below the other, Bagradas ex Africa. The fourth was a statue five braccia in height, on the Canto de Medici, representing peace, who had in one hand an olive branch, and in the other a lighted torch, with which she was setting fire to a pile of arms heaped up on the base on which she was placed, with the following words, 
Fiat Pax in Vertu Tua. He did not finish as he had hoped to do the horse seven braccia in length that was set up on the Piazza di Santa Trinita, upon which was to be placed the statue of the emperor in armor, because Tasso the woodcarver, who was much his friend, did not show any promptitude in executing the base and the other things in the way of wood carving that were to be included in the work being a man who let time slip through his fingers in arguing and jesting. And there was only just time to cover the horse alone with tin foil, laid upon the still fresh clay. On the base were to be read the following words, Imperatori Carolo Augusto Victoria Sissimo, post de victos hostes, Italiae passe restituta, e salutato ferden. Fratre expulsis iterum, tersis africace perdomita, Alexander med dux Florentiae d. d. His Majesty, having departed from Florence, a beginning was made with the preparations for the nuptials in expectation of his daughter, and to the end that she and the vice-queen of Naples, who was in her company, might be commodiously lodged, according to the orders of His Excellency, in the house of Monsignor Ottaviano de Medici, in addition was made to his old house in four weeks, to the astonishment of every one, and Tribolo, the painter Andreo de Cosimo, and I, in ten days, with the help of about ninety sculptors and painters of the city, what with masters and assistants, completed the preparations for the wedding, in so far as appertained to the house and its decorations, painting the loggia, courtyards, and other spaces in a manner suitable for nuptials of such importance. Among these decorations, Tribolo made, besides other things, two victories in half-relief that were one on either side of the principal door, supported by two large terminal figures which also upheld the escutcheon of the emperor pendant from the neck of a very beautiful eagle in the round the same master also made certain boys likewise in the round and large in size which were placed on either side of some heads over the pediments of various doors and these were much extolled Meanwhile, as the nuptials were in progress, Tribolo received letters from Bologna, in which Messer Pietro de Magno, his devoted friend, besought him that he should consent to go to Bologna, in order to make for the Madonna de Galliera, where a most beautiful ornament of marble was already prepared, a scene likewise of marble, three braccia and a half in extent whereupon tribolo happening to have nothing else to do at that time went thither and after making a model of a madonna ascending into heaven with the apostles below in various attitudes which being very beautiful gave great satisfaction he set his hand to executing it but with little pleasure for himself since the marble that he was carving was that milanese marble saline full of emery and bad in quality and it seemed to him that he was wasting his time without feeling a particle of that delight that men find in working those marbles which are a pleasure to carve and which in the end when brought to completion show a surface that has the appearance of the living flesh itself however he did so much that it was already almost finished when i having persuaded duke alessandro to recall michelagnolo from rome and also the other masters in order to finish the work of the sacristy begun by clement was arranging to give him something to do in florence and i would have succeeded but in the meantime by reason of the death of alessandro who was murdered by lorenzo di pier francesco de medici not only was this design frustrated but the greatness and prosperity of art were thrown into utter ruin having heard of the duke's death 
Trimalo condoled with me in his letters, beseeching me, after he had exhorted me to bear with resignation the death of that great prince, my gracious master, that if I went to Rome, as he had heard that I, being wholly determined to abandon courts and to pursue my studies, was intending to do, I should obtain some commission for him, for the reason that, if assisted by my friends, he would do whatever I told him. But it so chanced that it became in no way necessary for him to seek commissions in Rome, for Signor Cosimo de Medici, having been created Duke of Florence, as soon as he had freed himself from the troubles that he had in the first year of his rule, by routing his enemies at Montemorlo, began to take some diversion, and in particular to frequent not a little the villa of Castello, which is little more than two miles distant from Florence. There he began to do some building, in order that he might be able to live there comfortably with his court, and little by little, being encouraged in this by Maestro Pietro de San Cassiano, who was held to be a passing good master in those days, and was much in the service of Signora Maria, the mother of the duke, and had also always been the master builder and the former servant of Signor Giovanni, he resolved to conduct to that place certain waters that he had desired long before to bring thither. Whereupon a beginning was made with building an aqueduct that was to receive all the waters from the hill of Castellina, which was at a distance of a quarter of a mile or more from Castello, and the work was pursued vigorously with a good number of men. But the duke, recognizing that Maestro Pietro had neither invention nor power of design enough to make in that place a beginning that might afterwards in time receive that ornamentation which the sight and the waters required, one day that his excellency was on the spot, speaking of this with such men as Messer Ottaviano de Medici and Cristofano Rinieri, the friend of Tribolo and the old servant of Signora Maria and of the Duke, they extolled Tribolo in such a manner as a man endowed with all those parts that were requisite in the head of such a fabric, that the Duke gave Cristofano a commission to make him come from Bologna which having been straightway done by Rinieri, Tribolo, who could not have received any better news than that he was to serve Duke Cosimo, set out immediately for Florence, and arriving there, was taken to Castello, where his most illustrious excellency, having heard from him what he thought should be done in the way of decorative fountains, gave him a commission to make the models whereupon he set his hand to these and was engaged upon them while maestro pietro de san cassiano was executing the aqueduct and bringing the waters to the place when the duke who meanwhile had begun for the security of the city to surround with a very strong wall the bastions erected on the hill of san miniato at the time of the siege after the designs of michelagnolo ordained that Tribolo should make an escutcheon of hard stone with two victories for an angle of the summit of a bastion that faces Florence. But Tribolo had scarcely finished the escutcheon, which was very large, and one of those victories, a figure four braccia high, which was held to be a very beautiful thing, when he was obliged to leave that work incomplete, for the reason that, Maestro Pietro, having carried well on the making of the aqueduct and the bringing of the waters to the full satisfaction of the duke, his excellency wished that Tribolo should begin to put into execution for the adornment of that place the designs and models that he had already shown to him, ordaining him for the time being a salary of eight crowns a month, the same that was paid to San Cassiano. End of section two, part two. Section three of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume seven by Giorgio Vasari. Translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Section three. 
Life of Niccolo Coltribolo, Sculptor and Architect Part 3 Now, in order that I may not become confused, in describing the intricacies of the aqueducts and of the ornaments of the fountains, it may be well to say briefly some few words about the site and position of Castello. The Villa of Castello stands at the roots of Monte Morello, below the Villa della Topaia, which is halfway up the slope. It has before it a plain that descends little by little, for the space of a mile and a half, down to the river Arno, and exactly where the ascent of the mountain begins stands the palace, which was built in past times by Pier Francesco de' Medici, after a very good design. The principal front faces straight towards the south, overlooking a vast lawn with two very large fish-ponds, full of running water, which comes from an ancient aqueduct made by the Romans in order to conduct water from Val de Marina to Florence and provided with a vaulted cistern under the ground, and so it has a very beautiful and very pleasing view. The fish-ponds in front are divided in the middle by a bridge, twelve braccia wide, which leads to an avenue of the same width, bounded at the sides and covered above by an unbroken vault of mulberry trees, ten braccia in height, thus making a covered avenue, three hundred braccia in length, delightful for its shade, which opens on to the high road to Prato by a gate placed between two fountains that serve to give water to travellers and animals. On the eastern side the same palace has a very beautiful pile of stable buildings, and on the western side a private garden into which one goes from the courtyard of the stables, passing straight through the ground floor of the palace by way of the loggi halls and chambers on the level of the ground, from which private garden one can enter by a door on the west side into another garden, very large and all filled with fruit trees, and bounded by a forest of fir trees that conceals the houses of the laborers and others who live there, engaged in the service of the palace and of the gardens. Next, that part of the palace which faces north, towards the mountain, has in front of it a lawn as long as the palace, the stables, and the private garden all together. And from this lawn one climbs by steps to the principal garden, a place enclosed by ordinary walls, which, rising in a gentle slope, stretches so well clear of the palace as it rises, that the midday sun searches it out and bathes it all with its rays as if there were no palace in front, and at the upper end it stands so high that it commands a view not only of the whole palace, but also of the plain that is in front and around it, and likewise about the city. In the middle of this garden is a forest of very tall and thickly planted cypresses, laurels, and myrtles, which, laid out in a circular shape, have the form of a labyrinth, all surrounded by box hedges, two braccia and a half in height, so even and grown with such beautiful order that they have the appearance of a painting done with the brush, in the centre of which labyrinth, at the desire of the duke, Tribolo, as will be described below, made a very beautiful fountain of marble. At the principal entrance, where there is the first-mentioned lawn, with the two fish-ponds and the avenue covered with mulberry trees, Tribolo wished that the avenue should be so extended that it might stretch for a distance of more than a mile, covered and shaped in like manner, as far as the river Arno, and that the waters which ran away from all the fountains, flowing gently in pleasant channels at the sides of the avenue, and filled with various kinds of fishes and crayfish, might accompany it down to that river. As for the palace, to describe what has still to be done, as well as that which has been finished, he wished to make a loggia in front of it, which, passing by an open courtyard, was to have on the side where the stables are another palace as large as the old one, with the same proportion of apartments, loggi, private garden, and the rest, which addition would have made it a vast palace with a most beautiful façade. 
after passing the court from which one enters into the large garden of the labyrinth at the main entrance where there is a vast lawn after climbing the steps that lead to that labyrinth there came a level space thirty brachia square on which there was to be and has since been made a very large fountain of white marble which was to spout upwards above ornaments fourteen brachia in height while from the mouth of a statue at the highest point was to issue a jet of water rising to the height of six brachia at either end of the lawn was to be a loggia one opposite to the other each thirty brachia in length and fifteen in breadth and in the middle of each loggia was to be placed a marble table twelve brachia in length and on the outside a basin of eight brachia which was to receive the water from a vase held by two figures in the middle of the above-mentioned labyrinth tribolo had thought to achieve the most decorative effect with water by means of jets and a very beautiful seat round the fountain the marble basin of which was to be even as it was afterwards made much smaller than that of the large principal fountain and at the summit it was to have a figure of bronze spouting water at the end of this garden in the centre there was to be a gate with some children of marble on both sides spouting water with a fountain on either side and in the corners double niches in which statues were to be placed as in the others that are in the walls at the sides at the opposite ends of the avenues that cross the garden which are all covered with greenery distributed in various ways through the above-mentioned gate which is at the upper end of this garden above some steps one enters into another garden as wide as the first but of no great depth in the direct line in comparison with the mountain beyond in this garden were to be two other loggi one on either side and in the wall opposite to the gate which supports the soil of the mountain there was to be in the centre a grotto with three basins with water playing into them in imitation of rain the grotto was to be between two fountains placed in the same wall and opposite to these in the lower wall of the garden were to be two others one on either side of the gate so that the fountains of this garden would have been equal in number to those of the other which is below it and receives its water from the first which is higher and this garden was to be all full of orange trees which would have had and will have whenever that may be a most favourable situation being defended by the walls and by the mountain from the north wind and other harmful winds from this garden one climbs by two staircases of flint one on either side to a forest of cypresses fir trees holm oaks laurels and other evergreen trees distributed with beautiful order in the middle of which according to tribolo's design there was to be a most lovely fish-pond which has since been made and because this part gradually narrowing forms an angle that angle to the end that it might be made flat was to be blunted by the breadth of a loggia from which after climbing some steps might be seen in front the palace the gardens the fountains and all the plain below and about them as far as the ducal villa of poggio Acheno, florence prato siena and all that is around for many miles now the above-named maestro pietro de san cassiano having carried his work of the aqueduct as far as castello and having turned into it all the waters of castellina was overtaken by a violent fever and died in a few days whereupon tribolo undertaking the charge of directing all the building by himself perceived that although the waters brought to castello were in great abundance nevertheless they were not sufficient for all that he had made up his mind to do not to mention that coming from castellina they did not rise to the height that he required for his purposes 
having therefore obtained from the lord duke a commission to conduct thither the waters of petreia a place more than one hundred and fifty braccia above castello which are good and very abundant he caused a conduit to be made similar to the other and so high that one can enter into it to the end that thus those waters of petreia might come to the fish-pond through another aqueduct with enough fall for the fish-pond and the great fountain this done tribolo began to build the above-mentioned grotto proposing to make it with three niches in a beautiful architectural design and likewise the two fountains that were one on either side of it in one of these there was to be a large statue of stone representing mont asineo which pressing its beard was to pour water from its mouth into a basin that was to be in front of it from which basin the water issuing by a hidden channel and passing under the wall was to flow to the fountain that there is at the present day behind the wall at the end of the slope of the garden of the labyrinth pouring into the vase on the shoulder of the figure of the river mugnani which is in a large niche of grey stone decorated with most beautiful ornaments and all covered with sponge stone this work if it had been finished in all its perfection even as it is in part would have had great similarity to the reality since the mugnoni rises from monte asineo for the mugnoni then to describe that which has been done tribolo made a figure of grey stone four braccia in length and reclining in a very beautiful attitude which has upon one shoulder a vase that pours water into a basin and rests the other on the ground leaning upon it with the left leg crossed over the right and behind this river is a woman representing Fiesoli, wholly naked, issuing from among the sponge stones and rocks in the middle of the niche, and holding in the hand a moon which is the ancient emblem of the people of Fiesoli. Below this niche is a very large basin supported by two great Capricorns, which are one of the devices of the duke, from which Capricorns hang some festoons and masks of great beauty, and from their lips issues the water from that basin which is convex in the middle and has outlets at the sides and all the water that overflows pours away from the sides through the mouths of the capricorns and then after falling into the hollow base of the vase flows through the herb beds that are round the walls of the garden of the labyrinth where there are fountains between the niches and between the fountains espaliers of oranges and pomegranates in the second garden described above where tribolo had intended that there should be made the monte esineo that was to supply water to the mugnoni there was to be on the other side beyond the gate a similar figure of the monte della falterona and even as this mountain is the source of the river arno so the statue representing that river in the garden of the labyrinth opposite to the mugnoni was to receive the water from the falterona but since neither the figure of that mountain nor its fountain has ever been finished let us speak of the fountain and figure of the river arno which were completed by tribolo to perfection this river then holds its vase upon one thigh lying down and leaning with one arm on a lion which holds a lily in its paw and the vase receives its water through the perforated wall behind which there was to be the falterona exactly in the manner in which as has been described the statue of the river mugnoni also receives its water and since the long basin is in every way similar to that of the mugnoni i shall say no more about it save this that it is a pity that the art and excellence of these works which are truly most beautiful are not embodied in marble then continuing the work of the conduit tribolo caused the water from the grotto to pass under the orange garden and then under the next garden and thus brought it into the labyrinth where forming a circle round all the middle of the labyrinth in a good circumference round the centre he laid down the central pipe through which the fountain was to spout water 
after which, taking the waters from the Arno and the Mugnone, and bringing them together under the level of the labyrinth by means of certain bronze pipes, that were distributed in beautiful order throughout that space, he filled that whole pavement with very fine jets, in such a manner that it was possible by turning a key to drench all those who came near to see the fountain nor is one able to escape either quickly or with ease because tribolo made round the fountain and the pavement in which are the jets a seat of grey stone supported by lion's paws between which are sea monsters in low relief which was a difficult thing to do because he chose since the place was sloping and the square lay on the slant to make it level and the same with the seat having then set his hand to the fountain of the labyrinth he made on the shaft in marble an interwoven design of sea monsters cut out in full relief with tails intertwined so well that nothing better of that kind could be done and this finished he executed the tazza with a piece of marble brought long before to castello together with a large table also of marble from the villa dell'antella which monsignor ottaviano de medici formerly bought from giuliano salviati by reason of this opportunity then tribolo made that tazza sooner than he might otherwise have done fashioning round it a dance of little children attached to the moulding which is beside the lip of the tazza which children are holding festoons of products of the sea cut out of the marble with beautiful art and so also the shaft which he made over the tazza he executed with much grace with some very beautiful children and masks to spout water upon that shaft it was the intention of tribolo to place a bronze statue three braccia high representing florence in order to signify that from the above-named mounts asseneo and falterona the waters of the arno and mugnone come to florence of which figure he had made a most beautiful model which pressing the hair with his hands caused water to pour forth then having brought the water as far as the space thirty braccia square below the labyrinth he made a beginning with the great fountain which made with eight sides was to receive all the above-mentioned waters into its lowest basin namely those from the waterworks of the labyrinth and likewise those of the great conduit each of these eight sides then rises above a step one-fifth of a braccio in height and each angle of the eight sides has a projection as have also the steps which thus projecting rise at each angle in a great step of two-fifths of a braccio in such a way that the central face of the steps withdraws into the projections and their straight line is thus broken which produces a bizarre effect and makes the ascent very easy the edges of the fountain have the shape of a vase and the body of the fountain that is the inner part where the water is curves in the form of a circle the shaft begins with eight sides and continues with eight seats almost up to the base of the tazza upon which are seated eight children of the size of life all in the round and in various attitudes who linked together with the legs and arms make a rich adornment and a most beautiful effect and since the tazza which is round projects to the extent of six braccia the water of the whole fountain pouring equally over the edge on every side sends a very beautiful rain like the drippings from a roof into the octagonal basin mentioned above and those children that are on the shaft of the tazza are not wetted and they appear to be there in order not to be wetted by the rain almost like real children full of delight and playing as they shelter under the lip of the tazza which could not be equalled in its simplicity and beauty opposite to the four paths that intersect the garden are four children of bronze lying at play in various attitudes which are after the designs of tribolo although they were executed afterwards by others above this tazza begins another shaft which has at the foot on some projections four children of marble in the round who are pressing the necks of some geese that spout water from their mouths 
and this water is that of the principal conduit coming from the labyrinth, and rises exactly to this height. Above these children is the rest of the shaft of this pedestal, which is made with certain cartouches which spurt forth water in a most bizarre manner, and then, regaining a quadrangular form, it rises over some masks that are very well made. Above this, then, is a smaller tatza, on the lip of which, on all four sides, are fixed by the horns four heads of Capricorns, making a square, which spout water through their mouths into the large tatza, together with the children, in order to make the rain which falls, as has been told, into the first basin, which has eight sides. Still higher there follows another shaft, adorned with other ornaments and with some children in half-relief, who, projecting outwards, form at the top a round space that serves as base to the figure of a Hercules who is crushing Antaeus, which was designed by Tribolo, and executed afterwards by others, as will be related in the proper place. From the mouth of this Antaeus he intended that, instead of his spirit, there should gush out through a pipe water in great abundance, as indeed it does, which water is that of the great conduit of Petraea, which comes with much force, and rises sixteen brachia above the level where the steps are, and makes a marvellous effect in falling back into the greater Tata. In that same aqueduct, then, come not only those waters from Petraea, but also those that go to the fish-pond and the grotto, and these, uniting with those from Castellina, go to the fountains of the Falterona and the Monte Asineo, and thence to the fountains of the Arno and Mugnoni, as has been related, after which, being reunited at the fountain of the labyrinth, they go to the centre of the great fountain, where are the children with the geese. From there, according to the design of Tribolo, they were to flow through two distinct and separate conduits into the basins of the loggi, where the tables are, and then each into a separate private garden. The first of these gardens, that towards the west, is all filled with rare and medicinal plants, wherefore at the highest level of that water in that garden of simples in the niche of the fountain and behind a basin of marble there was to be a statue of esculapius the principal fountain described above then was completely finished in marble by tribolo and carried to the finest and greatest perfection that could be desired in a work of this kind Wherefore I believe that it may be said with truth that it is the most beautiful fountain, the richest, the best proportioned, and the most pleasing that has ever been made, for the reason that in the figures, in the vases, in the tatze, and in short, throughout the whole work, are proofs of extraordinary diligence and industry. After this, having made the model of the above-mentioned statue of Esculapius, Tribolo began to execute it in marble, but being hindered by other things, he did not finish that figure, which was completed afterwards by the sculptor Antonio di Gino, his disciple. On the side towards the east, in a little lawn without the garden, Tribolo arranged an oak in a most ingenious manner, for besides the circumstance that it is so thickly covered both above and all around with ivy intertwined among the branches, that it has the appearance of a very dense grove, one can climb up it by a convenient staircase of wood similarly covered with ivy, at the top of which, in the middle of the oak, there is a square chamber surrounded by seats, the backs of which are all of living verdure, and in the centre is a little table of marble with a vase of variegated marble in the middle, from which, through a pipe, there flows and spurts into the air a strong jet of water, which, after falling, runs away through another pipe. These pipes mount upwards from the foot of the oak, so well hidden by the ivy, that nothing is seen of them, and the water can be turned on or off at pleasure by means of certain keys. Nor is it possible to describe in full in how many ways that water of the oak can be turned on, in order to drench anyone at pleasure with various instruments of copper, 
not to mention that with the same instruments one can cause the water to produce various sounds and whistlings finally all these waters after having served so many different purposes and supplied so many fountains are collected together and flow into the two fish-ponds that are without the palace at the beginning of the avenue and thence to other uses of the villa nor will i omit to tell what was the intention of tribolo with regard to the statues that were to be as ornaments in the great garden of the labyrinth in the niches that may be seen regularly distributed there in various spaces he proposed then acting in this on the judicious advice of monsignor benedetto varchi who has been in our times most excellent as poet orator and philosopher that at the upper and lower ends there should be placed the four seasons of the year spring summer autumn and winter and that each should be set up in that part where its particular season is most felt at the entrance on the right hand beside the winter and in that part of the wall which stretches upwards were to go six figures that were to demonstrate the greatness and goodness of the house of medici and to denote that all the virtues are to be found in duke cosimo and these were justice compassion valour nobility wisdom and liberality which have always dwelt in the house of medici and are all united together at the present day in the most excellent lord duke in that he is just compassionate valorous noble wise and liberal and because these qualities have made the city of florence as they still do strong in laws peace arms science wisdom tongues and arts and also because the said lord duke is just in the laws compassionate in peace valorous in arms noble through the sciences wise in his encouragement of tongues and other culture and liberal to the arts tribolo wished that on the other side from the justice compassion valour nobility wisdom and liberality on the left hand as will be seen below there should be these other figures laws peace arms sciences tongues and arts and it was most appropriately arranged that in this manner these statues and images should be placed as they would have been above the arno and mugnone in order to signify that they do honour to florence it was also proposed that in the pediments there should be placed portrait busts of men of the house of medici one in each over justice for example the portrait of his excellency that being his particular virtue over compassion that of the magnificent giuliano over valour signor giovanni over nobility the elder lorenzo over wisdom the elder cosimo or clement the seventh and over liberality pope leo and in the pediments on the other side it was suggested that there might be placed other heads from the house of medici or of persons of the city connected with that house but since these names make the matter somewhat confused they have been placed here in the following order level one reading across summer the mugnone gate the arno and spring next level down reading vertically arts tongues sciences arms peace laws moving to the right reading vertically logia moving to the right reading vertically again logia and moving to the right reading vertically liberality wisdom nobility valor compassion justice next level down reading horizontally autumn gate logia gate winter all these ornaments would have made this in truth the richest the most magnificent and the most ornate garden in europe but these works were not carried to completion for the reason that tribolo was not able to take measures to have them finished while the duke was in the mind to continue them as he might have done in a short time having men in abundance and the duke ready to spend money and not suffering from those hindrances that afterwards stopped him 
the duke indeed not being contented at that time with the great quantity of water that is to be seen there was thinking of trying to obtain the water of valceni which is very abundant in order to join it with the rest and then to conduct it from castello by an aqueduct similar to the one which he had made to the piazza in front of his palace in florence and of a truth if this work had been pressed forward by a man with greater energy and more desire of glory it would have been carried at least well on but since tribolo besides that he was much occupied with various affairs of the duke's had not much energy nothing more was done and in all the time that he worked at castello he did not execute with his own hand anything save the two fountains with the two rivers the arno and the mugnoni and the statue of fiesoli this arising from no other cause so far as one can see but his being too much occupied as has been related with the many affairs of the duke end of section three part three Section 4 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston Ducy de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Life of Niccolo called Tribolo, Sculptor and Architect, Part 4 among other things the duke caused him to make a bridge over the river mugnoni on the high road that goes to bologna without the porta san gallo this bridge since the river crosses the road obliquely tribolo caused to be built with an arch likewise oblique in accordance with its oblique line across the river which was a new thing and much extolled above all because he had the arch put together of stones cut on the slant on every side in such a manner that it proved to be very strong and very graceful in short this bridge was a very beautiful work not long before the duke had been seized with a desire to make a tomb for signor giovanni de medici his father and tribolo being eager to have the commission made a very beautiful model for it in competition with one that had been executed by raffaello da montelupo who had the favor of francesco di sandro the master of arms to his excellency and then the duke having resolved that the one to be put into execution should be tribolos he went off to have the marble quarried at carrara where he also caused to be quarried the two basins for the loggi at castello a table and many other blocks of marble meanwhile messer giovan battista d'arecasoli now bishop of pistoia being in rome on business of the lord dukes he was sought out by baccio bandinelli who had just finished the tombs of pope leo the tenth and clement the seventh in the minerva and he was asked by baccio to recommend him to his excellency whereupon messer giovan battista wrote to the duke that bandinelli desired to serve him and his excellency wrote in reply that on his return he should bring him in his company and bandinelli having therefore arrived in florence so haunted the duke in his audacity making promises and showing him designs and models that the tomb of the above-named signor giovanni which was to have been made by tribolo was allotted to him and so taking some pieces of marble of michelagnolo's which were in the via mozza in florence he hacked them about without scruple and began the work wherefore tribolo on returning from carrara found that in consequence of his being too leisurely and good-natured the commission had been taken away from him in the year when bonds of kinship were formed between the lord duke cosimo and the lord don pedro de toledo 
marquis of villafranca at that time viceroy of naples the lord duke taking don pedro's daughter signora leonora to wife preparations were made in florence for the nuptials and tribolo was given the charge of constructing a triumphal arch at the porta al prato through which the bride coming from poggio was to enter which arch he made a thing of beauty very ornate with columns pilasters architraves great cornices and pediments that arch was to be all covered with figures and scenes in addition to the statues by the hand of tribolo and all those paintings were executed by battista franco of venice ridolfo girolandajo and michel his disciple now the principal figure that tribolo made for this work which was placed at the highest point in the centre of the pediment on a dado wrought in relief was a woman five braccia high representing fecundity with five little boys three clinging to her legs one on her lap and another in her arms and beside her where the pediment sloped away were two figures of the same size one on either side of these figures which were lying down one was security leaning on a column with a light wand in her hand and the other was eternity with a globe in her arms and below her feet a white-haired old man representing time and holding in his arms the sun and moon i shall say nothing as to the works of painting that were on that arch because every one may read about them for himself in the description of the festive preparations for these nuptials and since tribolo had particular charge of all decorations for the palace of the medici he caused many devices to be executed in the lunettes of the vaulting of the court with mottoes appropriate to the nuptials and all those of the most illustrious members of the house of medici besides this he had a most sumptuous decoration made in the great open court all full of stories on one side of the greeks and romans and on the other sides of deeds done by illustrious men of that house of medici which were all executed under the direction of tribolo by the most excellent young painters that there were in florence at that time bronzino pier francesco di sandro francesco il bacchiaca domenico conti antonio di domenico and battista franco of venice on the piazza di san marco also upon a vast pedestal ten braccia in height in which bronzino had painted two very beautiful scenes of the colour of bronze on the socle that was above the cornices tribolo erected a horse of twelve braccia with the four legs in the air and upon it an armed figure large in proportion and this figure which had below it men dead and wounded represented the most valorous signor giovanni de medici the father of his excellency this work was executed by tribolo with so much art and judgment that it was admired by all who saw it and what caused even greater marvel was the speed with which he finished it among his assistants being the sculptor santi bugliani who was crippled forever in one leg by a fall and came very near dying under the direction of tribolo likewise for the comedy that was performed aristotle de san gallo executed marvellous scenery being truly most excellent in such things as will be told in his life and for the costumes in the interludes which were the work of giovan battista strozzi who had charge of the whole comedy tribolo himself made the most pleasing and beautiful inventions that it is possible to imagine in the way of vestments buskins head-dresses and other wearing apparel these things were the reason that the duke afterwards availed himself of tribolo's ingenuity in many fantastic masquerades as in that of the bears in a race of buffaloes in the masquerade of the ravens and in others in like manner in the year when there was born to the said lord duke his eldest son the lord don francesco 
there was to be made in the temple of san giovanni in florence a very magnificent decoration which was to be marvellous in its grandeur and capable of accommodating one hundred most noble young maidens who were to accompany the prince from the palace as far as the said temple where he was to receive baptism the charge of this was given to tribolo who in company with tasso adapting himself to the place brought it about that the temple which in itself is ancient and very beautiful had the appearance of a new temple designed very well in the modern manner with seats all round it richly adorned with pictures and gilding in the centre beneath the lantern he made a great vase of carved woodwork with eight sides the base of which rested on four steps and at the corners of the eight sides were some large colicoles which springing from the ground where there were some lion's paws had at the top of them certain children of large size in various attitudes who were holding with their hands the lip of the vase and supporting with their shoulders some festoons which hung like a garland right round the space in the middle besides this tribolo had made in the middle of the vase a pedestal of wood with beautiful things of fancy round it upon which to crown the work he placed the saint john the baptist of marble three braccia high by the hand of donatello which was left by him in the house of gismondo martelli as has been related in the life of donatello himself in short this temple was adorned both within and without as well as could possibly be imagined and the only part neglected was the principal chapel where there is an old tabernacle with those figures in relief that andrea pisano made long ago by reason of which it appeared that every other part being made new that old chapel spoilt all the grace that the other things together displayed wherefore the duke going one day to see those decorations after praising everything like a man of judgment and recognizing how well tribolo had adapted himself to the situation and to every other feature of the place censured one thing only but that severely that no thought had been given to the principal chapel and then he ordained on the spot like a person of resolute character and beautiful judgment that all that part should be covered with a vast canvas painted in chiascuro with saint john the baptist baptizing christ and the people standing all around to see them or to be baptized some taking off their clothes and others putting them on again in various attitudes and above this was to be a god the father sending down the holy spirit with two fountains in the guise of river gods representing the jor and the den which pouring forth water were to form the jordan jacopo da pantormo was requested to execute this work by messer pier francesco riccio at that time major domo to the duke and by tribolo but he would not do it on the ground that he did not think that the time given which was only six days would be enough for him and the same refusal was made by ridolfo girlandajo bronzino and many others now at this time giorgio vasari having returned from bologna was executing for messer bindo altoviti the altarpiece of his chapel in san apostolo at florence but he was not held in much consideration although he had friendship with tribolo and tasso because certain persons had formed a faction under the protection of the above-named messer pier francesco riccio and whoever was not of that faction had no share in the favours of the court although he might be able and deserving this was the reason that many who with the aid of so great a prince would have become excellent found themselves neglected none being employed save those chosen by tasso who being a gay person got riccio so well under his thumb with his jokes that in certain affairs he neither proposed nor did anything save what was suggested by tasso who was architect to the palace and did all the work 
These men, then, having a sort of suspicion of Giorgio, who laughed at their vanities and follies, and sought to make a position for himself, rather by means of the studies of art than by favour, gave no thought to his claims, but he was commissioned by the Lord Duke to execute that canvas with the subject described above. This work he executed in Chioscuro in six days, and delivered it finished in the manner known to those who saw what grace and adornment it conferred on the whole decoration, and how much it enlivened that part of the temple that stood most in need of it, amid the magnificence of that festival. Cibolo, then, to return to the point whence, I know not how, I digressed, acquitted himself so well that he rightly won the highest praise and the duke commanded that a great part of the ornaments that he placed between the columns should be left there where they still are and deservedly for the villa of cristofano rinieri at castello while he was occupied with the fountains of the duke tribolo made for a niche over a fish-pond which is at the head of a fowling place a river god of grey stone of the size of life which pours water into a very large basin of the same stone which figure is made of pieces and put together with such diligence and art that it appears to be all of one block tribolo then set his hand at the command of his excellency to attempting to finish the staircase of the library of san lorenzo that namely which is in the vestibule before the door but after he had placed four steps in position, not finding either the plan or the measurements of Michelagnolo, by order of the duke he went to Rome, not only to hear the opinion of Michelagnolo with regard to that staircase, but also to make an effort to bring him to Florence. But he did not succeed either in the one object or in the other, for Michelagnolo, not wishing to leave Rome, excused himself in a handsome manner, and as for the staircase, he declared that he remembered neither the measurements nor anything else. Tribolo, therefore, having returned to Florence, and not being able to continue the work of that staircase, set himself to make the pavement of the said library with white and red bricks, after the manner of some pavements that he had seen in Rome. But he added a filling of red clay to the white clay mixed with bowl, in order to produce various effects of carving in those bricks and thus he made in that pavement a copy of the ceiling and coffered work above a notion that was highly extolled he then began but did not finish a work that was to be placed on the main tower of the defences of the porta a faenza for don giovanni de luna the castellan at that time namely an escutcheon of grey stone and a large eagle in full relief with two heads which he made in wax to the end that it might be cast in bronze but nothing more was done with it and of the escutcheon only the shield was finished now it was the custom in the city of florence to have almost every year on the principal piazza on the evening of the festival of st john the baptist towards nightfall a girandola that is a contrivance full of fire trumpets rockets and other fireworks which girandola had the form now of a temple now of a ship sometimes of rocks and at times of a city or of an inferno according as it pleased the designer and one year the charge of making one was given to tribolo who as will be described below made it very beautifully of the various manners of these fireworks and particularly of set pieces venocio of siena and others give an account and on this subject i shall enlarge no further but i must say something as to the nature of these girandol the whole structure then is of wood with broad compartments radiating outwards from the foot to the end that the rockets when they have been lighted may not set fire to the other fireworks but may rise in due order from their separate places one after another filling the heavens in proper succession with the fire that blazes in the girandola both above and below 
they are distributed i say at wide intervals to the end that they may not burn all at once and may produce a beautiful effect and the same do the mortars which are bound to the firm parts of the girandola and make the most beautiful and joyous noises the fire trumpets likewise are fitted in among the ornaments and are generally contrived so as to discharge through the mouths of masks and other such-like things but the most important point is to arrange the girandola in such a manner that the lights that burn in certain vases may last the whole night and illuminate the piazza wherefore the whole work is connected together by a simple match of tow steeped in a mixture of powder full of sulphur and aquavitae which creeps little by little with its fire to every part which it has to set alight one after another until it has kindled the whole now as i have said the things represented are various but all must have something to do with fire and must be subject to its action and long before this there had been counterfeited the city of sodom with lot and his daughters flying from it at another time gerion with virgil and dante on his back according as dante himself relates in the inferno and even earlier orpheus bringing eurydice with him from those infernal regions with many other inventions and his excellency ordained that the work should not be given to any of the puppet painters who for many years past had made a thousand absurdities in the girandole but that an excellent master should produce a work that might have in it something of the good wherefore the charge of this was given to tribolo who with the ingenuity and art wherewith he had executed all his other works made one in the form of a very beautiful octagonal temple rising with its ornaments to the total height of twenty brachia this temple he represented as the temple of peace placing on the summit an image of peace who was setting fire to a great pile of arms which she had at her feet and these arms the statue of peace and all the other figures that made this structure one of great beauty were made of pasteboard clay and cloth steeped in glue put together with extraordinary art they were i say of these materials to the end that the whole work might be the lighter since it was to be suspended at a great height from the ground by a double rope that crossed the piazza high in the air it is true indeed that the fireworks having been placed in it too thickly and the fuses of tow being too near one to another when they were set alight such was the fury of the conflagration and so great and so violent the blaze that everything caught fire all at once and was burned in a flash whereas it should have continued to burn for an hour at least and what was worse the fire seizing on the woodwork and on all that should have been preserved the ropes and every other thing were consumed in a moment which was no small loss and gave little pleasure to the people but with regard to workmanship it was more beautiful than any other girandola that had ever been made up to that time the duke then resolving to erect the loggia of the mercato nuovo for the convenience of his citizens and merchants did not wish to lay a greater burden than he could bear on tribolo who as chief engineer to the capitani di parte and the commissioners of the rivers and the sewers of the city was always riding through the florentine dominions engaged in bringing back to their proper beds many rivers that did damage by breaking away from them in repairing bridges and in other such-like works and he gave the charge of this enterprise to tasso at the advice of the above-mentioned messer pier francesco his major-domo in order to change that tasso from a carpenter into an architect this was certainly against the wishes of tribolo although he did not show it and even acted as the close friend of tasso and a proof that this is true is that tribolo perceived many errors in tasso's model but so it is believed would by no means tell him of them such an error for example was that of the capitals of the columns that are beside the pilasters whereby the columns not leaving enough space when everything had been drawn up 
and the capitals had to be set into position the corona above those capitals would not go in so that it was found necessary to cut away so much that the order of the architecture was ruined besides many other errors of which there is no need to speak for the above-named Messer Pier Francesco, the same Tasso executed the door of the church of San Romolo, and a window with knee-shaped brackets on the Piazza del Duca, in an order of his own, substituting capitals for bases, and doing so many other things without measure or order, that it might have been said that the German order had begun to return to life in Tuscany by means of this man to say nothing of the works that he did in the palace in the way of staircases and apartments which the duke has been obliged to have destroyed because they had no sort of order measure or proportion and were on the contrary all shapeless out of square and without the least convenience or grace all these things were not done without some responsibility falling on tribolo who having considerable knowledge in such matters should not so it seemed have allowed his prince to throw away his money and to do him such an affront to his face and what was even more serious he should not have permitted such things to tasso who was his friend well did men of judgment recognize the presumption and madness of the one in seeking to exercise an art of which he knew nothing and the dissimulation of the other who declared that he was pleased with that which he certainly knew to be bad and of this a proof may be found in the works that giorgio vasari has had to pull down in the palace to the loss of the duke and the great shame of those men but the same thing happened to Tribolo as to Tasso, in that, even as Tasso abandoned wood-carving, a craft in which he had no equal, but never became a good architect, and thus won little honor by deserting an art in which he was very able, and applying himself to another of which he knew not one scrap, so Tribolo, abandoning sculpture, in which it may be said with truth that he was most excellent and caused every one to marvel, and setting himself to attempt to straighten out rivers, ceased to win honor by pursuing the one, while the other brought him blame and loss rather than honor and profit. For he did not succeed in his tinkering with rivers, and he made many enemies, particularly in the district of Prato, on account of the Byzanzio, and in many places in the Val de Nievoli. Duke Cosimo, having then bought the Palace of the Pitti, of which there has been an account in another place, and his excellency desiring to adorn it with gardens, groves, fountains, fish-ponds, and other such-like things, Tribolo executed all the distribution of the hill in the manner in which it still remains, accommodating everything in its proper place with beautiful judgment, although various things in many parts of the garden have since been changed. Of this pitti palace, which is the most beautiful in Europe, mention will be made in another place with a more suitable occasion." After these things, Tribolo was sent by His Excellency to the island of Elba, not only that he might see the city and port that the Duke had caused to be built there, but also that he might make arrangements for the transport of a round piece of granite, twelve brachia in diameter, from which was to be made a tazza for the great lawn of the Pitti Palace, which might receive the water of the principal fountain. Tribolo therefore went thither, and caused a boat to be made on purpose for transporting the tazza, and then, after giving the stone-cutters directions for the transportation, he returned to Florence, where he had no sooner arrived than he found the whole country full of murmurings and maledictions against him, since about that time floods and inundations had done infinite havoc in the neighborhood of those rivers that he had patched up although it was, perhaps, not altogether through his fault that this had happened. However that may have been, whether it was the malignity of some of his assistants, or, perchance, envy, or that the accusation was indeed true, the blame for all that damage was laid on Tribolo, 
who, being a man of no great spirit, and rather wanting in resolution than otherwise, and doubting that the malice of some enemy might make him lose the favour of the duke, was in a state of great despondency, when being of a feeble habit of body, on the 20th of August in the year 1550, there came upon him a most violent fever. At that time Giorgio Vasari was in Florence for the purpose of having sent to Rome the marbles for the tombs that Pope Julius the Third caused to be erected in San Pietro a Montorio, and he, as one who sincerely esteemed the talents of Tribolo, visited and comforted him, beseeching him that he should think of nothing save his health, and that, when cured, he should return to finish the work of castello letting the rivers go their own way for they were more likely to drown his fame than to bring him any profit or honour this which he promised to attempt to do he would i believe have done at all costs if he had not been prevented by death which closed his eyes on the seventh of september in the same year and so the works of Castello, begun and carried well forward by him, remained unfinished, for although some work has been done there since his day, now in one part and now in another, nevertheless they have never been pursued with the diligence and resolution that were shown when Tribolo was alive, and when the Lord Duke was hot in the undertaking." of a truth he who does not press great works forward while those who are having them done are spending money willingly and devoting their best attention to them brings it about that those works are put on one side and left unfinished which zeal and solicitude could have carried to perfection and thus by the negligence of the workers the world is left without its adornment and they without their honour and fame for the reason that it rarely happens, as it did to this work of Castello, that on the death of the first master, he who succeeds to his place, is willing to finish it according to his design and model, with that modesty with which Giorgio Vasari, at the commission of the duke, has caused the great fish-pond of Castello to be finished after the directions of Tribolo even as he will do with the other things, according as his excellency may desire from time to time to have them done. Tribolo lived sixty-five years, and was interred by the company of the Scalzo in their place of burial. He left behind him a son called Raffaello, who has not taken up art, and two daughters, one of whom is the wife of David, Tribolo's assistant in building all the works at Castello, who, being a man of judgment and capable in such matters, is now employed on the aqueducts of Florence, Pisa, and all the other places in the Dominion, according as it may please His Excellency. End of section 4「Of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Section 5. Pierino Piero da Vinci. Life of Pierino Piero da Vinci, Sculptor. Although those men are generally the most celebrated, who have executed some work excellently well, nevertheless, if the works already accomplished by any man foreshadow those that he did not achieve as likely to have been numerous and much more rare, if some accident, unforeseen and out of the common use, had not happened to interrupt him, it is certain that such a man, wherever there may be one willing to be just in his appreciation of the talent of another, will be rightly extolled and celebrated both on the one count and on the other, and as much for what he would have done as for what he did. The sculptor of Vinci, therefore, should not suffer on account of the short duration of his life, or be robbed thereby of the praise due to him from the judgment of those who shall come after us. 
considering that he was only in the first bloom both of his life and of his studies at the time when he produced and gave to the world that which every one admires and was like to bring forth fruits in greater abundance if a hostile tempest had not destroyed both the fruits and the tree i remember having said in another place that in the township of vinci in the lower valdarno there lived ser piero the father of leonardo da vinci most famous of painters to this ser piero after leonardo there was born as his youngest son bartolomeo who living at vinci and attaining to manhood took for his wife one of the first maidens of that township bartolomeo was desirous of having a male child and spoke very often to his wife of the greatness of the genius with which his brother leonardo had been endowed praying god that he should make her worthy that from her there might be born in his house another leonardo the first being now dead in a short time therefore according to his desire there was born to him a gracious boy to whom he wished to give the name of leonardo but being advised by his relatives to revive the memory of his father he gave him the name of piero having come to the age of three years the boy had a most beautiful countenance with curly locks and showed great grace in every movement with a quickness of intelligence that was marvellous insomuch that maestro giuliano del carmine an excellent astrologer and with him a priest devoted to chiromancy who were both close friends of bartolomeo having arrived in vinci and lodged in bartolomeo's house looking at the forehead and hand of the boy revealed to the father both the astrologer and the chiromancer together the greatness of his genius and predicted that in a short time he would make extraordinary proficience in the mercurial arts but that his life would also be very short and only too true was their prophecy for both in the one part and in the other when one would have sufficed in his life as well as in his art it needs must be fulfilled then continuing to grow piero had his father as his master in letters but of himself without any master giving his attention to drawing and to making various little puppets in clay he showed that the divine inclination of his nature recognized by the astrologer and the chiromancer was already awakening and beginning to work in him by reason of which bartolomeo judged that his prayer had been heard by god and believing that his brother had been restored to him in his son he began to think of removing piero from vinci and taking him to florence having then done this without delay he placed piero who was now twelve years of age with bandinelli in florence flattering himself that bacchio having been once the friend of leonardo would take notice of the boy and teach him with diligence besides which it seemed to him that piero delighted more in sculpture than in painting but afterwards coming very often to florence he recognized that bandinelli was not answering with deeds to his expectations and was not taking pains with the boy or showing interest in him although he saw him to be willing to learn for which reason bartolomeo took him away from bandinelli and entrusted him to tribolo who appeared to him to make more effort to help those who were seeking to learn besides giving more attention to the studies of art and bearing even greater affection to the memory of leonardo tribolo was executing some fountains at castello the villa of his excellency and thereupon piero beginning once more his customary drawing through having there the competition of the other young men whom tribolo kept about him set himself with great ardour of spirit to study day and night being spurred by his nature which was desirous of excellence and honour and being even more kindled by the example of the others like himself whom he saw constantly around him 
wherefore in a few months he made such progress that it was a marvel to every one and having begun to gain some experience with the chisels he sought to see whether his hand and his tools would obey in practice the thoughts within him and the designs formed in his brain Tribolo, perceiving his readiness, and having had a water-basin of stone made at that very time for Cristofano Rinieri, gave to Piero a small piece of marble, from which he was to make for that water-basin a boy that should spurt forth water from the private part. Piero, taking the marble with great gladness, first made a little model of clay, and then executed the work with so much grace that Tribolo and the others ventured the opinion that he would become one of those who are counted as rare in that art. Tribolo then gave him a ducal mazzocchio to make in stone, to be placed over an escutcheon with the Medici balls, for Messer Pier Francesco Riccio, the major domo of the duke, and he made it with two children with their legs intertwined together who are holding the mazzocchio in their hands and placing it upon the escutcheon which is fixed over the door of a house that the major-domo then occupied opposite to san giuliano near the priests of sant'antonio when this work was seen all the craftsmen of florence formed the same judgment that tribolo had pronounced before after this he carved a boy squeezing a fish that is pouring water from its mouth for the fountains of castello and then tribolo having given him a larger piece of marble piero made from it two children who are embracing each other and squeezing fishes causing water to spout from their mouths these children were so graceful in the heads and in their whole persons and executed with so beautiful a manner in the legs arms and hair that already it could be seen that he would have been able to execute the most difficult work to perfection taking heart therefore and buying a piece of grey stone two braccia and a half in length which he took to his house on the canto alla briga piero began to work at it in the evenings after returning from his labours at night and on feast days insomuch that little by little he brought it to completion this was a figure of bacchus who had a satyr at his feet and with one hand was holding a cup while in the other he held a bunch of grapes and his head was girt with a crown of grapes all after a model made by himself in clay in this and in his other early works piero showed a marvellous facility which never offends the eye nor is it in any respect disturbing to him who beholds it this bacchus when finished was bought by bongiani caponi and his nephew lodovico caponi now has it in a courtyard in his house the while that piero was executing these works few persons as yet knew that he was the nephew of leonardo da vinci but his labours making him well known and renowned by this means his parentage and his birth were likewise revealed wherefore ever afterwards both from his connection with his uncle and from his own happy genius wherein he resembled that great man he was called by every one not piero but vinci now vinci while occupied in this manner had often heard various persons speaking of the things connected with the arts to be seen in rome and extolling them as is always done by every one wherefore a great desire had been kindled in him to see them hoping to be able to derive profit by beholding not only the works of the ancients but also those of michelagnolo and even the master himself who was then alive and residing in rome he went thither therefore in company with some friends but after seeing rome and all that he wished he returned to florence having reflected judiciously that the things of rome were as yet too profound for him and should be studied and imitated not so early in his career but after a greater acquaintance with art at that time Tribolo had finished a model for the shaft of the fountain in the labyrinth, in which are some satyrs in low relief, four masks in half relief, and four little boys in the round, who are seated upon certain colicoles. 
the vinci having then returned tribolo gave him this shaft to do and he executed and finished it making in it some delicate designs not employed by any other but himself which greatly pleased all who saw them then having had the whole marble tazza of that fountain finished tribolo thought of placing on the edge of it four children in the round lying down and playing with their arms and legs in the water in various attitudes and these he intended to cast in bronze vinci at the commission of tribolo made them of clay and they were afterwards cast in bronze by zanobi lastricati a sculptor and a man very experienced in matters of casting and they were placed not long since around the fountain where they make a most beautiful effect there was in daily intercourse with tribolo one luca martini the proveditor at that time for the building of the mercato nuovo who praising highly the excellence in art and the fine character of vinci and desiring to help him provided him with a piece of marble two-thirds of a braccio in height and one and a quarter in length vinci taking the marble made with it a christ being scourged at the column in which the rules of low relief and of design may be seen to have been well observed and in truth it made every one marvel considering that he had not yet reached the age of seventeen and had made in five years of study that proficience in art which others do not achieve save after length of life and great experience of many things at this time tribolo having undertaken the office of superintendent of the drains in the city of florence ordained in that capacity that the drain in the old piazza di santa maria novella should be raised from the ground in such a way that becoming more capacious it might be better able to receive all the waters that ran into it from various quarters for this work then he commissioned vinci to make the model of a great mask of three braccia which with its open mouth might swallow all the rain-water afterwards by order of the ufficiali della torre the work was allotted to vinci who in order to execute it more quickly summoned to his aid the sculptor lorenzo marignoli in company with this master he finished it making it from a block of hard stone and the work is such that it adorns the whole piazza with no small advantage to the city it now appeared to Vinci that he had made such proficience in art that it would be a great benefit to him to see the principal works in Rome, and to associate with the most excellent craftsmen living there. Wherefore, an occasion to go there presenting itself, he seized it readily. There had arrived from Rome an intimate friend of Michelagnolo Buonarti, Francesco Bandini, who, having come to know Vinci by means of Luca Martini, and having praised him highly, caused him to make a model of wax for a tomb of marble that he wished to erect in his chapel in San Croce and shortly afterwards on returning to rome vinci having spoken his mind to luca martini bandini took him in his company there vinci remained a year studying all the time and executed some works worthy of remembrance the first was a christ on the cross in low relief rendering up his spirit to his father which was copied from a design done by michelagnolo for cardinal ridolfi he added to an antique head a breast in bronze and made a venus of marble in low relief which was much extolled for francesco bandini he restored an ancient horse of which many pieces were wanting and made it complete and in order to give some proof of gratitude where he could to luca martini who was writing to him by every courier and continually recommending him to bandini it seemed good to vinci to make a copy in wax in the round and two-thirds of a braccio in height of the moses of michelagnolo that is on the tomb of pope julius the second in san pietro in vincula than which there is no more beautiful work to be seen and so having made the moses of wax he sent it as a present to luca martini 
at the time when vinci was living in rome and executing the works mentioned above luca martini was made by the duke of florence proveditor of pisa and in his office he did not forget his friend and therefore wrote to him that he was preparing a room for him and was providing a block of marble of three braccia so that he might return from rome at his pleasure seeing that while with him he should want for nothing vinci attracted by this prospect and by the love that he bore to luca resolved to depart from rome and to take up his abode for some time in pisa where he looked to find opportunities of practising his hand and making trial of his ability having therefore gone to pisa he found that the marble was already in his room prepared according to the orders of luca but on proceeding to begin to carve from it an upright figure he perceived that the marble had in it a crack that diminished it by a braccio wherefore having resolved to change it into a recumbent figure he made a young river god holding a vase that is pouring out water the vase being upheld by three children who are assisting the river god to pour the water forth and beneath his feet runs a copious stream of water in which may be seen fishes darting about and waterfowl flying in various parts this river god finished vinci made a present of it to luca who presented it to the duchess to whom it was very dear and then her brother don garcia de toledo being at that time in pisa whither he had gone by galley she gave it to that brother who accepted it with much pleasure for the fountains of his garden in the chiella at naples in those days luca martini was writing some observations on the commedia of dante and he pointed out to vinci the cruelty described by dante which the pisans and archbishop ruggieri showed towards count ugolino della gerardesca causing him to die of hunger with his four sons in the tower that is therefore called the tower of hunger whereby he offered to vinci the occasion for a new work and the idea of a new design wherefore while he was still working at the river god described above he set his hand to making a scene in wax more than a braccio in height and three-quarters in breadth to be cast in bronze in which he represented two of the count's sons already dead one in the act of expiring and the fourth overcome by hunger and near his end but not yet reduced to the last breath with the father in a pitiful and miserable attitude blind and heavy with grief and groping over the wretched bodies of his sons stretched upon the ground in this work vinci displayed the excellence of design no less than did dante the perfection of poetry in his verses for no less compassion is stirred by the attitudes shaped in wax by the sculptor in him who beholds them then is roused in him who listens to the words and accents imprinted on the living page by the poet and in order to mark the place where the event happened he made at the foot of the scene the river arno which occupies its whole width for the above-named tower is not far distant from the river in pisa while upon that tower he placed an old woman naked withered and fearsome representing hunger much after the manner wherein ovid describes her the wax model finished he cast the scene in bronze and it gave consummate satisfaction being held by the court and by every one to be no ordinary work duke cosimo was then intent on enriching and beautifying the city of pisa and he had already caused the piazza del mercato to be built anew with a great number of shops around it and had placed in the centre a column ten braccia high upon which according to the design of luca was to stand a statue representing abundance martini therefore having spoken to the duke and presented vinci to his notice easily obtained for him from his excellency the commission for that statue the duke being always eager to assist men of talent and to bring fine intellects forward 
Vinci executed a statue of Travertine, three braccia and a half in height, which was much extolled by every one, for at the feet of the figure he placed a little child, who assists her to support the cornucopia, carved with much softness and facility, although the stone is rough and difficult to work. Luca afterwards sent to Carrara to have a block of marble quarried, five braccia in height and three in breadth, from which Vinci, who had once seen some sketches by Michelagnolo of Samson slaying a Philistine with the jawbone of an ass, proposed to make two figures of five braccia from his own fancy after that subject. Whereupon, while the marble was on its way, he set himself to make several models, all varying one from another, and then fixed on one of them. And after the block had arrived, he began to carve it, and carried it well on, imitating Michelagnolo in cutting his conception and design little by little out of the stone, without spoiling it or making any sort of error. He executed all the perforation in this work, whether undercut or at an easy angle, with great facility, laborious as it was, and the manner of the whole work was very delicate. But since the labor was very fatiguing, he sought to distract himself with other studies and works of less importance, and thus he executed during the same time a little tablet of marble in low relief, in which he represented Our Lady with Christ, St. John, and St. Elizabeth, which was held, as it still is, to be a rare work. This came into the hands of the most illustrious Duchess, and it is now among the choice things in the study of the Duke. He then set his hand to a scene of marble, one braccio high and one and a half wide, partly in half relief and partly in low relief, in which he represented the restoration of Pisa by the Duke, who is in the work present in person at the restoration of that city, which is being pressed forward by his presence. Round the duke are figures of his virtues, in particular a Minerva representing his wisdom, and also the arts revived by him in that city of Pisa, who is surrounded by many evils and natural defects of the sight, which besiege her on every side, and afflict her in the manner of enemies, but from all these that city has since been delivered by the above-mentioned virtues of the duke. All these virtues round the duke, with all the evils round Pisa, were portrayed by Vinci in his scene, with most beautiful gestures and attitudes. But he left it unfinished, to the great regret of those who saw it, on account of the perfection of the things in it that were completed." The fame of Vinci having grown and spread abroad by reason of these works, the heirs of Messer Baldassare Torina da Pescia besought him that he should make a model of a marble tomb for Messer Baldassare, which finished it pleased them, whereupon they made an agreement that the tomb should be executed, and Vinci sent Francesco del Tada, an able master of marble carving, to have the marble quarried at Carrara and when that master had sent him a block of marble, Vinci began a statue, and carved out of the stone a figure, blocked out in such a manner, that one who knew not the circumstances would have said that it was certainly blocked out by Michelagnolo. The name of Vinci was now very great, and his genius was admired by all, being much more perfect than could have been expected in one so young and it was likely to grow even more and to become greater, and to equal that of any other man in his art, as his own works bear witness, without any other testimony, when the term prescribed for him by heaven, being now close at hand, interrupted all his plans, and caused his rapid progress to cease at one blow, not suffering that he should climb any higher, and depriving the world of many excellent works of art, with which, had Vinci lived, it would have been adorned. 
it happened at this time while vinci was intent on the tomb of another not knowing that his own was preparing that the duke had to send luca martini to genoa on affairs of importance and luca both because he loved vinci and wished to have him in his company and also in order to give him some diversion and recreation and to enable him to see genoa took him with him on his journey there while martini was transacting his business at his suggestion messer adamo centuriani commissioned vinci to execute a figure of st john the baptist of which he made the model but soon he was attacked by fever and to increase his distress at the same time his friend was also taken away from him perchance to provide a way in which fate might be fulfilled in the life of vinci for it became necessary that Luca, in the interests of the business entrusted to him, should go to Florence to find the duke, wherefore he parted from his sick friend, to the great grief of both the one and the other, leaving him in the house of the Abbati Nero, to whom he straitly recommended him, although Piero was very unwilling to remain in Genoa. But Vinci, feeling himself growing worse every day, resolved to have himself removed from Genoa, and having caused an assistant of his own, called Tiberio Cavalieri, to come from Pisa, with his help he had himself carried to Livorno by water, and from Livorno to Pisa in a litter. Arriving in Pisa at the twenty-second hour in the evening, all exhausted and broken by the journey, the sea voyage, and the fever, during the night he had no repose, and the next morning at the break of day he passed to the other life, not having yet reached the age of twenty-three. The death of Vinci was a great grief to all his friends, and to Luca Martini beyond measure and it grieved all those who had hoped to see from his hands such works as are not often seen. And Messer Benedetto Varci, who was much the friend of his abilities, and of those of every master, afterwards wrote the following sonnet in memory of his fame. Come potro da me, se tu non presti o forza, o tregio al mio, granduolo interno, soffrirlo in passe mai, Signor Superno, che fin chi nuova, agnor pena mi desti, donc de mei piu cari or kegli, or kesti, verdi san voli, all'alto esilo eterno, ed io canuto in questo basso inferno, a pianger sempre, il lamentarmi resti, schiolgami al men tua gran bontadi quinsi, Or che rio fasto nostra, o sua ventura, c'era ben degno d'altra vita, i gente, per far pio rico il cielo, e la scultura men bella, e mi col buon martem dolente, na privi o pietà del secondo vinci. End of section 5section six of lives of the most eminent painters sculptors and architects volume seven by giorgio vasari translation by gaston de c de Vere. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by rita buchos bacchio bandinelli life of bacchio bandinelli sculptor of florence part one in the days when the arts of design flourished in Florence by the favor and assistance of the elder Lorenzo de' Medici the Magnificent, there lived in the city a goldsmith named Michelagnolo de Viviano of Gaiol, who worked excellently well at chasing and in cavo for enamels and niello, and was very skillful in every sort of work in gold and silver plate. This Michelagnolo had a great knowledge of jewels, and set them very well, and on account of his talents and his versatility, all the foreign masters of his art used to have recourse to him, and he gave them hospitality as well as to the young men of the city, insomuch that his workshop was held to be as it was the first in Florence. Of him the magnificent Lorenzo and all the house of Medici availed themselves, 
and for the tourney that Giuliano, the brother of that magnificent Lorenzo, held on the Piazza di San Croce, he executed with subtle craftsmanship all the ornaments of helmets, crests, and devices. Wherefore he acquired a great name and much intimacy with the sons of the magnificent Lorenzo, to whom his work was ever afterwards very dear and no less useful to him their acquaintance and friendship, by reason of which, and also by the many works that he executed throughout the whole city and dominion, he became a man of substance, as well as one of much repute in his art. To this Michelagnolo, the Medici, on their departure from Florence in the year 1494, entrusted much plate in silver and gold, which was all kept in safe hiding by him, and faithfully preserved until their return, when he was much extolled by them for his fidelity, and afterwards recompensed with rewards. In the year 1487 there was born to Michelagnolo a son, whom he called Bartolomeo, but afterwards, according to the Florentine custom, he was called by everyone Bacchio. Michelagnolo, desiring to leave his son heir to his art and connection, took him into his own workshop in company with other young men who were learning to draw, for that was the custom in those times and no one was held to be a good goldsmith who was not a good draughtsman and able to work well in relief bacchio then in his first years gave his attention to design according to the teaching of his father being assisted no less to make proficience by the competition of the other lads among whom he chose as his particular companion one called piloto who afterwards became an able goldsmith and with him he often went about the churches drawing the works of the good painters but also mingling work in relief with his drawing and counterfeiting in wax certain sculptures of donato and verrocchio besides executing some works in clay in the round while still a boy in age bacchio frequented at times the workshop of girolamo del buda a commonplace painter on the piazza di san pulinari there at one time during the winter a great quantity of snow had fallen which had been thrown afterwards by the people into a heap in that piazza and girolamo turning to bacchio said to him jestingly Bacchio, if this snow were marble, could we not carve a fine giant out of it, such as a marforio lying down? We could so, answered Bacchio, and I suggest that we should act as if it were marble. And immediately, throwing off his cloak, he set his hands to the snow, and, assisted by other boys, taking away the snow where there was too much, and adding some in other places, he made a rough figure of Marforio lying down, eight brachia in length. Whereupon the painter and all the others stood marvelling, not so much at what he had done, as at the spirit with which he had set his hand to a work so vast, and he so young and so small. Bacchio, indeed, having more love for sculpture than for goldsmith's work, gave many proofs of this, and when he went to Pinzirimonte, a villa bought by his father, he would often plant himself before the naked laborers and draw them with great eagerness, and he did the same with the cattle on the farm. At this time he continued for many days to go in the morning to Prato, which was near the villa, where he stayed the whole day drawing in the chapel of the Pieve from the work of Fra Filippo Lippi, and he did not cease until he had drawn it all, imitating the draperies of that master who did them very well. And already he handled with great skill the style and the pen, and also chalk both red and black, which last is a soft stone that comes from the mountains of France, and with it, when cut to a point, drawings can be executed with great delicacy. These things making clear to Michelagnolo the mind and inclination of his son, he also changed his intention, like the boy himself, and being likewise advised by his friends, placed him under the care of Giovan Francesco Rosticci, 
one of the best sculptors in the city, whose workshop was still constantly frequented by Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo, seeing the drawings of Bacchio, and being pleased with them, exhorted him to persevere, and to take to working in relief, and he recommended strongly to him the works of Donato, saying also that he should execute something in marble, such as a head or a low relief. Bacchio, encouraged by the comforting advice of Leonardo, set himself to copy in marble an antique head of a woman, of which he had shaped a model from one that is in the house of the Medici. This, for his first work, he executed passing well, and it was held very dear by Andrea Carnesecchi, who received it as a present from Bacchio's father, and placed it in his house in the Via Larga, over that door in the centre of the court, which leads into the garden. Now, Bacchio continuing to make other models of figures in clay in the round, his father, wishing not to fail in his duty towards the praiseworthy zeal of his son, sent for some blocks of marble from Carrara, and caused to be built for him, at the end of his house at Pinti, a room with lights arranged for working, which looked out upon the Via Fiesolana whereupon he set himself to block out various figures in those marbles, and one, among others, he carried well on from a piece of marble of two brachia and a half, which was a Hercules that is holding the dead Casos beneath him between his legs. These sketches were left in the same place in memory of him. At this time was thrown open to view the cartoon of Michelagnolo Buonarti, full of nude figures, which Michelagnolo had executed at the commission of Piero Sardarini for the great council chamber, and, as has been related in another place, all the craftsmen flocked together to draw it on account of its excellence. Among these came Bacchio, and no long time passed before he outstripped them all, for the reason that he understood nudes, and outlined, shaded, and finished them better than any of the other draftsmen, among whom were Jacopo Sansovino, Andrea del Sarto, Il Rosso, who was then very young, and Alfonso Berugetta the Spaniard, together with many other famous craftsmen. Bacchio frequented the place more than any of the others, and had a counterfeit key, and it happened that, Piero Sardarini, having been deposed from the government about this time in the year 1512, and the House of Medici having been restored to power, during the confusion caused in the palace by the change of government, Bacchio entered in secret, all by himself, and tore the cartoon into many pieces of which, not knowing the reason, some said that Bacchio had torn it up in order to have some pieces of the cartoon in his possession for his own convenience. Some declared that he wished to deprive the other young men of that advantage, so that they might not be able to profit by it, and make themselves a name in art. Others said that he was moved to do this by his affection for Leonardo da Vinci, from whom Michelagnolo's cartoon had taken much of his reputation. And others again, perhaps interpreting his action better, attributed it to the hatred which he felt against Michelagnolo, and afterwards demonstrated as long as he lived. The loss of the cartoon was no light one for the city, and very heavy the blame that was rightly laid upon Bacchio by everyone, as an envious and malicious person. Bacchio then executed some pieces of cartoon with lead white and charcoal, among which was a very beautiful one of a nude Cleopatra, which he presented to the goldsmith Piloto. Having already acquired a name as a great draughtsman, he was desirous of learning to paint in colors, having a firm belief that he would not only equal Buonarti, but even greatly surpass him in both fields of art. Now he had executed a cartoon of Aleda, in which Castor and Pollux were issuing from the egg of the swan embraced by her 
and he wished to color it in oils, in such a way as to make it appear that the methods of handling the colors and mixing them together in order to make the various tints, with the lights and shades, had not been taught to him by others, but that he had found them by himself, and after pondering how he could do this, he thought of the following expedient. He besought Andrea del Sarto, who was much his friend, that he should paint a portrait of him in oils, flattering himself that he would thereby gain two advantages in accordance with his purpose. One was that he would see the method of mixing the colors, and the other was that the painted picture would remain in his hands, which, having seen it executed and understanding it, would assist him and serve him as a pattern. But Andrea perceived Bacchio's intention as he made his request, and was angry at his want of confidence and astuteness, for he would have been willing to show him what he desired, if Bacchio had asked him as a friend. Wherefore, without making any sign that he had found him out, and refraining from mixing the colors into tints, he placed every sort of color on his palette, and mingled them together with the brush and taking some now from one and now from another with great dexterity of hand counterfeited in this way the vivid colouring of bacchio's face the latter both through the artfulness of andrea and because he had to sit still where he was if he wished to be painted was never able to see or learn anything that he wished and it was a fine notion of andrea's thus at the same time to punish the deceitfulness of his friend and to display with this method of painting like a well-practised master even greater ability and experience in art for all this however bacchio did not abandon his determination in which he was assisted by the painter rosso whom he afterwards asked more openly for the help that he desired Having thus learned the methods of colouring, he painted a picture in oils of the Holy Fathers delivered from the limbo of hell by the Saviour, and also a larger picture of Noah drunk with wine and revealing his nakedness in the presence of his sons. He tried his hand at painting on the wall on fresh plaster, and executed on the walls of his house heads arms legs and torsi coloured in various ways but perceiving that this involved him in greater difficulties than he had expected through the drying of the plaster he returned to his former study of working in relief he made a figure of marble three brachia in height of a young mercury with a flute in his hand with which he took great pains and it was extolled and held to be a rare work and afterwards in the year fifteen thirty it was bought by giovan battista della pala and sent to france to king francis who held it in great estimation Bacchio devoted himself with great study and solicitude to examining and reproducing the most minute details of anatomy, persevering in this for many months and even years. And certainly one can praise highly in this man his desire for honor and excellence in art, and for working well therein, spurred by which desire and by the most fiery ardor, with which rather than with aptitude or dexterity in art he had been endowed by nature from his earliest years bacchio spared himself no fatigue never relaxed his efforts for a moment was always intent either on preparing for work or on working always occupied and never to be found idle thinking that by continual work he would surpass all others who had ever practised his art and promising this result to himself as the reward of his incessant study and endless labor continuing therefore his zealous study he not only produced a great number of sheets drawn in various ways with his own hand but also contrived to get agostino viniziano the engraver of prince to engrave for him a nude cleopatra and a larger plate filled with various anatomical studies in order to see whether this would be successful and the latter plate brought him great praise 
he then set himself to make in wax in full relief a figure one braccio and a half in height of st jerome in penitence lean beyond belief which showed on the bones the muscles all withered a great part of the nerves and the skin dry and wrinkled and with such diligence was this work executed by him that all the craftsmen and particularly leonardo da vinci pronounced the opinion that there had never been seen a better thing of its kind nor one wrought with greater art this figure bacchio carried to cardinal giovanni de medici and to his brother the magnificent giuliano and by its means he made himself known to them as the son of the goldsmith miguel agnolo and they besides praising the work showed him many other favours this was in the year fifteen twelve when they had returned to their house and their government at this same time there were being executed in the office of works of santa maria del fiori certain apostles of marble which were to be set up within the marble tabernacles in those very places in that church where there are the apostles painted by the painter lorenzo de bicci at the instance of the magnificent giuliano there was allotted to bacchio a saint peter four braccia and a half in height which after a long time he brought to completion and although it has not the highest perfection of sculpture nevertheless good design may be seen in it this apostle remained in the office of works from the year fifteen thirteen down to fifteen sixty five in which year duke cosimo in honour of the marriage of queen joanna of austria his daughter-in-law was pleased to have the interior of santa maria del fiore whitewashed which church had never been touched from the time of its erection down to that day and to have four apostles set up in their places among which was the saint peter mentioned above end of section six bacchio bandanelli part one section seven of lives of the most eminent painters sculptors and architects volume seven by giorgio vasari translation by gaston de c de Vere. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by rita boutros bacchio bandinelli sculptor of florence part two now in the year fifteen fifteen pope leo x passing through florence on his way to bologna the city in order to do him honour ordained among many other ornaments and festive preparations that there should be made a colossal figure of nine braccia and a half which was to be placed under an arch of the loggia in the piazza near the palace and this was given to bacchio this colossal figure was a Hercules, and from the premature words of Bacchio, men expected that it would surpass the David of Buonarti, which stood there near it. But the act did not correspond to the word, nor the work to the boast, and it robbed Bacchio of much of the estimation in which he had previously been held by the craftsmen and by the whole city. Pope Leo had allotted the work of the ornamentation in marble that surrounds the chamber of Our Lady at Loreto, with the statues and scenes, to Maestro Andrea Cantucci of Monte Sansovino, who had already executed some of these with great credit to himself, and was then engaged on others. Now at this time Bacchio took to Rome, for the Pope, a very beautiful model of a new David, who was holding Goliath under him, and was cutting off his head, which model he intended to execute in bronze, or in marble, for that very spot in the court of the house of the Medici in Florence, where there once stood the David of Donato which at the spoiling of the Medici palace was taken to the palace that then belonged to the Signori. The Pope, having praised Bacchio, but not thinking that the time had come to execute the David, sent him to Loreto to Maestro Andrea, to the end that Andrea might give him one of those scenes to do. 
Having arrived at Loreto, he was received lovingly by Maestro Andrea, and shown much kindness, both on account of his fame and because the Pope had recommended him, and a piece of marble was assigned to him from which he should carve the Nativity of Our Lady. Bacchio, after making the model, began the work, but, being a person who was not able to endure a colleague or an equal, and had little praise for the work of others, he also began to speak hardly before the other sculptors who were there, of the works of Maestro Andrea, saying that he had no design, and he said the same of the others, insomuch that in a short time he made himself disliked by them all whereupon all that Bacchio had said of Maestro Andrea having come to his ears, he, like a wise man, answered him lovingly, saying that works are done with the hands and not with the tongue, that good design is to be looked for not in drawings, but in the perfection of the work finished in stone, and finally that in future Bacchio should speak of him in a different tone. But Bacchio answered him arrogantly with many abusive words. Maestro Andrea could endure no more, and rushed upon him in order to kill him. But Bandinelli was torn away from him by some who intervened between them. Being therefore forced to depart from Loreto, Bacchio had his scene carried to Ancona. But he grew weary of it, although it was near completion, and he went away leaving it unfinished. This work was finished afterwards by Raffaello da Montalupo, and placed together with the others of Maestro Andrea, but it is by no means equal to them in excellence, although even so it is worthy of praise. Bacchio, having returned to Rome, obtained a promise from the Pope through the favor of Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, always ready to assist the arts and their followers, that he should be commissioned to execute some statue for the court of the Medici Palace in Florence. Having therefore come to Florence, he made an Orpheus of marble, who, with his playing and his singing, is charming Cerberus, and moving hell itself to compassion. He imitated in this work the Apollo of the Belvedere at Rome, and it was very highly praised, and rightly, because although the Orpheus of Bacchio is not in the attitude of the Apollo Belvedere, nevertheless it reproduces very successfully the manner of the torso and of all the members. The statue, when finished, was carried by order of Cardinal Giulio, while he was governing Florence, into the above-mentioned court, and placed on a carved base executed by the sculptor Benedetto da Rovenzano. But since Bacchio never paid any attention to the art of architecture, he took no heed of the genius of Donatello, who had made for the David that was there before a simple column on which rested a cleft basin open work, to the end that one entering from without might see from the street door the inner door, that of the other court opposite to him, and, not having such foresight, he caused his statue to be placed on a broad and wholly solid base, of such a kind that it blocks the view of him who enters, and covers the opening of the inner door so that in passing through the first door one does not see whether the palace extends farther inwards or finishes in the first court. Cardinal Giulio had caused a most beautiful villa to be erected below Monte Mario at Rome, and wished to set up two giants in this villa, and he had them executed in stucco by Bacchio, who was always delighted to make giants. These figures, eight braccia in height, stand one on either side of the gate that leads into the wood, and they were held to be reasonably beautiful. While Bacchio was engaged on these works, never abandoning his practice of drawing, he caused Marco da Ravenna and Agostino Viniziano, the engravers of prints, to engrave a scene drawn by him on a very large sheet, on which was the slaughter of the innocents, so cruelly done to death by Herod. 
this scene which was filled by him with a quantity of nudes both male and female children living and dead and women and soldiers in various attitudes made known the fine draughtsmanship that he showed in figures and his knowledge of muscles and of all the members and it won him great fame over all europe he also made a most beautiful model of wood with the figures in wax of a tomb for the king of england which in the end was not carried out by bacchio but was given to the sculptor benedetto da rovezzano who executed it in metal there had recently returned from france cardinal bernardo de visio of bibiena who perceiving that king francis possessed not a single work in marble whether ancient or modern although he much delighted in such things had promised his majesty that he would prevail on the pope to send him some beautiful work after this cardinal there came to the pope two ambassadors from king francis and they having seen the statues of the belvedere lavished all the praise at their command on the laocoon cardinals de medici and bibiena who were with them asked them whether the king would be glad to have a work of that kind and they answered that it would be too great a gift then the cardinal said to them there shall be sent to his majesty either this one or one so like it that there shall be no difference and having resolved to have another made in imitation of it he remembered bacchio whom he sent for and asked whether he had the courage to make a laocoon equal to the original bacchio answered that he was confident that he could make one not merely equal to it but even surpassing it in perfection the cardinal then resolved that the work should be begun and bacchio while waiting for the marble to come made one in wax which was much extolled and also executed a cartoon in lead white and charcoal of the same size as the one in marble after the marble had come and bacchio had caused an enclosure with a roof for working in to be erected for himself in the belvedere he made a beginning with one of the boys of the laocoon the larger one and executed this in such a manner that the pope and all those who were good judges were satisfied because between his work and the ancient there was scarcely any difference to be seen but after setting his hand to the other boy and to the statue of the father which is in the middle he had not gone far when the pope died adrian the sixth being then elected he returned with the cardinal to florence where he occupied himself with his studies and design after the death of adrian and the election of clement the seventh bacchio went post haste to rome in order to be in time for his coronation for which he made statues and scenes in half relief by order of his holiness then having been provided by the pope with rooms and an allowance he returned to his laocoon a work which was executed by him in the space of two years with the greatest excellence that he ever achieved he also restored the right arm of the ancient laocoon which had been broken off and never found and bacchio made one of the full size in wax which so resembled the ancient work in the muscles in force and in manner and harmonized with it so well that it showed how bacchio understood his art and this model served him as a pattern for making the whole arm of his own laocoon this work seemed to his holiness to be so good that he changed his mind and resolved to send other ancient statues to the king and this one to florence and to cardinal silvio passerino of cortona his legate in florence who was then governing the city he sent orders that he should place the laocoon at the head of the second court in the palace of the medici this was in the year fifteen twenty five this work brought great fame to bacchio who after finishing the laocoon set himself to draw a scene on a sheet of royal folio laid open in order to carry out a design of the pope who wished to have the martyrdom of san cosimo and san damiano painted on one wall of the principal chapel of san lorenzo in florence 
and on the other that of San Lawrence, when he was put to death by Decius on the gridiron. Bacchio then drew with great subtlety the story of San Lawrence, in which he counterfeited with much judgment and art, figures both clothed and nude, different attitudes and gestures in the bodies and limbs, and various movements in those who are standing about San Lawrence, engaged in their dreadful office, and in particular the cruel Decius, who, with threatening brow, is urging on the fiery death of the innocent martyr, who, raising one arm to heaven, recommends his spirit to God. With this scene, Bacchio so satisfied the Pope that he took steps to have it engraved on copper by Marc Antonio Bolognese, which was done by Marc Antonio with great diligence, and His Holiness created Bacchio in order to do honor to his talents, a chevalier of San Pietro. After these things, Bacchio returned to Florence, where he found that Giovanni Francesco Rastici, his first master, was painting a scene of the conversion of St. Paul, for which reason he undertook to make in a cartoon, in competition with his master, a nude figure of a young St. John in the desert, who is holding a lamb with the left arm and raising the right to heaven. Then, having caused a panel to be prepared, he set himself to color it, and when it was finished, he exposed it to view in the workshop of his father, Michelagnolo, opposite to the descent that leads from Or San Michel to the Mercato Nuovo. The design was praised by the craftsmen, but not so much the coloring, because it was somewhat crude and painted in no beautiful manner but Bacchio sent it as a present to Pope Clement, who had it placed in his Gartaroba, where it may still be found. As far back as the time of Leo X, there had been quarried at Carrara, together with the marbles for the façade of San Lorenzo in Florence, another block of marble nine braccia and a half high, and five braccia wide at the foot. With this block of marble, Michelagnolo Bornarti had thought of making a giant in the person of Hercules slaying Cassus, intending to place it in the piazza beside the colossal figure of David formerly made by him, since both the one and the other, David and Hercules, were emblems of the palace. He had made several designs and various models for it, and had sought to gain the favor of Pope Leo and of Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, saying that the David had many defects caused by the sculptor Maestro Andrea, who had first blocked it out and spoiled it. But by reason of the death of Leo, the façade of San Lorenzo was for a time abandoned, and also this block of marble. Now afterwards, Pope Clement, having conceived a desire to avail himself of Michelagnolo for the tombs of the heroes of the House of Medici, which he wished to have constructed in the sacristy of San Lorenzo, it became once more necessary to quarry marbles, and the head of these works, keeping the accounts of the expenses, was Domenico born in Segni. This man tried to tempt Michelagnolo to make a secret partnership with him in the matter of the stonework for the façade of San Lorenzo, but Michelagnolo refused, not consenting that his genius should be employed in defrauding the Pope, and Domenico conceived such hatred against him that he went about ever afterwards opposing his undertakings in order to annoy and humiliate him, but this he did covertly. He thus contrived to have the façade discontinued, and the sacristy pushed forward, which two works, he said, were enough to keep Michelagnolo occupied for many years. And as for the marble for the making of the giant, he urged the Pope that it should be given to Bacchio, who at that time had nothing to do, saying that through the emulation of two men so eminent, his holiness would be served better, and with more diligence and promptitude, rivalry stimulating both the one and the other in his work. The council of Domenico pleased the Pope, and he acted in accordance with it. 
Bacchio, having obtained the marble, made a great model in wax, which was a Hercules who, having fixed the head of Cassus between two stones with one knee, was constraining him with great force with the left arm, holding him crouching under his legs in a distorted attitude, wherein Cassus revealed his suffering and the strain of the weight of Hercules upon him, which was rending asunder every least muscle in his whole body. Hercules, likewise, with his head bent down close against his enemy, grinding and gnashing his teeth, was raising the right arm, and with great vehemence giving him another blow with his club, in order to dash his head to pieces. Michelagnolo, as soon as he had heard that the marble had been given to Bacchio, was very much displeased but for all the efforts that he had made in this matter he was never able to turn the pope from his purpose so completely had he been satisfied by bacchio's model to which reason were added his promises and boasts for he boasted that he would surpass the david of michelagnolo and he was also assisted by buon insegni who said that michelagnolo desired everything for himself Thus was the city deprived of a rare ornament, such as that marble would undoubtedly have been when shaped by the hand of Buonarti. The above-mentioned model of Bacchio is now to be found in the Gardaroba of Duke Cosimo, by whom it is held very dear, and by the craftsmen as a rare work. Bacchio was sent to Carrara to see this marble, and the overseers of the works of Santa Maria del Fiore were commissioned to transport it by water along the river Arno as far as Signa. The marble, having been conveyed there within a distance of eight miles from Florence, when they set about removing it from the river in order to transport it by land, the river being too low from Signa to Florence, it fell into the water, and on account of its great size sank so deep into the sand that the overseers, with all the contrivances that they used, were not able to drag it out for which reason the Pope, wishing that the marble should be recovered at all costs, by order of the wardens of works, Pietro Rosselli, an old builder of great ingenuity, went to work in such a manner that, having diverted the course of the water into another channel, and cut away the bank of the river, with levers and windlasses he moved it, dragged it out of the Arno, and brought it to solid ground, for which he was greatly extolled. Tempted by this accident to the marble, certain persons wrote verses, both Tuscan and Latin, ingeniously ridiculing Bacchio, who was detested for his loquacity and his evil speaking against Michelagnolo and all the other craftsmen. One among them took for his verses the following subject, saying that the marble, after having been approved by the genius of Michelagnolo, learning that it was to be mangled by the hands of Bacchio, had thrown itself into the river out of despair at such an evil fate. While the marble was being drawn out of the water, a difficult process which took time, Bacchio found on measuring it that it was neither high enough nor wide enough to enable him to carve the figures of his first model. Whereupon he went to Rome, taking the measurements with him, and made known to the Pope how he was constrained by necessity to abandon his first design and make another. He then made several models, and out of their number the Pope was most pleased with one in which Hercules had Cassus between his legs, and grasping his hair, was holding him down after the manner of a prisoner and this one they resolved to adopt and to carry into execution. On returning to Florence, Bacchio found that the marble had been conveyed into the office of works of Santa Maria del Fiore by Pietro Roselli, who had first placed on the ground some planks of walnut wood plain square and laid lengthways, which he kept changing according as the marble moved forward under which and upon those planks he placed some round rollers well shod with iron, so that by pulling the marble with three windlasses to which he had attached it, little by little he brought it with ease into the office of works. 
the block having been set up there bacchio began a model in clay as large as the marble and shaped according to the last one which he had made previously in rome and he finished it working with great diligence in a few months but with all this it appeared to many craftsmen that there was not in this model that spirited vivacity that the action required nor that which he had given to his first model afterwards beginning to work at the marble bacchio cut it away all round as far as the navel laying bare the limbs in front and taking care all the time to carve the figures in such a way that they might be exactly like those of the large model in clay end of section seven part two Section 8 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Bacchio Bandinelli, Sculptor of Florence, Part 3. At this same time, Bacchio had undertaken to execute in painting an altarpiece of considerable size for the church of Castello, and for this he had made a very beautiful cartoon containing a dead Christ surrounded by the Maries with Nicodemus and other figures, but for a reason that we shall give below, he did not paint the altarpiece. He also made at this time, in order to paint a picture, a cartoon in which was christ taken down from the cross and held in the arms of nicodemus with his mother who was standing weeping for him and an angel who was holding in his hands the nails and the crown of thorns setting himself straightway to colour it he finished it quickly and placed it on exhibition in the workshop of his friend giovanni di goro the goldsmith in the mercato nuovo in order to hear the opinions of men, and particularly what Michelagnolo said of it. Michelagnolo was taken by the goldsmith Piloto to see it, and after he had examined every part, he said that he marvelled that so good a draughtsman as Bacchio should allow a picture so crude and wanting in grace to leave his hands, that he had seen the most feeble painters executing their works in a better manner, and that this was no art for Bacchio. Pelotto reported Michelagnolo's judgment to Bacchio, who, for all the hatred that he felt against him, recognized that he spoke the truth. Certainly Bacchio's drawings were very beautiful, but in colors he executed them badly and without grace, and he therefore resolved to paint no more with his own hand. But he took into his service one who handled colors passing well, a young man called Agnolo the brother of the excellent painter Francia Biggio, who had died a few years before. To this Agnolo he desired to entrust the execution of the altarpiece for Castello, but it remained unfinished, the reason of which was the change of government in Florence, which took place in the year 1527, when the Medici left Florence after the sack of Rome for Bacchio did not think himself safe, having a private feud with a neighbor at his villa of Pinzeromonte, who was of the popular party, and after he had buried at that villa some cameos and little antique figures of bronze which belonged to the Medici, he went off to live in Lucca. There he remained until the time when the Emperor Charles V came to receive his crown at Bologna whereupon he presented himself before the pope and then went with him to rome where he was given rooms in the belvedere as before while bacchio was living there his holiness resolved to fulfil a vow that he had made when he was shut up in the castello di sant'angelo 
which vow was that he would place on the summit of the great round tower of marble which is in front of the ponte de castello seven large figures of bronze each six braccia in length and all lying down in different attitudes as it were vanquished by an angel that he wished to have set up on the centre of the tower upon a column of variegated marble the angel being of bronze with a sword in the hand by this figure of the angel he wished to represent the angel michael the guardian and protector of the castle whose favour and assistance had delivered him and brought him out of that prison and the seven recumbent figures were to personify the seven mortal sins demonstrating that with the help of the victorious angel he had conquered and thrown to the ground his enemies evil and impious men who were represented by those seven figures of the seven mortal sins for this work his holiness caused a model to be made which having pleased him he ordained that bacchio should begin to make the figures in clay of the size that they were to be in order to have them cast afterwards in bronze Bacchio began the work and finished in one of the apartments in the Belvedere one of those figures in clay which was much extolled. At the same time also, in order to divert himself and wishing to see how he would succeed in casting, he made many little figures in the round, two-thirds of a Bacchio in height, as of Hercules, Venus, Apollo, leda and other fantasies of his own which he caused to be cast in bronze by maestro jacopo della barba of florence and they succeeded excellently well he presented them afterwards to his holiness and to many lords and some of them are now in the study of duke cosimo among a collection of more than a hundred antique figures all very choice and others that are modern at this same time, Bacchio had made a scene of the deposition from the cross, with little figures in low relief and half relief, which was a rare work, and he had it cast with great diligence in bronze. When finished, he presented it in Genoa to Charles V, who held it very dear, and a sign of this was that His Majesty gave Bacchio a commandery of San Iago, and made him a chevalier. From Prince Doria also he received many courtesies, and from the Republic of Genoa he had the commission for a statue of marble, six braccia high, which was to be a Neptune in the likeness of Prince Doria, to be set up on the piazza in memory of the virtues of that prince, and of the extraordinary benefits that his native country of Genoa had received from him. This statue was allotted to Bacchio at the price of a thousand florins, of which he received five hundred at that time, and he went straightway to Carrara to block it out at the quarry of Polvacchio. While the popular government was ruling Florence, after the departure of the Medici, Michelagnolo Buonarti was employed on the fortifications of the city and there was shown to him the marble that bacchio had blocked out together with the model of the hercules and cassus the intention being that if the marble had not been cut away too much michelagnolo should take it and carve from it two figures after his own design michelagnolo having examined the block thought of a different subject and abandoning the hercules and cassus he chose the subject of samson holding beneath him two philistines whom he had cast down one being already dead and the other still alive against whom he was aiming a blow with the jawbone of an ass seeking to kill him but even as it often happens that the minds of men promise themselves at times certain things the opposite of which is determined by the wisdom of god so it came to pass then for a war having arisen against the city of florence michelagnolo had other things to think about than polishing marble and was obliged from fear of the citizens to withdraw from the city afterwards the war being finished and peace made pope clement caused michelagnolo to return to florence in order to finish the sacristy of san lorenzo and sent bacchio to see to the completion of the giant 
Bacchio, while engaged in this, took up his abode in the palace of the Medici, and writing almost every week to his holiness in order to make a show of devotion, he entered, besides dealing with matters of art, into particulars relating to the citizens and those who were administering the government, with an odious officiousness likely to bring upon him even more ill-will than he had awakened before whereupon when duke alessandro returned from the court of his majesty to florence the citizens made known to him the sinister policy that bacchio was pursuing against them from which it followed that his work of the giant was hindered and retarded by the citizens by every means in their power at this time after the war of hungary pope clement and the emperor charles held a conference at bologna whither there went cardinal ippolito de medici and duke alessandro and it occurred to bacchio to go and kiss the feet of his holiness he took with him a panel one braccio high and one and a half wide of christ being scourged at the column by two nude figures which was in half relief and very well executed and he gave this panel to the pope together with a portrait medal of his holiness which he had caused to be made by francesco del prato his familiar friend the reverse of the medal being the flagellation of christ this gift was very acceptable to his holiness to whom bacchio described the annoyances and impediments that he had experienced in the execution of his hercules praying him that he should prevail upon the duke to give him the means to carry it to completion he added that he was envied and hated in that city, and being a very devil with his wit and his tongue, he persuaded the Pope to induce the Duke to see that his work should be brought to completion, and set up in its place in the piazza. Death had now snatched away the goldsmith Michelagnolo, the father of Bacchio, who, during his lifetime, had undertaken to make for the wardens of works of Santa Maria del Fiore, by order of the Pope, a very large cross of silver, all covered with scenes in low relief of the Passion of Christ. This cross, for which Bacchio had made the figures and scenes in wax, to be afterwards cast in silver, Michelagnolo had left unfinished at his death, and Bacchio, having the work in his hands, together with many libre of silver, sought to persuade his holiness to have it finished by Francesco del Prato, who had gone with him to Bologna but the Pope, perceiving that Bacchio wished not only to withdraw from his father's engagements, but also to make something out of the labors of Francesco, gave Bacchio orders that the silver and the scenes, those merely begun as well as those finished, should be given to the wardens of works, that the account should be settled, and that the wardens should melt all the silver of that cross in order to make use of it for the necessities of the church which had been stripped of its ornaments at the time of the siege and to bacchio he caused one hundred florins of gold and letters of recommendation to be given to the end that he might return to florence and finish the work of the giant while bacchio was at bologna cardinal doria having heard that he was about to depart went to the pains of seeking him out and threatened him with many reproaches and abusive words for the reason that he had broken his pledge and failed in his duty by neglecting to finish the statue of prince doria and leaving it only blocked out at carrara after taking five hundred crowns in payment on which account said the cardinal if andrea could get bacchio into his hands he would make him pay for it at the galleys bacchio defended himself humbly and with soft words saying that he had been delayed by a sufficient hindrance but that he had in florence a block of marble of the same height from which he had intended to carve that figure and that when he had carved and finished it he would send it to genoa and so well did he contrive to speak and to excuse himself that he succeeded in escaping from the presence of the cardinal after this he returned to florence and caused the base for the giant to be taken in hand
and himself working continuously at the figure in the year of fifteen thirty four he finished it completely but duke alessandro on account of the hostile reports of the citizens did not take steps to have it set up in the piazza the pope had returned to rome many months before this and desired to erect two tombs of marble in the minerva one for pope leo and one for himself and bacchio seizing this occasion went to rome thereupon the pope resolved that bacchio should make those tombs after he had succeeded in setting up the giant on the piazza and his holiness wrote to the duke that he should give bacchio every convenience for placing his hercules in position there whereupon after an enclosure of planks had been made all round the base was built of marble and at the foot of it they placed a stone with letters in memory of pope clement the seventh and a good number of medals with the heads of his holiness and of duke alessandro the giant was then taken from the office of works where it had been executed and in order to convey it with greater ease without damaging it they made round it a scaffolding of wood with ropes passing under the legs and cords supporting it under the arms and at every other part and thus suspended in the air between the beams in such a way that it did not touch the wood little by little by means of compound pulleys and windlasses and ten pairs of oxen it was drawn as far as the piazza great assistance was rendered by two thick semi-cylindrical beams which were fixed lengthways along the foot of the scaffolding in the manner of a base and rested on other similar beams smeared with soap which were withdrawn and replaced by workmen in succession according as the structure moved forward and with these ingenious contrivances the giant was conveyed safely and without much labor to the piazza the charge of all this was given to bacchio d'agnolo and the elder antonio de san gallon the architects to the office of works who afterwards with other beams and a double system of compound pulleys set the statue securely on its base it would not be easy to describe the concourse and multitude that for two days occupied the whole piazza flocking to see the giant as soon as it was uncovered and various judgments and opinions were heard from all kinds of men each one censuring the work and the master there were also attached round the base many verses both latin and tuscan in which it was pleasing to see the wit the ingenious conceits and the sharp sayings of the writers but they overstepped all decent limits with their evil speaking and their biting and satirical compositions and duke alessandro considering that the work being a public one the indignity was his was forced to put in prison some who went so far as to attach sonnets openly and without scruple to the statue which proceeding soon stopped the mouths of the critics when bacchio examined his work in position it seemed to him that the open air was little favourable to it making the muscles appear too delicate having therefore caused a new enclosure of planks to be made around it he attacked it again with his chisels and strengthening the muscles in many places gave the figures stronger relief than they had before finally the work was uncovered for good and by every one able to judge it has always been held to be not only a triumph over difficulties but also very well studied with every part carefully considered and the figure of cassus excellently adapted to its position it is true that the david of michelagnolo which is beside bacchio's hercules takes away not a little of its glory being the most beautiful colossal figure that has ever been made for in it is all grace and excellence whereas the manner of bacchio is entirely different but in truth considering bacchio's hercules by itself one cannot but praise it highly and all the more because it is known that many sculptors have since tried to make colossal statues and not one has attained to the standard of bacchio 
who, if he had received as much grace and facility from nature as he took pains and trouble by himself, would have been absolutely perfect in the art of sculpture. Desiring to know what was being said of his work, he sent to the piazza a pedagogue, whom he kept in his house, telling him that he should not fail to report to him the truth of what he might hear said. The pedagogue, hearing nothing but censure, returned sadly to the house, and when questioned by Bacchio, answered that all with one voice were abusing the giants, and that they pleased no one. "'And you,' answered Bacchio, "'what do you say of them?' "'I speak well of them,' he replied, "'and say, may it please you, that they please me.' "'I will not have them please you,' said Bacchio, "'and you also must speak ill of them, "'for, as you may remember, "'I never speak well of any one, "'and so we are quits.' "'Thus Bacchio concealed his vexation, "'and it was always his custom to act thus, "'pretending not to care for the censure "'that any man laid on his works. "'Nevertheless, it is likely enough "'that his resentment was considerable, "'because when a man labours for honour "'and then obtains nothing but censure, "'one cannot but believe, "'although that censure may be unjust and undeserved, "'that it afflicts him secretly in his heart "'and torments him continually.' He was consoled in his displeasure by an estate, which was given to him in addition to his payment by order of Pope Clement. This gift was doubly dear to him, first because it was useful for its revenue, and was near his villa of Pinziremonte, and then because it had previously belonged to Rignadori, his mortal enemy, who had just been declared an outlaw, and with whom he had always been at strife on account of the boundary of this property. At this time a letter was written to Duke Alessandro by Prince Doria, asking that he should prevail upon Bacchio to finish his statue, now that the giant was completely finished, and saying that he was ready to revenge himself on Bacchio if he did not do his duty, at which Bacchio was so frightened that he would not trust himself to go to Carrara. However, having been reassured by Cardinal Cibo and Duke Alessandro, he went there, and working with some assistance, proceeded to carry the statue forward. The prince had himself informed every day as to how much Bacchio was doing, wherefore, receiving a report that the statue was not of that excellence which had been promised, he gave Bacchio to understand that, if he did not serve him well, he would make him smart for it. Bacchio, hearing this, spoke very ill of the prince, which, having come to the prince's ears, he determined to get him into his hands at all costs, and to take vengeance upon him by putting him in wholesome fear of the galleys. Whereupon Bacchio, seeing certain persons spying and keeping a watch upon him, became suspicious, and being a shrewd and resolute man, left the work as it was, and returned to Florence. About this time a son was born to Bacchio, from a woman whom he kept in his house, and to this son, Pope Clement having died in those days, he gave the name of Clemente, in memory of that pontiff who had always loved and favoured him. After the death of Pope Clement, he heard that Cardinal Ippolito de' Medici, Cardinal Innocenzio Cibo, Cardinal Giovanni Salviati, and Cardinal Niccolò Ridolfi, together with Messer Baldassari Torini de Pescia, being the executors of the Pope's will, had commissions to give for the two marble tombs of Leo and Clement, which were to be placed in the Minerva. For these tombs Bacchio in the past had already made the models, but the work had been promised recently to the Ferrari sculptor Alfonso Lombardi through the favour of Cardinal de' Medici, whose servant he was. This Alfonso, by the advice of Michelagnolo, had changed the design of the tombs, and he had already made the models for them, but without any contract for the commission, relying wholly on promises, and expecting every day to have to go to Carrara to quarry the marble. While the time was slipping away in this manner, it happened that Cardinal Ippolito died of poison on his way to meet Charles V. 
Bacchio, hearing this, went without wasting any time to Rome, where he was first received by the sister of Poplio, Madonna Lucrezia Salviante de Medici, to whom he strove to prove that no one could do greater honor to the remains of those great pontiffs than himself, with his ability and art adding that alfonso was a sculptor without power of design and without skill and judgment in the handling of marble and that he was not able to execute so honourable an undertaking save only with the help of others he also used many other devices and so went to work in various ways and by various means that he succeeded in changing the purpose of those lords who finally entrusted to cardinal salviati the charge of making an agreement with bacchio at this time the emperor charles v had arrived in naples and in rome filippo strozzi and Don Francesco degli Albizzi and the other exiles were seeking to arrange with Cardinal Salviati to go and set his majesty against Duke Alessandro, and they were with the cardinal at all hours. Bacchio was also all day long in Salviati's halls and apartments, waiting to have the contract made for the tombs, but not able to bring matters to a head, because of the cardinal's preoccupation with the affairs of the exiles. And they, seeing Bacchio in those rooms morning and evening, grew suspicious of this, and fearing lest he might be there to spy upon their movements and give information to the duke, some of the young men among them agreed to follow him secretly one evening and put him out of the way. But fortune, coming to his aid in time, brought it about that the two other cardinals with messer baldassare de pescia undertook to finish bacchio's business knowing that bacchio was worth little as an architect they had caused a design to be made by antonio de san gallo which pleased them and had ordained that all the mason's work to be done in marble should be executed under the direction of the sculptor lorenzetto and that the marble statues and scenes should be allotted to bacchio having arranged the matter in this way they finally made the contract with bacchio who therefore appeared no more about the house of cardinal salviati withdrawing himself just in time and the exiles the occasion having passed by thought nothing more about him end of section eight bacchio bandinelli sculptor of florence part three Section 9 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Bacchio Bandinelli, Sculptor of Florence, Part 4. After these things, Bacchio made two models of wood, with the statues and scenes in wax. These models had the bases solid, without projections, and on each base were four fluted ionic columns, which divided the space into three compartments, a large one in the middle, where in each there was a pope in full pontificals, seated upon a pedestal, who was giving the benediction, and smaller spaces, each with a niche containing a figure in the round and standing upright, four brachia high, which figures representing saints stood on either side of those popes. The order of the composition had the form of a triumphal arch, and above the columns that supported the cornice was a marble tablet three brachia in height and four brachia and a half in width in which was a scene in half-relief. In the scene above, the statue of Pope Leo, which statue had on either side of it in the niches, St. Peter and St. Paul, was his conference with King Francis at Bologna. And this story of Leo in the middle, above the columns, was accompanied by two smaller scenes, in one of which, that above St. Peter, was the saint restoring a dead man to life and in the other, that above St. Paul, that saint preaching to the people. 
in the scene above pope clement which corresponded to that mentioned above was that pontiff crowning the emperor charles at bologna and on either side of it are two smaller scenes in one of which is st john the baptist preaching to the people and in the other st john the evangelist raising drusiana from the dead and these have below them in the niches the same saints four brachia high standing on either side of the statue of pope clement as with that of leo in this structure bacchio showed either too little religion or too much adulation or both together in that he thought fit that the first founders after christ of our religion men deified and most dear to god should give way to our popes and place them in positions unworthy of them and inferior to those of leo and clement certain it is that this design of his even as it was displeasing to god and to the saints so likewise gave no pleasure to the popes or to any other man for the reason it appears to me that religion and i mean our own the true religion should be placed by mankind before all other interests and considerations and on the other hand he who wishes to exalt and honour any other person should i think be temperate and restrained and confine himself within certain limits, so that his praise and honor may not become another thing, I mean senseless adulation, which first disgraces the praiser, and also gives no pleasure to the person praised, if he has any proper feeling, but does quite the contrary. Bacchio, in doing what I have described, made known to every one that he had much good will and affection indeed towards the popes, but little judgment in exalting and honoring them in their sepulchres. The models described above were taken by Bacchio to the garden of Cardinal Ridolfi at Sant'Agata on Monte Cavallo, where his lordship was entertaining Sibo, Salviati, and Messer Baldassari de Pescia to dinner they having assembled together there in order to settle all that was necessary in the matter of the tombs while they were at table then there arrived the sculptor solus meo an amusing and outspoken person who was always ready to speak ill of any one and little the friend of bacchio when the message was brought to those lords that Solus Meo was seeking admittance, Ridolfi ordered that he should be ushered in, and then, turning to Bacchio, said to him, I wish that we should hear what Solus Meo says of our bestowal of these tombs. Raise that door curtain, Bacchio, and stand behind it. Bacchio immediately obeyed, and when Solus Meo had entered and had been invited to drink, they then turned to the subject of the tombs allotted to Bacchio. Whereupon Solus Meo reproached the cardinals for having made a bad choice, and went on to speak all manner of evil against Bacchio, taxing him with ignorance of art, avarice, and arrogance, and going into many particulars in his criticisms. Bacchio, who stood hidden behind the door curtain, was not able to contain himself until Solus Meo should have finished, and bursting out, scowling and full of rage, said to Solus Meo, What have I done to you, that you should speak of me with such scant respect? Dumbfounded at the appearance of Bacchio, Solus Meo turned to Ridolfi and said, What tricks are these, my lord? I want nothing more to do with priests and took himself off. The cardinals had a hearty laugh both at the one and at the other, and Salviati said to Bacchio, You hear the opinion of your brothers in art. Go and give them the lie with your work. Bacchio then began the work of the statues and scenes, but his performances by no means corresponded to his promises and his duty towards those pontiffs, for he used little diligence in the figures and scenes, and left them badly finished, and full of defects, being more solicitous about drawing his money than about working at the marble. Now his patrons became aware of Bacchio's procedure, and repented of what they had done. 
but the two largest pieces of marble remained, those for the two statues that were still to be executed, one of Leo seated and the other of Clement, and those they ordered him to finish, beseeching him that he should do better in them. But Bacchio, having already drawn all the money, entered into negotiations with Messer Giovan Battista d'Aricasoli, Bishop of Cortona, who was in Rome on business of Duke Cosimo's, to depart from Rome and go to Florence, in order to serve Cosimo in the matter of the fountains of his villa of Castello, and the tomb of his father, Signor Giovanni. The duke having answered that Bacchio should come, he set off for Florence without a word, leaving the work of the tombs unfinished and the statues in the hands of two assistants. The cardinals, hearing of this, allotted those two statues of the popes which still remained to be finished to two sculptors, one of whom was Raffaello de Montelupo, who received the statue of Pope Leo, and the other Giovanni de Bacchio, to whom was given the statue of Clement. They then gave orders that the masonry and all that was prepared should be put together, and the work was erected, but the statues and scenes were in many parts neither pumiced nor polished, so that they brought Bacchio more discredit than fame. Arriving in Florence, Bacchio found that the duke had sent the sculptor Tribalo to Carrara to quarry the marble for the fountains of Castello and the tomb of Signor Giovanni and he so wrought upon the duke that he wrested the tomb of signor giovanni from the hands of tribolo demonstrating to his excellency that the marbles for such a work were already in great measure in florence thus little by little he penetrated into the confidence of the duke insomuch that both for this reason and for his arrogance every one was afraid of him he then proposed to the duke that the tomb of Signor Giovanni should be erected in the chapel of the Neroni, a narrow, confined, and mean place in San Lorenzo, being too ignorant or not wishing to suggest that for so great a prince it was proper that a new chapel should be built on purpose. He also prevailed on the duke to demand from Michelagnolo, on Bacchio's behalf, many pieces of marble that he had in Florence. And when the duke had obtained them from Michelagnolo, and Bacchio from the duke, among those marbles being some blocked-out figures and a statue carried well on towards completion by Michelagnolo, Bandinelli, taking them all over, hacked and broke to pieces everything that he could find, thinking that by so doing he was avenging himself on Michelagnolo and causing him displeasure. He found, moreover, in the same room in San Lorenzo, wherein Michelagnolo worked, two statues in one block of marble, representing Hercules crushing Antaeus, which the duke was having executed by the sculptor Fra Giovanni Agnolo. These were well advanced, but Bacchio, saying to the duke that the friar had spoilt that marble, broke it into many pieces. In the end, he constructed all the base of the tomb, which is an isolated pedestal about four brachia on every side, and has at the foot a socle with a moulding in the manner of a base, which goes right round, and with a fillet at the top, such as is generally made for pedestals, and above this a sima, three-quarters of a brachio in height, which goes inwards in a concave curve, inverted, after the manner of a frieze, on which are carved some horses' skulls bound one to another with draperies. And above the whole was to be a smaller pedestal, with a seated statue of four brachia and a half, armed in the ancient fashion, and holding in the hand the baton of a condottieri, captain of armies, which was to represent the person of the invincible Signor Giovanni de' Medici. This statue was begun by him from a block of marble, and carried well on, but never finished or placed on the base built for it. It is true that on the front of that base he finished entirely a scene of marble in half-relief, with figures about two brachia high, in which he represented Signor Giovanni seated, 
to whom are being brought many prisoners, soldiers, women with dishevelled hair, and nude figures, but all without invention and without revealing any feeling. At the end of the scene, indeed, there is a figure with a pig on the shoulder, which is said to have been made by Bacchio to represent Messer Baldassare de Pescia in derision. For Bacchio looked upon him as his enemy, since about this time Messer Baldassare, as has been related above, had allotted the two statues of Leo and Clement to other sculptors and moreover had so gone to work in rome that bacchio had perforce to restore at great inconvenience the money that he had received beyond his due for those statues and figures during this time bacchio had given his attention to nothing else but demonstrating to duke cosimo how much the glory of the ancients had lived through their statues and buildings saying that his excellency should seek to obtain in the same way immortality for himself and his actions in the ages to come then after he had brought the tomb of signor giovanni near completion he set about planning to make the duke begin some great and costly work which might take a very long time duke cosimo had ceased to inhabit the palace of the medici and had returned with his court to live in the palace in the piazza which was formerly occupied by the signorina and this he was daily rearranging and adorning now he had said to bacchio that he had a desire to make a public audience chamber both for the foreign ambassadors and for his citizens and the subjects of the state and bacchio with giuliano di bacchio d'agnolo went about thinking how to suggest to him that he should erect an ornamental work of fossato's stone and marble thirty-eight braccia in width and eighteen in height this ornamental work they proposed should serve as the audience chamber and should be in the great hall of the palace at that end which looks towards the north the audience chamber was to have a space of fourteen braccia in depth, the ascent to which was to be by seven great steps, and it was to be closed in front by a balustrade, excepting the entrance in the middle. At the end of the hall were to be three great arches, two of which were to serve for windows, being divided up by columns, four to each, two of fossato's stone and two of marble and above this was to curve a round arch with a frieze of brackets which were to form on the outer side the ornament of the façade of the palace and on the inner side to adorn in the same manner the façade of the hall the arch in the middle forming not a window but a niche was to be accompanied by two other similar niches which were to be at the ends of the audience chamber one on the east and the other on the west and adorned with four round corinthian columns which were to be ten braccia high and to form a projection at the ends in the central façade were to be four pilasters which were to serve as supports between one arch and another to the architrave frieze and cornice running right round both above the arches and above the columns these pilasters were to have between one and another a space of about three braccia and in each of these spaces was to be a niche four braccia and a half in height to contain statues by way of accompaniment to the great niche in the middle of the façade and the two at the sides in each of which niches bacchio wished to place three statues bacchio and giuliano had in mind in addition to the ornament of the inner façade another larger ornament of extraordinary cost and grandeur for the outer façade the hall being awry and out of square this ornament was to reduce that outer side to a square form and there was to be a projection of six braccia right round the walls of the palazzo vecchio with a range of columns fourteen braccia high supporting other columns between which were to be arches forming a loggia below right round the palace where there are the ringhiera and the giants 
above this again was to be another range of pilasters with arches between them in the same manner running all the way round the windows of the palazzo vecchio so as to make a facade right round the palace and above these pilasters was to be yet another range of arches and pilasters after the manner of a theatre with the battlements of that palace finally forming a cornice to the whole structure knowing that this was a work of vast expense bacchio and giuliano consulted together that they should not reveal their conception to the duke save only with regard to the ornament of the audience chamber within the hall and that of the façade of fossato's stone on the side towards the piazza stretching to the length of twenty-four braccia which is the breadth of the hall designs and plans of this work were made by giuliano and with these in his hand bacchio spoke to the duke to whom he pointed out that in the large niches at the sides he wished to place statues of marble four braccia high seated on pedestals namely leo x in the act of restoring peace to italy and clement the seventh crowning charles v with two statues in smaller niches within the large ones on either side of the popes which should represent the virtues practised and put into action by them for the niches four braccia high between the pilasters in the central façade he wished to make upright statues of signor giovanni duke alessandro and duke cosimo together with many decorations of various fantasies in carving and a pavement all of variegated marbles of different colours this ornament much pleased the duke thinking that with this opportunity it should be possible in time to bring to completion as has since been done the body of that hall with the rest of the decorations and the ceiling in order to make it the most beautiful hall in italy and so great was his excellency's desire that this work should be done that he assigned for its execution such a sum of money as bacchio wished and demanded every week a beginning was made with the quarrying and cutting of the fossato stone in order to make the ornamentation in the form of the base columns and cornices and bacchio required that all should be done and carried to completion by the stone cutters of the office of works of santa maria del fiore this work was certainly executed by those masters with great diligence and if bacchio and giuliano had urged it on they would have finished and built in all the ornaments of stone very quickly but bacchio gave his attention to nothing save to having the statues blocked out finishing few of them entirely and to drawing his salary which the duke gave him every month besides paying for his assistance and meeting every sort of expense that he incurred in the work and giving him five hundred crowns for one of the statues finished by him in marble wherefore the end of this work was never in sight even so if bacchio and giuliano being engaged on a work of such importance had brought the head of that hall into square as they could have done instead of putting right only half of the eight braccia by which it was awry and leaving several parts badly proportioned such as the central niche and the two large ones at the sides which are squat and the members of the cornices which are too slight for so great a body if as they might have done they had gone higher with the columns thus giving greater grandeur a better manner and more invention to that work and if also they had brought the uppermost cornice into touch with the level of the original old ceiling above they would have shown more art and judgment nor would all that labour have been spent in vain and wasted so thoughtlessly as has since been evident to those to whom as will be related it has fallen to put it right and finish it 
for in spite of all the pains and thought afterwards devoted to it there are many defects and errors in the door of entrance and in the relation of the niches in the side walls in which it has since been seen to be necessary to change the form of many parts although it has never yet been found possible without demolishing the whole to correct the divergence from the square or to prevent this from being revealed in the pavement and the ceiling it is true that in the manner in which they arranged it even as it now stands there is proof of great craftsmanship and pains and it deserves no little praise for the many stones worked with the bevel square which slant away obliquely by reason of the hall being awry and as for diligence and excellence in the working laying and joining together of the stones nothing better could be seen or done but the whole work would have succeeded much better if bacchio who never held architecture in any account had availed himself of some judgment more able than that of giuliano who although he was a good master in wood and had some knowledge of architecture was yet not the sort of man to be suitable for such a work as that was as experience has proved for this reason the work was pursued over a period of many years without much more than half being built bacchio finished and placed in the smaller niches the statue of signor giovanni and that of duke alessandro both in the principal facade and on a pedestal of bricks in the great niche the statue of pope clement and he also brought to completion the statue of duke cosimo in the last he took no little pains with the head but for all this the duke and the gentlemen of the court said that it did not resemble him in the least wherefore bacchio having already made one of marble which is now in one of the upper apartments in the same palace and which looked very well and was the best head that he ever made defended himself and sought to cover up the defects and worthlessness of the new head with the excellence of the old however hearing that head censured by every one one day in a rage he knocked it off with the intention of making another and fixing it in its place but in the end he never made it at all it was a custom of bacchio's to add pieces of marble both small and large to the statues that he executed feeling no annoyance in doing this and making light of it he did this with one of the heads of Cerberus in the group of Orpheus. In the St. Peter that is in Santa Maria del Fiore, he let in a piece of drapery. In the case of the giant of the piazza, as may be seen, he joined two pieces, a shoulder and a leg, to the casus. And in many other works he did the same, holding to such ways as generally damn a sculptor completely. End of section 9. Bacchio Bandinelli, Sculptor of Florence, Part 4. Section 10 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Bacchio Bandinelli, Sculptor of Florence, Part V. Having finished these statues, he set his hand to the statue of Pope Leo for this work, and carried it well forward. Then, perceiving that the work was proving very long, that he was now never likely to attain to the completion of his original design for the facades right round the palace, that a great sum of money had been spent, and much time consumed, and that for all this the work was not half finished, and gained little approval from the people, he set about thinking of some new fantasy, and began to attempt to remove from the duke's mind the thought of the palace believing that his excellency also was weary of that work thus then having made enemies of the proveditors and of all the stone cutters in the office of works of santa maria del fiore which was under his authority 
while the statues that were destined for the audience chamber were after his fashion some only blocked out and others finished and placed in position and the ornamentation in great part built up wishing to conceal the many defects that were in the work and little by little to abandon it he suggested to the duke that the wardens of works of santa maria del fiore were throwing away his money and no longer doing anything of any importance he said that he had therefore thought that his excellency would do well to divert all that useless expenditure of the office of works into making the octagonal choir of the church and the ornaments of the altar the steps the diocese of the duke and the magistrates and the stalls in the choir for the canons chaplains and clerks according as was proper for so honourable a church of this choir filippo di sor brunellesco had left the model in that simple framework of wood which previously served as the choir in the church intending in time to have it executed in marble in the same form but more ornate Bacchio reflected, besides the considerations mentioned above, that in this choir he would have occasion to make many statues, and scenes in marble, and in bronze for the high altar, and all around the choir, and also for two pulpits of marble that were to be in the choir, and that the base of the outer side of the eight faces might be adorned with many scenes in bronze let into the marble ornamentation above this he thought to place a range of columns and pilasters to support the cornice right round and four arches distributed according to the cross of the church of which arches one was to form the principal entrance opposite to another rising above the high altar and the two others were to be at the sides one on the right hand and another on the left and below these last two were to be placed the pulpits over the cornice was to be a range of balusters curving right round above the eight sides and over the balusters a garland of candelabra in order as it were to crown the choir with lights according to the seasons as had always been the custom while the wooden model of brunelleschi was there pointing out all this to the duke Bacchio said that His Excellency, with the revenues of the Office of Works, namely of Santa Maria del Fiore and of its wardens, and with that which his liberality might add, in a short time could adorn that temple and give great grandeur and magnificence to the same, and consequently to the whole city of which it was the principal temple, and would leave an everlasting and honorable memorial of himself in such a structure and besides all this he said his excellency would be giving him an opportunity of exerting his powers and of making many good and beautiful works and also by displaying his ability of acquiring for himself name and fame with posterity which should be pleasing to his excellency since he was his servant and had been brought up by the house of the medici with these designs and these words bacchio so moved the duke that consenting that such a structure should be erected his excellency commissioned him to make a model of the whole choir departing from the duke then bacchio went to his architect giuliano de bacchio d'agnolo and discussed the whole matter with him and after they had gone to the place and examined everything with diligence, they resolved not to depart from the form of Filippo's model, but to follow it, adding only other ornaments in the shape of columns and projections, and enriching it as much as they could, while preserving the original design and form. But it is not the number of parts and ornaments that renders a fabric rich and beautiful, but their excellence however few they may be provided also that they are set in their proper places and arranged together with due proportion it is these that give pleasure and are admired and having been executed with judgment by the craftsmen afterwards receive praise from all others this giuliano and bacchio do not seem to have considered 
or observed, for they chose a subject involving much labor and endless pains, but wanting in grace, as experience has proved. The design of Giuliano, as may be seen, was to place at the corners of all the eight sides pilasters bent round the angles, the whole work being composed in the Ionic order, and these pilasters, since in the ground plan they were made, with all the rest of the work, to diminish towards the centre of the choir and were not even, necessarily had to be broad on the outer side and narrow on the inner which is a breach of proportionate measurement. And since each pilaster was bent according to the inner angles of the eight sides, the extension lines towards the center so diminished it that the two columns that were one on either side of the pilaster at the corner caused it to appear too slender and produced an ungraceful effect both in it and in the whole work both on the outer side and likewise on the inner, although the measurements there are correct. Giuliano also made the model of the whole altar, which stood at a distance of one braccio and a half from the ornament of the choir. For the upper part of this, Bacchio afterwards made in wax a Christ lying dead with two angels, one of whom was holding his right arm and supporting his head on one knee, and the other was holding the mysteries of the Passion, which statue of Christ occupied almost the whole altar, so that there would scarcely have been room to celebrate Mass and bacchio proposed to make this statue about four braccia and a half in length he made also a projection in the form of a pedestal behind the altar attached to it in the centre with a seat upon which he afterwards placed a seated figure of god the father six braccia high and giving the benediction and accompanied by two other angels each four braccia high, kneeling at the extreme corners of the predella of the altar, on the level on which rested the feet of God the Father. This predella was more than a braccio in height, and on it were many stories of the Passion of Jesus Christ, which were all to be in bronze, and on the corners of the predella were the angels mentioned above, both kneeling and each holding in the hands a candelabrum which candelabra of the angels served to accompany eight large candelabra placed between the angels and three braccia and a half in height which adorned that altar and god the father was in the midst of them all behind god the father was left a space of half a braccio in order that there might be room to ascend to kindle the lights under the arch that stood opposite to the principal entrance of the choir, on the base that ran right round on the outer side, Bacchio had placed, directly under the centre of that arch, the tree of the fall, round the trunk of which was wound the ancient serpent with a human face, and two nude figures were about the tree, one being Adam and the other Eve. On the outer side of the choir, to which those figures had their faces turned, there ran lengthways along the base a space about three braccia long, which was to contain the story of their creation, either in marble or in bronze, and this was to be pursued along the faces of the base of the whole work, to the number of twenty-one stories, all from the Old Testament and for the further enrichment of this base he had made for each of the succles upon which stood the columns and pilasters a figure of some prophet either draped or nude to be afterwards executed in marble a great work truly and a marvellous opportunity likely to reveal all the art and genius of a perfect master whose memory should never be extinguished by any lapse of time this model was shown to the duke, and also a double series of designs made by Bacchio, which, both from their variety and their number, and likewise from their beauty, for the reason that Bacchio worked boldly in wax and drew very well, pleased his excellency, and he ordained that the masonry work should be straightway taken in hand, 
devoting to it all the expenditure administered by the office of works and giving orders that a great quantity of marble should be brought from carrara bacchio on his part also set to work to make a beginning with the statues and among the first was an adam who was raising one arm and was about four braccia in height this figure was finished by bacchio but since it proved to be narrow in the flanks and somewhat defective in other parts he changed it into a bacchus and afterwards gave it to the duke who kept it in his palace many years in his chamber and not long ago it was placed in a niche in the ground-floor apartments which his excellency occupies in summer he had also made a seated figure of Eve of the same size, which he had half finished, but it was abandoned on account of the Adam, which it was to have accompanied. For having made a beginning with another Adam, in a different form and attitude, it became necessary for him to change also the Eve, and the original seated figure was converted by him into a Ceres, which he gave to the most illustrious Duchess Leonora, together with an Apollo, which was another nude that he had executed and her excellency had them placed in the ornament in front of the fish-pond the design and architecture of which are by giorgio vasari in the gardens of the pitti palace bacchio worked at these two figures with very great zeal thinking to satisfy the craftsman and all the world as well as he had satisfied himself and he finished and polished them with all the diligence and lovingness that were in him he then set up these figures of Adam and Eve in their place, but when uncovered they experienced the same fate as his other works, and were torn to pieces with savage bitterness in sonnets and Latin verses, one going to the length of suggesting that even as Adam and Eve, having defiled paradise by their disobedience, deserved to be driven out, so these figures, defiling the earth, deserved to be expelled from the church nevertheless the statues are well proportioned and beautiful in many parts and although there is not in them that grace which has been spoken of in other places and which he was not able to give to his works yet they display so much art and design that they deserve no little praise a lady who had set herself to examine these statues being asked by some gentleman what she thought of these naked bodies answered about the man i can give no judgment and being pressed to give her opinion of the woman she replied that in the eve there were two good points worthy of considerable praise in that she was white and firm whereby she contrived ingeniously while seeming to praise covertly to deal a shrewd blow to the craftsman and his art giving to the statue the praise proper to the female body which it is also necessary to apply to the marble the material and which is true of it but not of the work or of the craftsmanship for by such praise the craftsmanship is not praised Thus, then, that shrewd lady hinted that in her opinion nothing could be praised in that statue save the marble. Bacchio afterwards set his hand to the statue of the dead Christ, which likewise not succeeding as he had expected, he abandoned it when it was already well advanced, and taking another block of marble, began another Christ in an attitude different from the first, and together with that, the angel who supports the head of christ on one leg and with one hand his arm and he did not rest until he had finished entirely both the one figure and the other when arrangements were made to set it up on the altar it proved to be so large that it occupied too much space and there was no room left for the ministrations of the priest and although this statue was passing good and even one of bacchio's best nevertheless the people the ordinary citizens no less than the priests could never have their fill of speaking ill of it and picking it to pieces 
recognizing that to uncover unfinished works injures the reputation of a craftsman in the eyes of all those who are not of the profession, or have no knowledge of art, or have not seen the models, Bacchio resolved, in order to accompany the statue of Christ and to complete the altar, to make the statue of God the Father, for which a very beautiful block of marble had come from Carrara and he had already carried it well forward, making it half nude after the manner of a jove, when, since it did not please the duke, and appeared to Bacchio himself to have certain defects, he left it as it was, and even so it is still to be found in the office of works. Bacchio cared nothing for the words of others, but gave his attention to making himself rich and buying property. He bought a most beautiful farm called Lo Spinello, on the heights of Fiesole, and another with a very beautiful house called Il Canton, in the plain above San Salvi, on the river Africo, and a great house in the Via di Ginori, which he was enabled to acquire by the monies and favors of the duke. Having thus secured his own position, Bacchio thenceforward cared little to work or to exert himself, and although the tomb of Signor Giovanni was unfinished, the audience chamber of the great hall only begun, and the choir and altar behindhand, he paid little attention to the words of others or to the censure that was laid upon him on that account. However, having erected the altar, and set into position the marble base upon which was to stand the statue of God the Father, he made a model for this, and finally began it, and, employing stone cutters, proceeded to carry it slowly forward. There came from France in those days Benvenuto Cellini, who had served King Francis in the matter of goldsmith's work, of which he was the most famous master of his day, and he had also executed some castings in bronze for that king. Benvenuto was introduced to Duke Cosimo, who, desiring to adorn the city, showed also to him much favor and affection, and commissioned him to make a statue of bronze, about five brachia high, of a nude Perseus standing over a nude woman representing Medusa, whose head he had cut off, which work was to be placed under one of the arches of the loggia in the piazza. While he was executing the Perseus, Benvenuto also did other things for the duke. Now, even as it happens that the potter is always the jealous enemy of the potter, and the sculptor of the sculptor, Bacchio was not able to endure the various favors shown to Benvenuto. It appeared to him a strange thing also that Benvenuto should have thus changed in a moment from a goldsmith into a sculptor nor was he able to grasp in his mind how a man who was used to making medals and little things could now execute colossal figures and giants. Bacchio could not conceal his thoughts, but express them freely, and he found a man able to answer him, for Bacchio saying many of his biting words to Benvenuto in the presence of the duke, Benvenuto, who was no less proud than himself, took pains to be even with him. And thus, arguing often on the matters of art and their own works, and pointing out each other's defects, they would utter the most slanderous words of one another in the presence of the duke, who, because he took pleasure in this, and recognized true genius and acuteness in their biting phrases, had given them full liberty and license to say whatever they pleased about one another before him, provided that they did not remember their quarrel elsewhere. This rivalry, or rather enmity, was the reason that Bacchio pressed forward his statue of God the Father, but he was no longer receiving from the duke those favors to which he had been accustomed, and he consoled himself for this by paying court and doing service to the duchess. One day, among others, that they were railing at one another as usual, and laying bare many of each other's actions, Benvenuto, glaring at Bacchio and threatening him, said, 
Prepare yourself for another world, Bacchio, for I mean to send you out of this one. And Bacchio answered, Let me know a day beforehand, so that I may confess and make my will, and may not die like the sort of beast that you are by reason of which the duke, who, for many months, had found amusement in their quarrels, bade them be silent, fearing some evil ending, and caused them to make a portrait bust of himself from the girdle upwards, both to be cast in bronze, to the end that he who should succeed best should carry off the honours. Amid this rivalry and contention, Bacchio finished his figure of God the Father, which he arranged to have placed in the church on the base beside the altar. This figure was clothed and six braccia high, and he erected and completely finished it. But in order not to leave it unaccompanied, he summoned from Rome the sculptor Vincenzo de Rossi, his pupil, wishing to execute in clay for the altar all that remained to be done in marble, and he caused Vincenzo to assist him in finishing the two angels who are holding the candelabra at the corners, and the greater part of the scenes on the predella and the base. Having then set everything upon the altar, in order to see how his work, when finished, was to stand, he strove to prevail on the duke to come and see it before he should uncover it. But the duke would never go, and although entreated by the duchess, who favoured Bacchio in this matter, he would never let himself be shaken, and did not go to see it, being angered because among so many works Bacchio had never finished one, even after his excellency had made him rich, and had won odium among the citizens, by honouring him highly and doing him many favours. For all this, His Excellency was disposed to assist Clemente, the natural son of Bacchio, a young man of ability, who had made considerable proficience in design, because it was likely to fall to him in time to finish his father's works. End of section 10. Bacchio Bandinelli, Sculptor of Florence, Part 5. Section 11 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston de C. De Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Bacchio Bandinelli, Sculptor of Florence, Part 6. At this same time, which was in the year 1554, there came from Rome, where he had been working for Pope Julius the Third, Giorgio Vasari of Arezzo, in order to serve His Excellency in many works that he was intending to execute, and in particular to decorate the palace on the piazza, and to renovate it with new constructions, and to finish the great hall as he was afterwards seen to do. In the following year, Giorgio Vasari summoned from Rome and engaged in the Duke's service the sculptor Bartolomeo Amanati, to the end that he might execute the other façade in the above-named hall, opposite to the audience chamber begun by Bacchio, and a fountain in the centre of that façade, and a beginning was straightway made with executing a part of the statues that were to go into that work. Bacchio, perceiving that the duke was employing others, recognized that he did not wish to use his services any longer, at which, feeling great displeasure and vexation, he had become so strange and so irritable that no one could have any dealings with him, either in his house or out of it and to his son Clemente he behaved very strangely, keeping him in want of everything. For this reason Clemente, who had made a large head of his excellency in clay, in order to execute it in marble for the statue of the audience chamber, sought leave of the duke to depart and go to Rome on account of his father's strangeness, and the duke said that he would not fail him. Bacchio, at the departure of Clemente, who had asked leave of him, would not give him anything, 
although the young man had been a great help to him in Florence, and, indeed, Bacchio's right hand in every matter. Nevertheless, he thought nothing of getting rid of him. The young man, having arrived in Rome at an unfavorable season, died in the same year both from overstudy and from wild living, leaving in Florence an example of his handiwork in an almost finished head of Duke Cosimo in marble, which is very beautiful, and was afterwards placed by Bacchio over the principal door of his house in the Via de Genori. Clemente also left well advanced a dead Christ, who is supported by Nicodemus, which Nicodemus is a portrait from life of Bacchio. And these statues, which are passing good, Bacchio set up in the church of the Servites, as we shall relate in the proper place. The death of Clemente was a very great loss to Bacchio and to art, and Bandinelli recognized this after he was dead. Bacchio uncovered the altar of Santa Maria del Fiore, and the statue of God the Father was criticized. The altar has remained as was described above, nor has anything more been done to it since, but the work of the choir has been continued. Many years before, there had been quarried at Carrara a great block of marble, ten braccia and a half in height, and five braccia in width, of which, having received notice, Bacchio rode to Carrara and made a contract for it with him to whom it belonged, giving him fifty crowns as earnest money. He then returned to Florence, and so pestered the duke that, by the favor of the duchess, he obtained the commission to make from it a giant, which was to be placed in the piazza, at the corner where the lion was, on which spot was to be made a great fountain to spout water, in the middle of which was to be a Neptune in his chariot, drawn by sea-horses, and this figure was to be carved out of the above-mentioned block of marble. For this figure, Bacchio made more than one model, and showed them to his excellency. But the matter stood thus, without anything more being done, until the year 1559, at which time the owner of the marble, having come from Carrara, asked to be paid the rest of the money, saying that otherwise he would give back the fifty crowns and break it into several pieces in order to sell it, since he had received many offers. Orders were given by the duke to Giorgio Vasari that he should have the marble paid for, which, having been heard throughout the world of art, and also that the duke had not yet made a free gift of the marble to Bacchio, Benvenuto, and likewise Amanati, bestirring themselves, each besought the duke that he should be allowed to make a model in competition with Bacchio and that his excellency should deign to give the marble to him who had shown the greatest ability in his model the duke did not deny to either of them the right to make a model or deprive them of the hope that he who should acquit himself the best might be chosen to execute the statue his Excellency knew that in ability, judgment, and design, Bacchio was still better than any of the sculptors who were in his service, if only he would consent to take pains, and he welcomed this competition in order to incite Bacchio to acquit himself better and to do the most that he could. Bandinelli, having seen this competition on his shoulders, was greatly troubled by it, fearing the loss of the duke's favor more than any other thing, and once more he set himself to making models. He was most assiduous in waiting on the duchess, and so wrought upon her that he obtained leave to go to Carrara in order to make arrangements for having the marble brought to Florence. Having arrived in Carrara, he had the marble so reduced in size, as he had planned to do, that he made it a sorry thing, and robbed both himself and the others of a noble opportunity, and of the hope of ever making from it a beautiful and magnificent work. 
On returning to Florence there was a long contention between Benvenuto and him, Benvenuto saying to the duke that Bacchio had spoilt the marble before it had been assigned to him. Finally the duchess so went to work that the marble became Bacchio's, and orders were given that it should be taken from Carrara to the seashore and a boat was made ready with the proper appliances, which was to convey it up the Arno as far as Signa. Bacchio also caused a room to be built up in the loggia of the piazza, wherein to work at the marble. In the meantime he had set his hand to executing cartoons, in order to have some pictures painted which were to adorn the apartments of the Pitti Palace. These pictures were painted by a young man called Andrea Dalminga, who handled color passing well. The stories painted in the pictures were the creation of Adam and Eve, and their expulsion from paradise by the angel, a Noah, and a Moses with the tables, which finished, he then presented them to the Duchess, seeking to obtain her favor in his difficulties and contentions. And, in truth, if it had not been for that lady, who loved him for his abilities and held him on his feet, Bacchio would have fallen headlong down and would have lost completely the favor of the duke. The duchess also made much use of Bacchio in the Pitti Garden, where she had caused to be constructed a grotto full of tufa and sponge stone formed by the action of water and containing a fountain and for this Bacchio had caused his pupil, Giovanni Fancelli, to execute in marble a large basin and some goats of the size of life, which spout forth water, and likewise for a fish-pond, after a model made by himself, a countryman who is emptying a barrel full of water. For these reasons the Duchess was constantly helping and favoring Bacchio with the Duke, who finally gave him leave to begin the great model of the Neptune, on which account he once more sent to Rome for Vincenzo de Rossi, who had previously departed from Florence with the intention of making him help to execute it. While these preparations were in progress, Bacchio was seized with a desire to finish the statue of the dead Christ, supported by Nicodemus, which his son Clemente had carried well forward. For he had heard that Buonarti was finishing one in Rome, that he had begun to carve from a large block of marble, containing five figures, which was to be placed on his tomb in Santa Maria Maggiore. Out of emulation with him, Bacchio set to work on his group, with the greatest assiduity with assistance, until he had finished it. And meanwhile he was going about among the principal churches of Florence, seeking for a place where he might set up that work, and also make a tomb for himself. But for long he found no place for the tomb that could content him, until he resolved on a chapel in the church of the Servites, which belongs to the family of the Pazzi. The owners of this chapel, at the request of the Duchess, granted the place to Bacchio, without divesting themselves of the rights of ownership, and of the devices of their house that were there and they granted him only this, that he should erect an altar of marble, and place upon it the statues mentioned above, and make his tomb at the foot of it. Afterwards, also, he came to an agreement with the friars of that convent, with regard to the other matters appertaining to the celebration of Mass. During this time, then, Bacchio was causing the altar and the marble base to be built, in order to place upon it the above-named statues, and when he had finished it, he proposed to lay in that tomb, in which he wished to be laid himself together with his wife, the bones of his father Michelagnolo, which at his death he had caused to be placed in a vault in the same church. These bones of his father he chose to lay piously in that tomb with his own hands. 
whereupon it happened that either because he felt sorrow and a shock to his mind in handling his father's bones or because he exerted himself too much in transferring those bones with his own hands and in rearranging the marbles or from both reasons together he was so overcome that he felt ill and had to go home and his malady growing daily worse in eight days he died at the age of seventy-two having been up to that time robust and vigorous and without having ever suffered much illness during the whole of his life he was buried with honourable obsequies and laid beside his father's bones in the above-mentioned tomb constructed by himself on which is this epitaph deo optimo maximo bacius bandanel divi jacobi equis sub hac servatoris imagini asse expressa cum jacoba donia uxori quiescit annum fifteen fifty nine he left behind him both sons and daughters who were the heirs to his many possessions in lands houses and money which he bequeathed to them and to the world he left the works in sculpture described by us and designs in great numbers which are in the possession of his family and in our book there are some executed with the pen and with chalk than which it is certain that nothing better could be done the marble for the giant was left more in dispute than ever, because Benvenuto was always about the duke, and wished, in virtue of a little model that he had made, that the duke should give it to him. On the other hand, Amanati, being a sculptor of marbles, and more experienced in such works than Benvenuto, considered for many reasons that this work belonged to him. Now it happened that Giorgio Vasari had to go to Rome with the cardinal, the son of the duke, when he went to receive his hat, and Amanati gave to Vasari a little model of wax, showing the shape in which he desired to carve that figure from the marble, and a piece of wood reproducing the exact proportions, the length, breadth, thickness, and inclination from the straight of the marble to the end that giorgio might show them in rome to michelagnolo buonarti and persuade him to declare his opinion in the matter and so move the duke to give him the marble all this giorgio did most willingly and it was the reason that the duke gave orders that an arch should be partitioned off in the loggia of the piazza and that amanati should make a great model as large as the giant was to be having heard this benvenuto rode in a great fury to pisa where the duke was and said to him that he could not suffer that his genius should be trampled under foot by one who was inferior to himself and that he desired to make a great model in competition with amanati in the same place and the duke wishing to pacify him granted him leave to have another arch of the loggia partitioned off and caused to be given to him materials for making as he desired a large model in competition with amanati while these masters were engaged in making their models after having made fast their enclosures in such a manner that neither the one nor the other could see what his rival was doing although these enclosures were attached to each other there rose up the flemish sculptor maestro giovan bologna a young man not inferior in ability or in spirit to either of the others this master being in the service of the lord don francesco prince of florence asked his excellency to enable him to make a giant which might serve as a model of the same size as the marble and the prince granted him this favour maestro giovan bologna had as yet no thought of having the giant to execute in marble but he wished at least to display his ability and to make himself known for what he was worth and having received permission from the prince he also began a model in the convent of san croce nor was vincenzo dante the sculptor of perugia a younger man than any of the others willing to fail to compete with these three masters 
not in the hope of obtaining the marble, but in order to demonstrate his spirit and genius. And so, having set to work on his own account in the house of Messer Alessandro, the son of Monsignor Ottaviano de Medici, he executed a model good in many parts and as large as the others. The models finished, the duke went to see those of Amanati and of Benvenuto, and being more pleased with that of Amanati than with that of Benvenuto, he resolved that Amanati should have the marble and make the giant, because he was younger than Benvenuto and more practised in marble. The disposition of the duke was strengthened by Giorgio Vasari, who did many good offices with his excellency for Amanati, having perceived that, in addition to his knowledge, he was ready to endure any labor, and hoping that from his hands there would issue an excellent work, finished in a short time. The duke would not at that time see the model of Maestro Giovanni Bologna, because, not having seen any work by him in marble, it did not seem to him that he could entrust to that master, as his first work, so great an undertaking, although he heard from many craftsmen and other men of judgment that Giovanni Bologna's model was in many parts better than the other's but if Bacchio had been alive, there would not have been all that contention among those masters, because without a doubt it would have fallen to him to make the model of clay and the giant of marble. This work, then, was snatched from Bacchio by death, but the same circumstance brought him no little glory, in that it revealed by means of those four models, the reason of the making of which was that Bacchio was not alive, how much better were the design, judgment, and ability of him who placed on the piazza the Hercules and Cassus, as it were, living in the marble, the excellence of which work has been made evident and brought to light even more by the works that have been executed since Bacchio's death by those others, who, although they have acquitted themselves in a manner worthy of praise, have yet not been able to attain to the beauty and excellence that he placed in his work. Afterwards, Duke Cosimo, for the marriage of Queen Joanna of Austria, his daughter-in-law, seven years after the death of Bacchio, caused the audience chamber in the great hall, begun by Bacchio, of which we have spoken above, to be finished and he chose that the head of this work of completion should be Giorgio Vasari, who has sought with all diligence to put right the many defects that would have been in it, if it had been continued and finished after the original design followed in the beginning by Bacchio. Thus that imperfect work has now been carried with the help of God to completion and is enriched on its side faces by the addition of niches and pilasters and statues set in their places. Moreover, since it was laid out of awry and out of square, we have taken pains to make it even in so far as has been possible, and have raised it considerably with a corridor of Tuscan columns at the top, and as for the statue of Leo begun by Bacchio, his pupil Vincenzo di Rossi has finished it. Besides this, that work has been adorned with friezes full of stucco work, with many figures large and small, and with devices and other ornaments of various kinds and under the niches and in the partitions of the vaulting have been made many and various designs in stucco and many beautiful inventions in carving, all which things have enriched the work in such a manner that it has changed its form and has gained not a little in beauty and grace. For whereas, according to the first design, the ceiling of the hall being twenty-one brachia above the floor, the audience chamber did not rise higher than eighteen brachia, so that between it and the old ceiling there was a space of only three brachia. Now, after our design, the ceiling of the hall has been raised so much that it has risen twelve brachia above the old ceiling and fifteen above the audience chamber of Bacchio and Giuliano, 
so that the ceiling is now thirty-three brachia above the floor of the hall and it certainly showed great spirit in his excellency that he should resolve to cause to be finished in the space of five months for the above-named nuptials the whole of a work of which more than a third still remained to do although it had taken more than fifteen years to arrive at the condition in which it was at that time so eager was he to carry it to completion but it was not only Bacchio's work that His Excellency caused to be completely finished, but also all the rest of what Giorgio Vasari had designed, beginning again from the base that runs over the whole of that work, with a border of balusters in the open spaces, which forms a corridor that passes above the work in the hall, and commands a view on the outer side of the piazza and on the inner side of the whole hall. Thus the princes and other lords will be able to see, without being seen, all the festivals that may be held there, with much pleasure and convenience for themselves, and then to retire to their apartments, passing by the private and public staircases through all the rooms in the palace. Nevertheless, to many it has caused dissatisfaction that, in a work of such beauty and grandeur, that structure was not made square, and many would have liked to have it pulled down and then rebuilt true to square. But it has been judged to be better to continue the work in that way, in order not to appear presumptuous and malign towards Bacchio and also because otherwise we would have seemed not to have the power to correct the errors and defects found by us but committed by others but returning to bacchio we must say that his abilities were always recognized during his lifetime yet will be recognized and regretted much more now that he is dead and even more would he have been acknowledged for what he was when alive and beloved if he had been so favoured by nature as to be more amiable and more courteous because his being the contrary and very rough with his tongue robbed him of the good will of other persons obscured his talents and brought it about that his works were regarded with ill will and a prejudiced eye and therefore could never please any one and although he served one nobleman after another and was enabled by his talent to serve them well nevertheless he rendered his services with such bad grace that there was no one who felt grateful to him for them moreover his always decrying and maligning the works of others brought it about that no one could endure him and whenever another was able to pay him back in his own coin it was returned to him with interest, and before the magistrates he spoke all manner of evil without scruple about the other citizens, and received from them as good as he gave. He brought suits and went to law about everything with the greatest readiness, living in one long succession of lawsuits, and appearing to triumph in them but since his drawing, to which it is evident that he gave his attention more than to any other thing, was of such a kind and of such excellence that it atones for his every natural defect, and makes him known as a rare master of our art. We therefore not only count him among the greatest craftsmen, but also have always paid respect to his works, and have sought not to destroy, but to finish them and do them honour, for the reason that it appears to us that Bacchia was in truth one of those who deserve honourable praise and everlasting fame. We have deferred to the end the mention of his family name, because it was not always the same, but varied, Bacchio having himself called now Di Brandini and now Di Bandinelli. In his early prints the name Di Brandini may be seen engraved after that of Bacchio, but afterwards he preferred the name di bandinelli which he retained to the end and still retains and he used to say that his ancestors were of the bandinelli of siena who once removed to guayol and from guayol to florence end of section eleven bacchio bandinelli sculptor of florence
Part Six. Section Twelve of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume Seven, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Section Twelve. Life of Giuliano Bugiardini, Painter of Florence. Before the siege of Florence, the population had multiplied in such great numbers that the widespread suburbs which lay without every gate, together with the churches, monasteries, and hospitals, formed, as it were, another city, inhabited by many honorable persons, and by good craftsmen of every kind, although for the most part they were less wealthy than those of the city, and lived there with less expense in the way of customs dues and the like. In one of these suburbs, then, without the Porta a Faenza, was born Giuliano Bugiardini, who lived there, even as his ancestors had done, until the year 1529, when all the suburbs were pulled down. But before that, when still a mere lad, he began his studies in the garden of the Medici on the Piazza di San Marco, in which, attending to the study of art under the sculptor Bertoldo, he formed such straight friendship and intimacy with Michelagnolo Buonarti that he was much beloved by Buonarti ever afterwards, which Michelagnolo did not so much because of any depth that he saw in Giuliano's manner of drawing as on account of the extraordinary diligence and love that he showed towards art. There was in Giuliano, besides this, a certain natural goodness and a sort of simplicity in his mode of living, free from all envy and malice, which vastly pleased Buonarti. Nor was there any notable defect in him save this, that he loved too well the works of his own hand. For although all men are wont to err in this respect, Giuliano, in truth, passed all due bounds, whatever may have been the reason, either the great pains and diligence that he put into executing them, or some other cause. Wherefore, Michelagnolo used to call him blessed, since he appeared to be content with what he knew, and himself unhappy, in that no work of his ever fully satisfied him. After Giuliano had studied design for some time in the above-named garden, he worked, together with Buonarti and Granacci, under Domenico Ghirlandajo, at the time when he was painting the chapel in Santa Maria Novella. Then, having made his growth, and becoming a passing good master, he betook himself to work in company with Mariotto Albertinelli in Guelfanda in which place he finished a panel picture that is now at the door of entrance of Santa Maria Maggiore in Florence, containing Sant'Alberto, a Carmelite friar, who has under his feet the devil in the form of a woman, a work that was much extolled. It was the custom in Florence before the siege of 1530, at the burial of dead persons of good family and noble blood, to carry in front of the bier a string of pennons fixed round a panel that a porter bore on his head, which pennons were afterwards left in the church in memory of the deceased and of his family. Now, when the elder Cosimo Rucellai died, Bernardo and Pala, his sons, in order to have something new, thought of not having pennons, but, in place of them, a quadrangular banner, four brachia wide and five brachia high, with some pennons at the foot, containing the arms of the rucellai. These men, therefore, giving this work to Giuliano to execute, he painted on the body of the said banner four great figures, executed very well, namely San Cosimo, San Damiano, St. Peter, and St. Paul, which were truly most beautiful paintings, and done with more diligence than had ever been shown in any other work on cloth. 
these and other works of giuliano's having been seen by mariato albertinelli he recognized how careful giuliano was in following the designs that were put before him without departing from them by a hair's breadth and since he was preparing in those days to abandon art he gave him to finish a panel picture that fra bartolomeo de san marco his friend and companion had formerly left only designed and shaded with water-colours on the gesso of the panel as was his custom giuliano then setting his hand to this work executed it with supreme diligence and labour and it was placed at that time in the church of san gallo without the gate of that name the church and convent were afterwards pulled down on account of the siege and the picture was carried into the city and placed in the priest's hospital in the via de san gallo and then from there into the convent of san marco and finally into san jacopo trafossi on the canto degli alberti where it stands at the present day on the high altar in this picture is the dead christ with the magdalene who is embracing his feet and saint john the evangelist who is holding his head and supporting it on one knee there likewise are saint peter who is weeping and saint paul who stretching out his arms is contemplating his dead master and to tell the truth giuliano executed this picture with so much lovingness and so much consideration and judgment that he will be always very highly extolled for it even as he was at that time and that rightly and after this he finished for cristofano rinieri a picture with the rape of dina that had been likewise left incomplete by the same fra bartolomeo and he painted another picture like it which was sent to france not long afterwards having been drawn to bologna by certain friends he executed some portraits from life and for a chapel in the new choir of san francesco an altarpiece in oils containing our lady and two saints which was held at that time in bologna from there not being many masters there to be a good work and worthy of praise then having returned to florence he painted for i know not what person five pictures of the life of our lady which are now in the house of maestro andrea pasquale physician to his excellency and a man of great distinction messer pala rucalai having commissioned him to execute an altar-piece that was to be placed on his altar in santa maria novella giuliano began to paint in it the martyrdom of saint catherine the virgin mountains in labour he had it in hand for twelve years but never carried it to completion after all that time because he had no invention and knew not how to paint the many various things that had a part in that martyrdom and although he was always racking his brain as to how those wheels should be made and how he should paint the lightning and the fire that consumed them constantly changing one day what he had done the day before in all that time he was never able to finish it it is true that in the meantime he executed many works and among others for messer francesco gucciardini who had returned from bologna and was then living in his villa at montici writing his history a portrait of him which was a passing good likeness and pleased him much he took the portrait likewise of signora angela de rossi the sister of the count of san secondo for signor alessandro vitelli her husband who was then on garrison duty in florence for messer ottaviano de medici he painted in a large picture copied from one by fra sebastiano del piombo two full-length portraits pope clement seated and fra niccolo della magna standing and in another picture likewise with incredible pains and patience he portrayed pope clement seated and before him bartolomeo valori who is kneeling and speaking to him next 
the above-named messer ottaviano de medici having besought giuliano privately that he should take for him the portrait of michelagnolo buonarti he set his hand to it and after he had kept michelagnolo who used to take pleasure in his conversation sitting for two hours giuliano said to him michelagnolo if you wish to see yourself get up and look for i have now fixed the expression of the face michelagnolo having risen and looked at the portrait said to giuliano laughing what the devil have you been doing you have painted me with one of my eyes up in the temple give a little thought to what you are doing hearing this giuliano after standing pensive for a while and looking many times from the portrait to the living model answered in serious earnest to me it does not seem so but sit you down again and i shall see a little better from the life whether it be true buonarti who knew whence the defect arose and how small was the judgment of bugiardini straightway resumed his seat grinning and giuliano looked many times now at michelagnolo and now at the picture and then finally rising to his feet declared to me it seems that the thing is just as i have drawn it and that the life is in no way different well then answered buonarti it is a natural deformity go on and spare neither brush nor art and so giuliano finished the picture and gave it to messer ottaviano together with the portrait of pope clement by the hand of fra sebastiano as buonarti desired who had sent to rome for it giuliano afterwards made for cardinal innocenzio sibo a copy of the picture in which raffaello d'arbino had formerly painted portraits of pope leo cardinal giulio de medici and cardinal de rossi but in place of cardinal de rossi he painted the head of cardinal sibo in which he acquitted himself very well and he executed the whole picture with great diligence and labour at that time likewise he took the portrait of sencio guasconi who was then a very beautiful youth and after this he painted at the villa of bacchio valori at olmo e castello a tabernacle in fresco which although it had not much design was well and very carefully executed meanwhile palla rucellai was pressing him to finish his altarpiece of which mention has been made above and giuliano resolved to take michelagnolo one day to see it and so after he had brought him to the place where he kept it and had described to him with what pains he had executed the lightning flash which coming down from heaven shivers the wheels and kills those who are turning them and also a sun which bursting from a cloud delivers saint catherine from death he frankly besought michelagnolo who could not keep from laughing as he heard poor bugiardini's lamentations that he should tell him how to make eight or ten principal figures of soldiers in the foreground of this altarpiece drawn up in line after the manner of a guard and in the act of flight some being prostrate some wounded and others dead for said giuliano he did not know for himself how to foreshorten them in such a manner that there might be room for them all in so narrow a space in the fashion that he had imagined in line buonarti then having compassion on the poor man and wishing to oblige him went up to the picture with a piece of charcoal and outlined with a few strokes lightly sketched in a line of marvellous nude figures which foreshortened in different attitudes were falling in various ways some backward and others forward with some wounded or dead and all executed with that judgment and excellence that were peculiar to michelagnolo this done he went away with the thanks of giuliano who not long afterwards took tribolo his dearest friend to see what buonarti had done telling him the whole story but since as has been related buonarti had drawn his figures only in outline bugardini was not able to put them into execution because there were neither shadows in them 
nor any other help whereupon tribolo resolved to assist him and thus made some sketch models in clay which he executed excellently well giving them that boldness of manner that michelagnolo had put into the drawing and working them over with the gradin which is a toothed instrument of iron to the end that they might be somewhat rough and might have greater force and thus finished he gave them to giuliano however since that manner did not please the smooth fancy of bugiardini no sooner had tribolo departed than he took a brush and dipping it from time to time in water so smoothed them that he took away the gradine marks and polished them all over insomuch that whereas the lights should have served as contrast to make the shadows stronger he contrived to destroy all the excellence that made the work perfect which having afterwards heard from giuliano himself tribolo laughed at the foolish simplicity of the man and giuliano finally delivered the work finished in such a manner that there is nothing in it to show that michelagnolo ever looked at it in the end being old and poor and having very few works to do giuliano applied himself with extraordinary and even incredible pains to make a pieta in a tabernacle that was to go to spain with figures of no great size and executed it with such diligence that it seems a strange thing to think of an old man of his age having the patience to do such a work for the love that he bore to art on the doors of that tabernacle in order to depict the darkness that fell at the death of the saviour he painted a knight on a black ground copied from the one by the hand of michelagnolo which is in the sacristy of san lorenzo but since that statue has no other sign than an owl giuliano amusing himself over his picture of night by giving rein to his fancy painted there a net for catching thrushes by night with the lantern and one of those little vessels holding a candle or rather a candle end that are carried about at night with other such-like things that have something to do with darkness and gloom such as nightcaps quaffs pillows and bats wherefore buonarti was like to dislocate his jaw with laughing when he saw this work and considered with what strange caprices bugiardini had enriched his night finally after having always been that kind of man giuliano died at the age of seventy-five and was buried in the church of san marco at florence in the year fifteen fifty six giuliano once relating to bronzino how he had seen a very beautiful woman after he had praised her to the skies bronzino said do you know her no answered giuliano but she is a miracle of beauty just imagine that she is a picture by my hand and there you have her end of section twelve Section 13 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Life of Cristofano Gerardi, called Docino, of Borgo San Sepulcro, Painter, Part 1 while raffaello dal colle of borgo san sepulcro who was a disciple of giulio romano and helped him to paint in fresco the hall of constantine in the papal palace at rome and the apartments of the te in mantua was painting after his return to the borgo the altarpiece of the chapel of saints giulio e arcanio in which imitating giulio and raffaello da urbino he depicted the resurrection of christ a work that was much extolled with another altarpiece of the assumption for the frati de zacoli without the borgo and some other works for the servite friars at citta di castello 
while i say raffaello was executing these and other works in the borgo his native place acquiring riches and fame a young man sixteen years of age called cristofano and by way of by name docino the son of guido gerardi a man of honourable family in that city was attending from a natural inclination and with much profit to painting drawing and colouring so well and with such grace that it was a marvel wherefore the above-named raffaello having seen some animals by the hand of this cristofano such as dogs wolves hares and various kinds of birds and fishes executed very well and perceiving that he was most agreeable in his conversation and very witty and amusing although he lived a life apart almost like a philosopher was well pleased to form a friendship with him and to have him frequent his workshop in order to learn now after cristofano had spent some time drawing under the discipline of raffaello there arrived in the borgo the painter rosso with whom he contracted a friendship and received some of his drawings and these docino studied with great diligence considering as one who had seen no others but those by the hand of raffaello that they were very beautiful as indeed they were but these studies were broken off by him for when giovanni di torini of the borgo at that time captain of the florentines went with a band of soldiers from the borgo and from citta di castello to the defence of florence which was besieged by the armies of the emperor and of pope clement cristofano went thither among the other soldiers having been led away by his many friends it is true that he did this no less in the hope of having some occasion to study the works in florence than with the intention of fighting but in this he failed for his captain giovanni had to guard not a place within the city but the bastions on the hill without that war finished and the guard of florence being commanded not long afterwards by signor alessandro vitelli of citta di castello cristofano drawn by his friends and by his desire to see the pictures and sculptures of the city enlisted as a soldier in that guard and while he was in that service signor alessandro having heard from battista della bilia a painter and soldier from citta di castello that cristofano gave his attention to painting and having obtained a beautiful picture by his hand determined to send him with that same battista della bilia and with another battista likewise of citta di castello to decorate with scraffiti and paintings a garden and loggia that he had begun at citta di castello but the one Battista having died while that garden was being built up, and the other Battista having taken his place, for the time being, whatever may have been the reason, nothing more was done. Meanwhile, Giorgio Vasari had returned from Rome, and was passing his time with Duke Alessandro in Florence, until his patron, Cardinal Ippolito, should return from Hungary and he had received rooms in the convent of the servites that he might make a beginning with the execution of certain scenes in fresco from the life of caesar in the chamber at the corner of the medici palace where giovanni da udini had decorated the ceiling with stucco work and pictures now cristofano having made giorgio's acquaintance at the borgo in the year fifteen twenty eight when he went to see rosso in that place where he had shown him much kindness resolved that he would attach himself to vasari and thus find much more opportunity for giving attention to art than he had done in the past giorgio then after a year's intercourse with him as his companion finding that he was likely to make an able master and that he was pleasant and gentle in manners and a man after his own heart conceived an extraordinary affection for him wherefore having to go not long afterwards at the commission of duke alessandro to citta di castello in company with antonio de sangallo and pier francesco da viterbo 
who had been in Florence to build the castle, or rather citadel, and on their return were taking the road by Citta di Castello, in order to repair the walls of the above-mentioned garden of Vitelli, which were threatening to fall, he took Cristofano with him, to the end that after Vasari himself had designed and distributed in their due order the friezes which were to be executed in certain apartments, and likewise the scenes and compartments of a bathroom, and other sketches for the walls of the loggia, Girardi and the above-named Battista might carry the whole to completion. All this they did so well, and with such grace, and particularly Cristofano, that a past master in art, well practised in his work, could not have done so much, and, what is more, experimenting in that work, he became facile and able, to a marvel in drawing and colouring. Then, in the year 1536, the Emperor Charles V, coming to Italy and to Florence, as has been related in other places, the most magnificent festive preparations were ordained, among which Vasari, by orders of Duke Alessandro, received the charge of the decorations of the Porta a San Piero Gattolini, of the façade at San Felice in Piazza, at the head of the Via Maggio, and of the pediment that was erected over the door of Santa Maria del Fiore and in addition of a standard of cloth for the castle, fifteen braccia in depth and forty in length, into the gilding of which there went fifty thousand leaves of gold. Now the Florentine painters and others who were employed in these preparations, thinking that Vasari was too much in favour with Duke Alessandro, and wishing to leave him disgraced in that part of the decorations, a part truly great and laborious which had fallen to him, so went to work that he was not able to enlist the services of any master of architectural painting, whether young or old, among all those that were in the city, to assist him in any single thing. Of which, having become aware, Vasari sent for Cristofano, Raffaello del Colli, and Stefano Veltroni of Monte San Sovino, his kinsman, and with their assistance and that of other painters from Arezzo and other places, he executed the works mentioned above, in which Cristofano acquitted himself in such a manner that he caused every one to marvel, doing honour to himself and also to Vasari, who was much extolled for those works. After they were finished, Cristofano remained many days in Florence, assisting the same Vasari in the preparations that were made in the palace of Messer Ottaviano de' Medici for the nuptials of Duke Alessandro, wherein, among other things, Cristofano executed the coat of arms of the Duchess Margarita of Austria with the balls upheld by a most beautiful eagle, with some boys very well done. Not long afterwards, when Duke Alessandro had been assassinated, a compact was made in the Borgo to hand over one of the gates of the city to Piero Strazzi when he came to Sestino, and letters were therefore written to Cristofano by some soldiers exiled from the Borgo entreating him that he should consent to help them in this which letters received although cristofano did not grant their request yet in order not to do a mischief to the soldiers he chose rather to tear them up as he did than to lay them as according to the laws and edicts he should have done before gerardo gerardi who was then commissioner for the lord duke cosimo in the borgo when the troubles were over and the matter became known, many citizens of the Borgo were exiled as rebels, and among them Dossino, and Signor Alessandro Vitelli, who knew the truth of this affair, and could have helped him, did not do so, to the end that Cristofano might be as it were forced to serve him in the work of his garden at Citta di Castello, of which we have spoken above. 
After having consumed much time in this service, without any profit or advantage, Cristofano finally took refuge, almost in despair with other exiles, in the village of San Gustino in the States of the Church, a mile and a half distant from the Borgo, and very near the Florentine frontier. In that place, although he stayed there at his peril, he painted for Abbot Bufolini of Cita de Castello, who has most beautiful and commodious apartments there, a chamber in a tower, with a pattern of little boys and figures, very well foreshortened, to be seen from below, and with grotesques, festoons, and masks, the most lovely and the most bizarre that could be imagined. This chamber, when finished, so pleased the abbot that he caused him to do another, in which, desiring to make some ornaments of stucco, and not having marble to grind into powder for mixing it, for this purpose he found a very good substitute in some stones from a river bed, veined with white, the powder from which took a good and very firm hold and within these ornaments of stucco Cristofano then painted some scenes from Roman history, executing them so well in fresco that it was a marvel. At that time Giorgio Vasari was painting in fresco the upper part of the tramezzo of the Abbey of Camaldoli, and two panel pictures for the lower part, and wishing to make about these last an ornament in fresco full of scenes, he would have liked to have Cristofano with him, no less to restore him to the favor of the duke than to make use of him. But although Messer Ottaviano de' Medici pleaded strongly with the duke, it proved impossible to bend him, so ugly was the information that had been given to him about the behavior of Cristofano. Not having succeeded in this, therefore, Vasari, as one who loved Cristofano, set himself to contrive to remove him at least from San Gustino, where he, with other exiles, was living in the greatest peril. In the year 1539, then, having to execute for the monks of Monte Oliveto, for the head of a great refectory in the monastery of San Michele, in Bosco without Bologna, three panel pictures in oils with three scenes, each four braccia in length, and a frieze in fresco three braccia high, all round, with twenty stories of the apocalypse in little figures, and all the monasteries of that order copied from the reality, with partitions of grotesques, and round each window fourteen braccia of festoons with fruits copied from nature. Giorgio wrote straightway to Cristofano that he should go from San Gustino to Bologna, together with Battista Cungi of the Borgo, his compatriot, who had also served Vasari for seven years. These men, therefore, having gone to Bologna, where Giorgio had not yet arrived, for he was still at Camaldoli, where, having finished the tramezzo, he was drawing the cartoon for a deposition from the cross, which was afterwards executed by him, and set up on the high altar in that same place, set themselves to prime the said three panels with gesso, and to lay on the ground until such time as Giorgio should arrive. Now Vasari had given a commission to Detero, a Jew, the friend of Messer Ottaviano de' Medici, who was then a banker in Bologna, that he should provide Cristofano and Battista with everything that they required. And since this Detero was very obliging and most courteous, he did them a thousand favors and courtesies. Wherefore those two at times went about Bologna in his company in very familiar fashion, and Battista having prominent eyes, and Cristofano a great speck in one of his, they were thus taken for Jews, as Detero was in fact. One morning, therefore, a shoemaker, who had to bring a pair of new shoes at the commission of the above-named Jew to Cristofano, arriving at the monastery, said to Cristofano himself, who was standing at the gate looking on at the distribution of alms, 
sir could you show me the rooms of those two jew painters who are working in there jews or no jews said cristofano what have you to do with them i have to give these shoes he answered to one of them called cristofano i am he replied cristofano an honest man and a better christian than you are you may be what you please answered the shoemaker i called you jews because besides that you are held and known as jews by every one that look of yours which is not of our country convinced me of it enough said cristofano you shall see that we do the work of christians but to return to the work Vasari, having arrived in Bologna, not a month had passed before, Giorgio designing, and Cristofano and Battista laying in the panels in color. All three were completely laid in, with great credit to Cristofano, who acquitted himself in this excellently well. The laying in of the panels being finished, work was begun on the frieze, in which Cristofano had a companion although he was to have executed it all by himself, for there came from Camaldoli to Bologna the cousin of Vasari, Stefano Veltroni of Monte San Savino, who had laid in the panel picture of the deposition. And the two executed that work together, and that so well that it proved a marvel. Cristofano painted grotesques so well that there was nothing better to be seen, but he did not give them that particular finish that would have made them perfect, and Stefano, on the contrary, was wanting in resolution and grace, for the reason that his brushstrokes did not fix his subjects in their places at one sweep, but, since he was very patient in the end, although he endured greater labor, he used to execute his grotesques with more neatness and delicacy. Laboring in competition, then, at the work of this frieze, these two took such pains, both the one and the other, that Cristofano learned to finish from Stefano, and Stefano learned from Cristofano to be more resolute and to work like a master work being then begun on the broad festoons that were to run in clusters round the windows vasari made one with his own hand keeping real fruits in front of him that he might copy them from nature this done he ordained that cristofano and stefano should go on with the rest holding to the same design one on one side of the window and the other on the other side and should thus one by one proceed to finish them all promising to him who might prove at the end of the work to have acquitted himself best a pair of scarlet hose and so competing lovingly for both honor and profit they set themselves to copy everything from the large things down to the most minute such as millet seed hemp seed bunches of fennel and the like in such a manner that those festoons proved to be very beautiful and both of them received from vasari the prize of the scarlet hose Giorgio took great pains to persuade Cristofano to execute by himself part of the designs for the scenes that were to go into the frieze, but he would never do it. Wherefore, the while that Giorgio was drawing them himself, Girardi executed the buildings in two of the panel pictures with much grace and beauty of manner and such perfection that a master of great judgment, even if he had had the cartoons before him, could not have done what Cristofano did. And, in truth, there never was a painter who could do by himself and without study the things that he contrived to do. After having finished the execution of the buildings in the two panel pictures, the while that Vasari was carrying to completion the twenty stories from the Apocalypse for the above-mentioned frieze, Cristofano, taking in hand the panel picture in which St. Gregory, whose head is a portrait of Pope Clement the Seventh, is eating with his twelve poor men, executed the whole service of the table, all very lifelike and most natural. 
then a beginning having been made with the third panel picture while stefano was occupied with the gilding of the ornamental frames of the other two a staging was erected upon two trestles of wood from which while vasari was painting on one side in a glory of sunlight the three angels that appeared to abraham in the valley of mambre cristofano painted some buildings on the other side but he was always making some contraption with stools and tables and at times with basins and pans upside down on which he would climb like the casual creature that he was and once it happened that, seeking to draw back, in order to look at what he had done, one of his feet gave way under him, the whole contraption turned topsy-turvy, and he fell from a height of five brachia, bruising himself so grievously that he had to be bled and properly nursed, or he would have died. And what was worse, being the sort of careless fellow that he was, one night there slipped off the bandages that were on the arm from which the blood had been drawn to the great danger of his life so that if stefano who was sleeping with him had not noticed this it would have been all up with him and even so stefano had something to do to revive him for the bed was a lake of blood and he himself was reduced almost to his last gasp Vasari, therefore, taking him under his own particular charge, as if he had been his brother, had him tended with the greatest possible care, than which, indeed, nothing less would have sufficed. And with all this he was not restored until that work was completely finished. After that, returning to San Gustino, Cristofano completed some of the apartments of the abbot there, which had been left unfinished, and then executed at Citta de Castello, all with his own hand, an altarpiece that had been allotted to Battista, his dearest friend, and a lunette that is over the side door of San Fiorido, containing three figures in fresco. End of section 13 Life of Cristofano Gerardi, called Docino, of Borgo San Sepolcro, Painter, Part 1of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Life of Cristofano Gerardi, called Docino, of Borgo San Sepolcro, Painter. Part 2 Giorgio being afterwards summoned to Venice at the instance of Messer Pietro Aretino, in order to arrange and execute for the nobles and gentlemen of the company of the Calza the setting for a most sumptuous and magnificent festival, and the scenery of a comedy written by that same Messer Pietro Aretino for those gentlemen, Giorgio, I say, knowing that he was not able to carry out so great a work by himself alone, sent for Cristofano and the above-mentioned Battista Cungi, and they, having finally arrived in Venice, after being carried by the chances of the sea to Sclavonia, found that Vasari not only had arrived there before them, but had already designed everything, so that there was nothing for them to do but to set hand to painting. Now the said gentleman of the Calza had taken at the end of the Canareo a large house which was not finished. It had nothing, indeed, save the main walls and the roof, and in a space forming an apartment, seventy brachia long and sixteen brachia wide, Giorgio caused to be made two ranges of wooden steps, four brachia in height from the floor, on which the ladies were to be seated. The walls at the sides he divided each into four square spaces of ten brachia, separated by niches each four brachia in breadth, within which were figures, and these niches had on either side a terminal figure in relief nine brachia high, insomuch that the niches on either side were five and the terminal figures ten 
and in the whole apartment there were altogether ten niches, twenty terminal figures, and eight square pictures with scenes. In the first of these pictures, which were all in chiascuro, that on the right hand, next the stage, there was, representing Venice, a most beautiful figure of Adria, depicted as seated upon a rock, in the midst of the sea, with a branch of coral in the hand. Around her stood Neptune, Thetis, Proteus, Nereus, Glaucus, Palemon, and other sea-gods and nymphs, who were presenting to her jewels, pearls, gold, and other riches of the sea. And besides this there were some loves that were shooting arrows, and others that were flying through the air and scattering flowers, and the rest of the field of the picture was all most beautiful palms. In the second picture were the rivers Drava and Sava naked, with their vases, in the third was the Po, conceived as large and corpulent, with seven suns, representing the seven branches which, issuing from the Po, pour into the sea as if each of them were a kingly river. In the fourth was the Brenta, with other rivers of Friuli. On the other wall, opposite to the Adria, was the island of Candia, wherein was to be found seen Jove being suckled by the goat, with many nymphs around. Besides this, and opposite to the Drava, were the river Tagliamento and the mountains of Cadori. Beyond this, opposite to the Po, were Lake Benicus and the Mincio, which were pouring their waters into the Po, and beside them, opposite to the Brenta, were the Adigi and the Tessino, falling into the sea. The pictures on the right-hand side were divided by these virtues, placed in the niches, liberality, concord, compassion, peace, and religion and opposite to these on the other wall were fortitude, civic wisdom, justice, a victory with war beneath her, and lastly a charity. Above all, then, were a large cornice and architrave, and a frieze full of lights and of glass globes filled with distilled waters, to the end that these, having lights behind them, might illuminate the whole apartment. Next, the ceiling was divided into four quadrangular compartments, each ten brachia wide in one direction, and eight brachia in the other. And with a width equal to that of the niches of four brachia, there was a frieze which ran right round the cornice, while in a line with the niches there came in the middle of all the spaces a compartment three brachia square. These compartments were in all twenty-three, without counting one of double size that was above the stage, which brought the number up to twenty-four, and in them were the hours twelve of the night, namely, and twelve of the day. In the first of the compartments, ten brachia in length, which were above the stage, was Time, who was arranging the hours in their places, accompanied by Elus, god of the winds, by Juno, and by Iris. In another compartment, at the door of entrance, was the car of Aurora, who, rising from the arms of Tithonus, was scattering roses, while the car itself was being drawn by some cocks. In the third was the chariot of the sun, and in the fourth was the chariot of night, drawn by owls, and night had the moon upon her head, some bats in front of her, and all around her darkness. Of these pictures Cristofano executed the greater part, and he acquitted himself so well that every one stood marvelling at them, particularly in the chariot of night, wherein he did in the way of oil sketches that which was, in a manner of speaking, not possible. And in the picture of Adria, likewise, he painted those monsters of the sea with such beauty and variety, that whoever looked at them was struck with astonishment that a craftsman of his rank should have shown such knowledge. In short, in all this work, he bore himself beyond all expectation, like an able and well-practiced painter, and particularly in the foliage and grotesques. 
After finishing the preparations for that festival, Vasari and Cristofano stayed some months in Venice, painting for the magnificent Messer Giovanni Cornaro the ceiling, or rather soffit, of an apartment, into which there went nine large pictures in oils. Vasari being then entreated by the Veronese architect Michel San Michel to stay in Venice, he might perhaps have consented to remain there for a year or two, but Cristofano always dissuaded him from it, saying that it was not a good thing to stay in Venice, where no account was taken of design, nor did the painters in that city make any use of it, not to mention that those painters themselves were the reason that no attention was paid there to the labors of the arts. And he declared that it would be better to return to Rome, the true school of noble arts, where ability was recognized much more than in Venice. The dissuasions of Cristofano being thus added to the little desire that Vasari had to stay there, they went off together. But since Cristofano, being an exile from the state of Florence, was not able to follow Giorgio, he returned to San Gustino, where he did not remain long doing some work all the time for the above-mentioned abbot, before he went to Perugia, on the first occasion, when Pope Paul III went there, after the war waged with the people of that city. There, in the festive preparations that were made to receive his holiness, he acquitted himself very well in several works, and particularly in the portal called After Frate Rinieri, where, at the wish of Monsignor della Barba, who was then governor there, Cristofano executed a large Jove in anger, and another pacified, which are two most beautiful figures, and on the other side he painted an atlas with the world on his back, between two women, one of whom had a sword, and the other a pair of scales. These works, with many others that Cristofano executed for those festivities, were the reason that afterwards, when the citadel had been built in Perugia by order of the same pontiff, Messer Tiberio Crispo, who was governor and castellan at that time, when causing many of the rooms to be painted, desired that Cristofano, in addition to that which Latanzio, a painter of the march, had executed in them up to that time, should also work there. Whereupon Cristofano not only assisted the above-named Latanzio, but afterwards executed with his own hand the greater part of the best works that are painted in the apartments of that fortress, in which there also worked Raffaello del Colle and Adone Doni of Assisi, an able and well-practiced painter who has executed many things in his native city and in other places. Tomasco Papacello also worked there, but the best that there was among them, and the one who gained most praise there, was Cristofano, on which account he was recommended by Latanzio to the favor of the said Crispo, and was ever afterwards much employed by him. Meanwhile, that same Crispo, having built in Perugia a new little church known as Santa Maria del Popolo, but first called del Mercato, Latanzio had begun for it an altarpiece in oils, and in this Cristofano painted with his own hand all the upper part, which is indeed most beautiful and worthy of great praise. Then, Latanzio having been changed from a painter into the constable of Perugia, Cristofano returned to San Gustino, where he stayed many months, again working for the above-named Lord Abbot Buffolini. After this, in the year 1543, Giorgio Vasari, having to execute a panel picture in oils for the great Cancelleria by order of the most illustrious Cardinal Farnese, and another for the church of Sant'Agostino at the commission of Galeotto da Gironi, sent for Cristofano, who went very willingly as one who had a desire to see Rome. There he stayed many months, doing little else but go about seeing everything. But nevertheless he thus gained so much that after returning once more to San Gustino, 
he painted in a hall some figures after his own fancy which were so beautiful that it appeared that he must have studied at them twenty years then in the year of fifteen forty five vasari had to go to naples to paint for the monks of monte alavito a refectory involving much more work than that of san michel in bosco at bologna and he sent for cristofano raffaello del colli and stefano already mentioned as his friends and pupils and they all came together at the appointed time in naples excepting cristofano who remained behind because he was ill however being pressed by vasari he made his way to rome on his journey to naples but he was detained by his brother borgognoni who was likewise an exile and who wished to take him to france to enter the service of the colonel giovanni da torino and so that occasion was lost but when vasari returned from naples to rome in the year fifteen forty six in order to execute twenty-four pictures that were afterwards sent to naples and placed in the sacristy of san giovanni carbonaro in which he painted stories from the old testament and also from the life of st john the baptist with figures of one braccia or a little more and also in order to paint the doors of the organ of the piscopio which were six braccia in height he availed himself of cristofano who was of great assistance to him and executed figures and landscapes in those works excellently well Giorgio had also proposed to make use of him in the hall of the Cancelleria, which was painted after cartoons by his hand, and entirely finished in a hundred days, for Cardinal Farnese. But in this he did not succeed, for Cristofano fell ill, and returned to San Gustino as soon as he had begun to mend and Vasari finished the hall without him, assisted by Raffaello del Colli, the Bolognese Giovanni Battista Bagna Cavallo, the Spaniards Roviali and Bezera, and many others of his friends and pupils. After returning from Rome to Florence, and setting out from that city to go to Rimini, to paint a chapel in fresco, and an altarpiece in the church of the monks of Monte Alavito, for abbot Gian Matteo Fatani, Giorgio passed through San Gustino, in order to take Cristofano with him, but abbot Buffolini, for whom he was painting a hall, would not let him go for the time being, although he promised Giorgio that he should send Cristofano to him soon all the way to Romagna. But notwithstanding such a promise, the abbot delayed so long to send him, that Cristofano, when he did go, found that Vasari had not only finished all the work for the other abbot, but had also executed an altarpiece for the high altar of San Francesco at Rimini, for Messer Niccolo Margeselli, and another altarpiece in the church of Classi, belonging to the monks of Camaldoli at Ravenna, for Don Romualdo da Verona, the abbot of that abbey. In the year 1550, not long before this, Giorgio had just executed the story of the marriage of Esther in the Black Friars Abbey of San Fiori, that is, in the refectory at Arezzo, and also at Florence for the chapel of the Martelli in the church of San Lorenzo, the altarpiece of San Gismondo, when, Julius the Third, having been elected Pope, he was summoned to Rome to enter the service of His Holiness. Thereupon he thought for certain that by means of Cardinal Farnese, who went at that time to stay in Florence, he would be able to reinstate Cristofano in his country and restore him to the favor of Duke Cosimo but this proved to be impossible, so that poor Cristofano had to stay as he was until 1554, at which time Vasari, having been invited into the service of Duke Cosimo, there came to him an opportunity of delivering Cristofano. Bishop Daricasoli, who knew that he would be doing a thing pleasing to His Excellency, had set to work to have the three facades of his palace, which stands on the abutment of the Ponte alla Caraja, 
painted in chiaroscuro when messer sforza almeni cup-bearer as well as first and favourite chamberlain to the duke resolved that he also would have his house in the via di servi painted in chiaroscuro in emulation of the bishop but not having found in florence any painters according to his fancy he wrote to giorgio vasari who had not then arrived in florence that he should think out the inventions and send him designs of all that it might seem to him best to paint on that facade of his whereupon giorgio who was much his friend for they had known each other from the time when they were both in the service of duke alessandro having thought out the whole according to the measurements of the façade sent him a design of most beautiful invention which embellished the windows and joined them together with a well-varied decoration in a straight line from top to bottom and filled all the spaces in the façade with rich scenes this design i say which contained to put it briefly the whole life of man from birth to death was sent by vasari to messer sforza and it so pleased him and likewise the duke that in order that it might have all its perfection they resolved that they would not have it taken in hand until such time as vasari himself should have arrived in florence which vasari having at last come and having been received by his most illustrious excellency and by the above-named messer savorsa with great friendliness they began to discuss who might be the right man to execute that facade whereupon giorgio not allowing the occasion to slip by said to messer savorsa that no one was better able to carry out that work than cristofano and that neither in that nor in the works that were to be executed in the palace could he do without cristofano's aid and so messer sforza having spoken of this to the duke after many inquiries it was found that cristofano's crime was not so black as it had been painted and the poor fellow was at last pardoned by his excellency which news having been received by vasari who was at arezzo revisiting his native place and his friends he sent a messenger expressly to cristofano who knew nothing of the matter to give him that good news and when he heard it he was like to faint with joy all rejoicing therefore and confessing that no one had ever been a better friend to him than vasari he went off next morning from Sita di castello to the borgo where after presenting his letters of deliverance to the commissioner he made his way to his father's house where his mother and also his brother who had been recalled from exile long before were struck with astonishment then after passing two days there he went off to arezzo where he was received by giorgio with more rejoicing than if he had been his own brother and recognized that he was so beloved by vasari that he resolved that he would spend the rest of his life with him End of section 14. Life of Cristofano Gerardi called Dosino of Borgo San Sepolcro Painter Part 2section fifteen of lives of the most eminent painters sculptors and architects volume seven by giorgio vasari translation by gaston de c de Vere. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by rita boutros life of cristofano girardi called dosino of borgo san sepulcro painter part three they then went from Arezzo to Florence together, and Cristofano went to kiss the hands of the duke, who received him readily, and was struck with amazement for the reason that, whereas he had thought to see some great bravo, he saw the best little man in the world. Cristofano was likewise made much of by Messer Sforza, who conceived a very great affection for him and he then set his hand to the above-mentioned façade. 
in that work giorgio because it was not yet possible to work in the palace assisted him at his own request to execute some designs for the scenes in the façade also designing at times during the progress of the work on the plaster some of the figures that are there but although there are in it many things retouched by vasari nevertheless the whole façade with the greater part of the figures and all the ornaments festoons and large ovals is by the hand of cristofano who in truth as may be seen was so able in handling colours in fresco that it may be said and vasari confesses it that he knew more about it than giorgio himself and if Cristofano, when he was a lad, had exercised himself continuously in the studies of art, for he never did a drawing save when he had afterwards to carry it into execution, and had pursued the practice of art with spirit, he would have had no equal, seeing that his facility, judgment, and memory enabled him to execute his works in such a way, without any further study, that he used to surpass many who in fact knew more than he nor could any one believe with what facility and resolution he executed his labours for when he set himself to work no matter how long a time it might take he so delighted in it that he would never lift his eyes off his painting wherefore his friends might well expect the greatest things from him besides this he was so gracious in his conversation and his jesting as he worked that Vasari would at times stay working in his company from morning till night, without ever growing weary. Cristofano executed this façade in a few months, not to mention that he sometimes stayed away some weeks, without working there, going to the Borgo to see and enjoy his home. Now I do not wish to grudge the labor of describing the distribution and the figures of this work, which, from its being in the open air, and much exposed to the vagaries of the weather, may not have a very long life. Scarcely, indeed, was it finished when it was much injured by a terrible rain and a very heavy hail-storm, and in some places the wall was stripped of plaster. In this façade, then, there are three compartments. The first, to begin at the foot, is where the principal door and the two windows are. The second is from the sill of those windows to that of the second range of windows. And the third is from those last windows to the cornice of the roof. There are, besides this, six windows in each range, which give seven spaces, and the whole work was divided, according to this plan, in straight lines from the cornice of the roof down to the ground. Next to the cornice of the roof, then, there is in perspective a great cornice, with brackets that project over a frieze of little boys, six of whom stand upright along the breadth of the façade, namely, one above the centre of the arch of each window, and these support with their shoulders most beautiful festoons of fruits leaves and flowers which run from one to another these fruits and flowers are arranged in due succession according to the seasons symbolizing the periods of our life which is there depicted and on the middle of the festoons likewise where they hang down are other little boys in various attitudes this frieze finished between the upper windows, in the spaces that are there, there were painted the seven planets, with the seven celestial signs above them, as a crown and an ornament. Beneath the sill of these windows, on the parapet, is a frieze of virtues, who, two by two, are holding seven great ovals, in which ovals are seven distinct stories, representing the seven ages of man and each age is accompanied by two virtues appropriate to her, and beneath the ovals in the spaces between the lower windows there are the three theological and the four moral virtues. Below this, in the frieze that is above the door and the windows supported by knee-shaped brackets, are the seven liberal arts, each of which is in a line with the oval, in which is the particular story of the life of man appropriate to it. 
and in the same straight lines continued upwards are the moral virtues planets signs and other corresponding symbols next between the windows with knee-shaped brackets there is life both the active and the contemplative with scenes and statues continued down to death hell and our final resurrection in brief cristofano executed almost all by himself the whole cornice the festoons the little boys and the seven signs of the planets then beginning on one side he painted first the moon and represented her by a diana who has her lap full of flowers after the manner of proserpine with a moon upon her head and the sign of cancer above her below in the oval wherein is the story of infancy there are present at the birth of man some nurses who are suckling infants and newly delivered women in bed executed by cristofano with much grace and this oval is supported by will alone who is a half-nude young woman fair and beautiful and she is sustained by charity who is also suckling infants and beneath the oval on the parapet is grammar who is teaching some little boys to read beginning over again there follows mercury with the caduceus and with his sign who has below him in the oval some little boys some of whom are going to school and some playing this oval is supported by truth who is a nude little girl all pure and simple who has on one side a male figure representing falsehood with a variety of girt up garments and a most beautiful countenance but with the eyes much sunken beneath the oval of the windows is faith who with the right hand is baptizing a child in a conch full of water and with the left hand is holding a cross, and below her on the parapet is logic covered by a veil with a serpent. Next follows the sun, represented by an Apollo, who has the lyre in his hand, with his sign in the ornament above. In the oval is adolescence, represented by two boys of equal age, one of whom, holding a branch of olive, is ascending a mountain illumined by the sun, and the other halting halfway up to admire the beauties that fraud displays from the middle upwards, without perceiving that her hideous countenance is concealed behind a smooth and beautiful mask is caused by her and her wiles to fall over a precipice this oval is supported by sloth a gross and corpulent man who stands all sleepy and nude in the guise of a sullenness and also by toil in the person of a robust and hard-working peasant who has around him the implements for tilling the earth these are supported by that part of the ornament that is between the windows where hope is who has the anchors at her feet and on the parapet below is music with various musical instruments about her there follows in due order venus who has clasped love to her bosom and is kissing him and she also has her sign above her in the oval that she has beneath her is the story of youth that is in the centre a young man seated with books instruments for measuring and other things appertaining to design and in addition maps of the world and cosmographical globes and spheres and behind him is a loggia in which are young men who are merrily passing the time away with singing dancing and playing and also a banquet of young people all given over to enjoyment on one side this oval is supported by self-knowledge who has about her compasses armillary spheres quadrants and books and is gazing at herself in a mirror and on the other side by fraud a hideous old hag lean and toothless who is mocking at self-knowledge and in the act of covering her face with a smooth and beautiful mask below the oval is temperance with a horse's bridle in her hand and beneath her on the parapet is rhetoric who is in a line with the other similar figures 
next to these comes mars in armor with many trophies about him and with the sign of the lion above him in his oval which is below him is virility represented by a full-grown man standing between memory and will who are holding before him a basin of gold containing a pair of wings and are pointing out to him the path of deliverance in the direction of a mountain and this oval is supported by innocence who is a maiden with a lamb at her side and by hilarity who all smiling and merry reveals herself at what she really is beneath the oval between the windows is prudence who is making herself beautiful before a mirror and she has below her on the parapet a figure of philosophy next there follows jove with his thunderbolt and his bird the eagle and with his sign above him in the oval is old age who is represented by an old man clothed as a priest and kneeling before an altar upon which he is placing the basin of gold with the two wings and this oval is supported by compassion who is covering some naked little boys and by religion enveloped in sacerdotal vestments below these is a fortitude in armor who planting one of her legs in a spirited attitude on a fragment of a column is placing some balls in the mouth of a lion and beneath her on the parapet she has a figure of astrology the last of the seven planets is saturn depicted as an old man heavy with melancholy who is devouring his own children with a great serpent that is seizing its own tail with its teeth which saturn has above him the sign of capricorn in the oval is decrepitude and here is depicted jove in heaven receiving a naked and decrepit old man kneeling who is watched over by felicity and immortality who are casting his garments into the world this oval is supported by beatitude who is upheld by a figure of justice in the ornament below who is seated and has in her hand the sceptre and upon her shoulders the stork with arms and laws around her and on the parapet below is geometry in the lowest part at the foot which is about the windows with knee-shaped brackets and the door is leah in a niche representing the act of life and on the other side of the same place is industry who has a cornucopia and two goads in her hands near the door is a scene in which many masters in wood and stone architects and stone cutters have before them the gate of cosmopolis a city built by the lord duke cosimo in the island of elba with a representation of porto ferrajo between this scene and the frieze in which are the liberal arts is lake tresemine round which are nymphs who are issuing from the water with tench pike eels and roach and beside the lake is perugia a nude figure holding with her hands a dog which she is showing to a figure of florence corresponding to her who stands on the other side with a figure of arno beside her who is embracing and fondling her and below this is the contemplative life in another scene in which many philosophers and astrologers are measuring the heavens appearing to be casting the horoscope of the duke and beside this in the niche corresponding to that of leah is her sister rachel the daughter of laban representing the contemplative life the last scene which is likewise between two niches and forms the conclusion of the whole invention is death who mounted on a lean horse and holding the scythe and accompanied by war pestilence and famine is riding over persons of every kind in one niche is the god pluto and beneath him cerberus the hound of hell and in the other is a large figure rising again from a sepulchre on the last day after all these things cristofano executed on the pediments of the windows with knee-shaped brackets some nude figures that are holding the devices of his excellency 
and over the door a duckle coat of arms, the six balls of which are upheld by some naked little boys, who twine in and out between each other as they fly through the air. And last of all, in the bases at the foot, beneath all the scenes, the same Cristofano painted the device of Messer Sforza, that is, some obelisks, or rather triangular pyramids, which rest upon three balls, with a motto around that reads, Immobilis. This work, when finished, was vastly extolled by His Excellency, and by Messer Sforza himself, who, like the courteous gentleman that he was, wished to reward with a considerable present the art and industry of Cristofano. But he would have none of it, being contented and fully repaid by the good will of that Lord, who loved him ever afterwards more than I could say. While the work was being executed, Vasari had Cristofano with him, as he had always done in the past, in the house of Signor Bernardetto de Medici, who much delighted in painting, which, having perceived, Cristofano painted two scenes in Chioscuro in a corner of his garden. One was the rape of Proserpine, and in the other were Vertumnus and Pomona, the deities of agriculture and besides this cristofano painted in this work some ornaments of terminal figures and children of such variety and beauty that there is nothing better to be seen meanwhile arrangements had been made for beginning to paint in the palace and the first thing that was taken in hand was a hall in the new apartments which being twenty braccia wide and having a height according as tasso had constructed it of not more than nine braccia was raised three braccia with beautiful ingenuity by vasari that is to a total height of twelve braccia without moving the roof which was half a pavilion roof but because in doing this, before it could become possible to paint, much time had to be devoted to reconstructing the ceilings and to other works in that apartment and in others, Vasari himself obtained leave to go to Arezzo to spend two months there together with Cristofano. However, he did not succeed in being able to rest during that time, for the reason that he could not refuse to go in those days to Cortona, where he painted in fresco the vaulting and the walls of the Company of Jesus with the assistance of Cristofano, who acquitted himself very well, and particularly in the twelve different sacrifices from the Old Testament, which they executed in the lunettes between the spandrels of the vaulting indeed to speak more exactly almost the whole of this work was by the hand of cristofano vasari having done nothing therein beyond making certain sketches designing some parts on the plaster and then retouching it at times in various places according as it was necessary this work finished which is not otherwise than grand worthy of praise and very well executed by reason of the great variety of things that are in it they both returned to florence in the month of january of the year fifteen fifty five there having taken in hand the hall of the elements while vasari was painting the pictures of the ceiling cristofano executed some devices that bind together the friezes of the beams in perpendicular lines in which are heads of capricorns and tortoises with the sail devices of his excellency but the works in which he showed himself most marvellous were some festoons of fruits that are in the friezes of the beams on the under side, which are so beautiful that there is nothing better coloured or more natural to be seen, particularly because they are separated one from another by certain masks that hold in their mouths the ligatures of the festoons, than which one would not be able to find any more varied or more bizarre in which manner of work it may be said that cristofano was superior to any other who has ever made it his principal and particular profession 
this done he painted some large figures on that part of the walls where there is the birth of venus but after the cartoons of vasari and many little figures in a landscape which were executed very well in like manner on the wall where there are the loves as tiny little children fashioning the arrows of cupid he painted the three cyclops forging thunderbolts for jove over six doors he executed in fresco six large ovals with ornaments in chioscuro and containing scenes in the colour of bronze which were very beautiful and in the same hall between the windows he painted in colours a mercury and a pluto which are likewise very beautiful work being then begun in the chamber of the goddess ops which is next to that described above he painted the four seasons in fresco on the ceiling and in addition to the figures some festoons that were marvellous in their variety and beauty for the reason that even as those of spring were filled with a thousand kinds of flowers so those of summer were painted with an infinite number of fruits and cereals those of autumn were of leaves and bunches of the grape, and those of winter were of onions, turnips, radishes, carrots, parsnips, and dried leaves, not to mention that in the central picture, in which is the car of ops, he coloured so beautifully in oils four lions that are drawing the car, that nothing better could be done, and in truth in painting animals he had no equal then in the chamber of ceres which is beside the last named he executed in certain angles some little boys and festoons that are beautiful to a marvel and in the central picture where vasari had painted ceres seeking for proserpine with a lighted pine torch upon a car drawn by two serpents cristofano carried many things to completion with his own hand because vasari was ill at that time and had left that picture among other things unfinished finally when it came to decorating a terrace that is beyond the chamber of jove and beside that of ops it was decided that all the history of juno should be painted there and so after all the ornamentation in stucco had been finished with very rich carvings and various compositions of figures wrought after the cartoons of vasari the same vasari ordained that cristofano should execute that work by himself in fresco desiring since it was a work to be seen from near and of figures not higher than one braccio that gerardo should do something beautiful in this which was his peculiar profession Cristofano then executed in an oval on the vaulting a marriage with Juno in the sky, and in a picture on one side Hebe, goddess of youth, and on the other Iris, who is pointing to the rainbow in the heavens. On the same vaulting he painted three other quadrangular pictures, two to match the others, and a larger one in a line with the oval in which is the marriage, and in the last named picture is Juno, seated in a car drawn by peacocks. In one of the other two, which are on either side of that one, is the goddess of power, and in the other abundance with the cornucopia at her feet and in two other pictures on the walls below over the openings of two doors are two other stories of juno the transformation of io the daughter of the river iancus into a cow and of callisto into a bear during the execution of that work his excellency conceived a very great affection for cristofano seeing him zealous and diligent in no ordinary manner at his work for the morning had scarcely broken into day when cristofano would appear at his labour of which he had such a love and it so delighted him that very often he would not finish dressing before setting out and at times nay frequently it happened that in his haste he put on a pair of shoes all such things he kept under his bed that were not fellows but of two kinds and more often than not he had his cloak wrong side out with the hood on the inside 
one morning therefore appearing at an early hour at his work where the lord duke and the lady duchess were standing looking at it while preparations were being made to set out for the chase and the ladies and others of the court were making themselves ready they noticed that cristofano had as usual his cloak wrong side out and the hood inside at which both laughing the duke said what is your idea in always wearing your cloak inside out i know not my lord answered cristofano but i mean to find some day a kind of cloak that shall have neither right side nor wrong side and shall be the same on both sides for i have not the patience to think of wearing it in any other way since in the morning i generally dress and go out of the house in the dark besides that i have one eye so feeble that i can see nothing with it but let your excellency look at what i paint and not at my manner of dressing the duke said nothing in answer but within a few days he caused to be made for him a cloak of the finest cloth with the pieces sewn and drawn together in such a manner that there was no difference to be seen between outside and inside and the collar worked with braid in the same manner both inside and out and so also the trimming that it had round the edges this being finished he sent it to cristofano by a lackey commanding the man that he should give it to him on the part of the duke having therefore received the cloak very early one morning cristofano without making any further ceremony tried it on and then said to the lackey the duke is a man of sense tell him that it suits me well now since cristofano was thus careless of his person and hated nothing more than to have to put on new clothes or to go about too tightly constrained and confined in them vasari who knew this humour of his whenever he observed that he was in need of any new clothes used to have them made for him in secret and then early one morning used to place these in his chamber and take away the old ones and so cristofano was forced to put on those that he found but it was marvellous sport to stand and hear him raging with fury as he dressed himself in the new clothes look here he would say what devilments are these devil take it can a man not live in his own way in this world without the enemies of comfort giving themselves all this trouble one morning among others cristofano having put on a pair of white hose the painter domenico benci who was also working in the palace with vasari contrived to persuade him to go with himself in company with other young men to the madonna dell'imprunetta there they walked danced and enjoyed themselves all day and in the evening after supper they returned home then cristofano who was tired went off straightway to his room to sleep but when he set himself to take off his hose what with their being new and his having sweated he was not able to pull off more than one of them now vasari having gone in the evening to see how he was found that he had fallen asleep with one leg covered and the other bare whereupon one servant holding his leg and the other pulling at the stocking they contrived to draw it off while he lay cursing clothes giorgio and him who invented such fashions as so he said kept men bound in chains like slaves nay he grumbled that he would take leave of them all and by hook or by crook return to san gustino where he was allowed to live in his own way and had not all these restraints and it was the devil's own business to pacify him it pleased him to talk seldom and he loved that others also should be brief in speaking insomuch that he would have gone so far as to have men's proper names very short like that of a slave belonging to messer sforza who was called m these said cristofano are fine names and not your giovan francesco and giovanni antonio which take an hour's work to pronounce and since he was a good fellow at heart and said these things in his own jargon of the borgo it would have made the doleful knight himself laugh 
He delighted to go on feast days to the places where legends and printed pictures were sold, and he would not stay there the whole day. And if he bought some, more often than not, while he went about looking at the others, he would leave them at some place where he had been leaning. And never, unless he was forced, would he go on horseback, although he was born from a noble family in his native place and was rich enough. Finally, his brother Borgognone having died, he had to go to the Borgo, and Vasari, who had drawn much of the money of his salary and had kept it for him, said to him, See, I have all this money of yours. It is right that you should take it with you and make use of it in your requirements. I want no money, answered Cristofano. Take it for yourself. For me it is enough to have the luck to stay with you and to live and die in your company. It is not my custom, replied Vasari, to profit by the labor of others. If you will not have it, I shall send it to your father, Guido. That you must not do, said Cristofano, for he would only waste it as he always does. In the end he took the money and went off to the Borgo, but in poor health and with little contentment of mind. And after arriving there, what with his sorrow at the death of his brother, whom he had loved very dearly, and a cruel flux of the reins, he died in a few days after receiving the full sacraments of the church and distributing to his family and to many poor persons the money that he had brought. He declared a little before his death that it grieved him for no other reason save that he was leaving Vasari too much embarrassed by the great labors to which he had set his hand in the palace of the duke. Not long afterwards, his excellency, having heard of the death of Cristofano, and that with true regret, he caused a head of him to be made in marble, and sent it with the underwritten epitaph from Florence to the Borgo, where it was placed in San Francesco. Deo optimo maximo, Cristoforo Gerardo Burgensi, pingendi arte prestantes, quad dorgias vasarias arantinas, Hujus, artis facile princeps, in exornando cosmi florentin, ducis paletio, ilias operam quam maxime, probaverit, pictoris hetrosci possuer, obit anno domini, fifteen fifty six, vixit an fifty six, m three d six. End of section 15 Life of Cristofano Gerardi, called Doceno, of Borgo San Sepulcro, Painter, Part 3this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Life of Jacopo de Pantormo, Painter of Florence. Part 1. The ancestors, or rather the elders of Bartolomeo di Jacopi de Martino, the father of Jacopo de Pantormo, whose life we are now about to write, had their origin, so some declare, in Ancisa, a township in the upper Valdarno, famous enough because from it the ancestors of messer francesco petrarca likewise derived their origin but whether it was from there or from some other place that his elders came the above-named bartolomeo who was a florentine and so i have been told of the family of the carucci is said to have been a disciple of domenico ghirlandajo and after executing many works in the valdarno as a painter passing able for those times to have finally made his way to ampoli to carry out certain labors living there and in the neighboring places and taking to wife at pantormo a most virtuous girl of good condition called alessandra the daughter of pasquale di zenobi and of his wife mona brigida to this Bartolomeo, then, there was born in the year 1493 our Jacopo. 
but the father having died in the year 1499, the mother in the year 1504, and the grandfather in the year 1506, Jacopo was left to the care of his grandmother, Mona Brigida, who kept him for several years at Pantormo, and had him taught reading, writing, and the first rudiments of Latin grammar, and finally, at the age of thirteen, he was taken by the same guardian to Florence, and placed with the pupili, to the end that his small property might be safeguarded and preserved by that board, as is the custom. And after settling the boy himself in the house of one Battista, a shoemaker distantly related to him, Mona Brigida returned to Pantormo, taking with her a sister of Jacopo's, but not long after that, Mona Brigida herself having died, Jacopo was forced to bring that sister to Florence, and to place her in the house of a kinsman called Nicolaio, who lived in the Via de Servi, and the girl also, following the rest of her family, died in the year 1512, before ever she was married. But to return to Jacopo, he had not been many months in Florence when he was placed by Bernardo Vittori with Leonardo da Vinci, and shortly afterwards with Mariotto Albertinelli, then with Piero di Cosimo, and finally in the year 1512 with Andrea del Sarto, with whom, likewise, he did not stay long, for the reason that, after Jacopo had executed the cartoons of the little arch for the Servites, of which there will be an account below, it appears that Andrea never again looked favorably upon him, whatever may have been the reason. The first work, then, that Jacopo executed at that time was a little annunciation for one his friend, a tailor. But the tailor having died before the work was finished, it remained in the hands of Jacopo, who was at that time with Mariotto, and Mariotto took pride in it, and showed it as a rare work to all who entered his workshop. Now Raffaello da Urbino, coming in those days to Florence, saw with infinite marvel the work and the lad who had done it, and prophesied of Jacopo that which was afterwards seen to come true. Not long afterwards, Mariotto having departed from Florence and gone to Viterbo to execute the panel picture that Fra Bartolomeo had begun there, Jacopo, who was young, solitary, and melancholy, being thus left without a master, went by himself to work under Andrea del Sarto at the very moment when Andrea had finished the stories of San Filippo in the court of the Servites which pleased Jacopo vastly, as did all his other works and his whole manner and design. Jacopo, having then set himself to make every effort to imitate him, no long time passed before it was seen that he had made marvellous progress in drawing and colouring, insomuch that from his facility it seemed as if he had been many years in art." Now Andrea had finished in those days a panel picture of the Annunciation for the Church of the Friars of San Gallo, which is now destroyed, as has been related in his life, and he gave the predella of that panel picture to Jacopo to execute in oils. Jacopo painted in it a dead Christ, with two little angels who are weeping over him, and illuminating him with two torches and in two round pictures at the sides, two prophets, which were executed by him so ably that they have the appearance of having been painted not by a mere lad, but by a practised master. But it may also be, as Bronzino says, that he remembers having heard from Jacopo de Pantormo himself that Rosso likewise worked on this predella and even as Andrea was assisted by Jacopo in executing the predella, so also was he aided by him in finishing the many pictures and works that Andrea continually had in hand. In the meantime, 
Cardinal Giovanni de' Medici, having been elected Supreme Pontiff under the title of Leo X, there were being made, all over Florence by the friends and adherents of that house, many escutcheons of the pontiff, in stone, in marble, on canvas, and in fresco. Wherefore the Servite friars, wishing to give some sign of their service and devotion to that house and pontiff, caused the arms of Leo to be made in stone, and placed in the centre of the arch in the first portico of the Nunziata, which is on the piazza, and shortly afterwards they arranged that it should be overlaid with gold by the painter Andrea de Cosimo and adorned with grotesques, of which he was an excellent master, and with the devices of the house of Medici, and that, in addition, on either side of it there should be painted a faith and a charity. But Andrea de Cosimo, knowing that he was not able to execute all these things by himself, thought of giving the two figures to some other to do, and so, having sent for Jacopo, who was then not more than nineteen years of age, he gave him those two figures to execute, although he had no little trouble to persuade him to undertake to do it, seeing that, being a mere lad, he did not wish to expose himself at the outset to such a risk, or to work in a place of so much importance." However, having taken heart, although he was not as well practised in fresco as in oil painting, Jacopo undertook to paint those two figures, and withdrawing, for he was still working with Andrea del Sarto to draw the cartoons at Sant'Antonio by the Porta of Faenza, where he lived, in a short time he carried them to completion which done, one day he took his master Andrea to see them. Andrea, after seeing them with infinite marvel and amazement, praised them vastly. But afterwards, as has been related, whether it was from envy or from some other reason, he never again looked with a kindly eye on Jacopo. Nay, Jacopo going several times to his workshop, either the door was not open to him, or he was mocked at by the assistants, insomuch that he retired altogether by himself, beginning to live on the least that he could, for he was very poor, and to study with the greatest assiduity. When Andrea de Cosimo, then, had finished gilding the escutcheon and all the eaves, Jacopo set to work all by himself to finish the rest, and being carried away by the desire to make a name, by his joy in working, and by nature, which had endowed him with extraordinary grace and fertility of genius, he executed that work with incredible rapidity, and with such perfection as could not have been surpassed by an old, well-practiced, and excellent master. Wherefore, growing in courage through this experience, and thinking that he could do a much better work, he took it into his head that he would throw to the ground all that he had done, without saying a word to any one, and paint it all over again after another design that he had in his brain. But in the meantime the friars, having seen that the work was finished, and that Jacopo came no more to his labor, sought out Andrea, and so pestered him that he resolved to uncover it. Having therefore looked for Jacopo, in order to ask him whether he wished to do any more to the work, and not finding him, for the reason that he stayed shut up over his new design, and would not answer to any one, Andrea had the screen and scaffolding removed, and the work uncovered. The same evening Jacopo, having issued from his house in order to go to the Servite convent, and when it should be night, to throw to the ground the work that he had done, and to put into execution the new design, found the scaffolding taken away and everything uncovered, and a multitude of people all around gazing at the work. Whereupon, full of fury, he sought out Andrea, and complained of his having uncovered it without his consent, going on to describe what he had in mind to do. 
to which andrea answered laughing you are wrong to complain because the work that you have done is so good that if you had it to do again you may take my word for it that you would not be able to do it better you will not want for work so keep these designs for another occasion that work as may be seen was of such a kind and so beautiful what with the novelty of the manner the sweetness in the heads of those two women and the loveliness of the graceful and lifelike children that it was the most beautiful work in fresco that had ever been seen up to that time and besides the children with the charity there are two others in the air holding a piece of drapery over the escutcheon of the pope who are so beautiful that nothing better could be done not to mention that all the figures have very strong relief and are so executed in colouring and in every other respect that one is not able to praise them enough and michelagnolo buonarti seeing the work one day and reflecting that a youth of nineteen had done it said this young man judging from what may be seen here will become such that if he lives and perseveres he will exalt this art to the heavens this renown and fame being heard by the men of pontormo they sent for jacopo and commissioned him to execute in their stronghold over a gate placed on the main road an escutcheon of pope leo with two little boys which was very beautiful but already it has been little less than ruined by rain at the carnival in the same year all florence being gay and full of rejoicing at the election of the above-named leo the tenth many festive spectacles were ordained and among them two of great beauty and extraordinary cost which were given by two companies of noblemen and gentlemen of the city one of these which was called the diamante had for its head the brother of the pope signor giuliano de medici who had given it that name because the diamond had been a device of his father the elder lorenzo and the head of the other which had as name and device the bronconi was signor lorenzo the son of piero de medici who had for his device a bronconi that is a dried trunk of laurel growing green again with leaves as it were to signify that he was reviving and restoring the name of his grandfather End of section sixteen jacopo de pantormo Painter of Florence, Part 1section seventeen of lives of the most eminent painters sculptors and architects volume seven by Giorgio Vasari translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Rita Boutros Jacopo de Pantormo Painter of Florence Part two by the company of the diamante then a commission was given to messer andrea dazzi who was then lecturing on greek and latin letters at the studio in florence to look to the invention of a triumphal procession whereupon he arranged one similar to those that the romans used to have for their triumphs with three very beautiful cars wrought in wood and painted with rich and beautiful art in the first was boyhood, with a most beautiful array of boys. In the second was manhood, with many persons who had done great things in their manly prime. And in the third was old age, with many famous men who had performed great achievements in their last years. All these persons were very richly apparelled, insomuch that it was thought that nothing better could be done. The architects of these cars were Raffaello del Vivoli, Il Carota the woodcarver, the painter Andrea de Cosimo, and Andrea del Sarto. Those who arranged and prepared the dresses of the figures were Ser Piero da Vinci, the father of Leonardo, and Bernardino de Giordano, both men of beautiful ingenuity and to Jacopo de Pantormo alone it fell to paint all the three cars, 
wherein he executed various scenes in chiascuro of the transformations of the gods into different forms which are now in the possession of pietro paolo galiato an excellent goldsmith the first car bore written in very clear characters the word erimus the second sumus and the third fumus that is we shall be we are and we have been the song began the years fly on having seen these triumphal cars signor lorenzo the head of the company of the ronconi desiring that they should be surpassed gave the charge of the whole work to jacopo nardi a noble and most learned gentleman to whom for what he afterwards became his native city of florence is much indebted this jacopo prepared six triumphal cars in order to double the number of those executed by the diamante the first drawn by a pair of oxen decked with herbage represented the age of saturn and janus called the age of gold and on the summit of the car were saturn with the scythe and janus with the two heads and with the key of the temple of peace in the hand and at his feet a figure of fury bound with a vast number of things around appertaining to saturn all executed most beautifully in different colours by the genius of pantormo accompanying this car were six couples of shepherds naked but for certain parts covered by skins of marten and sable with footwear of various kinds after the ancient manner and with their wallets and on their heads garlands of many kinds of leaves the horses on which these shepherds sat were without saddles but covered with skins of lions tigers and lynxes the paws of which overlaid with gold hung at their sides with much grace and beauty the ornaments of their croups and of the grooms were of gold cord the stirrups were heads of rams dogs and other such-like animals and the bridles and reins made with silver cord and various kinds of verdure each shepherd had four grooms in the garb of shepherd boys dressed more simply in other skins with torches fashioned in the form of dry trunks and branches of pine which made a most beautiful sight upon the second car drawn by two pairs of oxen draped in the richest cloth with garlands on their heads and great paternosters hanging from their gilded horns was numa pompilius the second king of rome with the books of religion and all the sacerdotal instruments and the things appertaining to sacrifices for the reason that he was the originator and first founder of religion and sacrifices among the romans this car was accompanied by six priests on most beautiful she-mules their heads covered with hoods of linen embroidered with silver and gold in a masterly pattern of ivy leaves and on their bodies they had sacerdotal vestments in the ancient fashion with borders and fringes of gold all round and in the hands one had a thurible another a vase of gold and the rest other similar things at their stirrups they had attendants in the guise of levites and the torches that these had in their hands were after the manner of ancient candelabra and wrought with beautiful artistry the third car represented the consulate of titus manlius torquatus who was consul after the end of the first carthaginian war and governed in such a manner that in his time there flourished in rome every virtue and every blessing that car upon which was titus himself with many ornaments executed by pantormo was drawn by eight most beautiful horses and before it went six couples of senators clad in the toga on horses covered with cloth of gold accompanied by a great number of grooms representing lictors with the fasces axes and other things appertaining to the administration of justice the fourth car drawn by four buffaloes disguised as elephants represented julius caesar in triumph for the victory gained over cleopatra the car being all painted by pontormo with his most famous deeds 
that car was accompanied by six couples of men-at-arms clad in rich and brightly shining armor all bordered with gold with their lances on their hips and the torches that the half-armed grooms carried had the form of trophies designed in various ways the fifth car drawn by winged horses that had the form of griffins bore upon it caesar augustus the lord of the universe accompanied by six couples of poets on horseback all crowned as was also caesar with laurel and dressed in costumes varying according to their provinces and these were there because poets were always much favored by caesar augustus whom they exalted with their works to the heavens and to the end that they might be recognized each of them had across his forehead a scroll after the manner of a fillet on which was his name on the sixth car drawn by four pairs of heifers richly draped was trajan that just emperor before whom as he sat on the car which was painted very well by pontarmo there rode upon beautiful and finely caparisoned horses six couples of doctors of law with togas reaching to their feet and with capes of miniver such as it was the ancient custom for doctors to wear the grooms who carried their torches a great number were scriveners copyists and notaries with books and writings in their hands after these six came the car or rather triumphal chariot of the age or era of gold wrought with the richest and most beautiful artistry with many figures in relief executed by bacchio bandinelli and very beautiful paintings by the hand of pantormo among those in relief the four cardinal virtues being highly extolled from the centre of the car rose a great sphere in the form of a globe of the world upon which there lay prostrate on his face as if dead a man clad in armour all eaten with rust who had the back open and cleft and from the fissure there issued a child all naked and gilded who represented the new birth of the age of gold and the end of the age of iron from which he was coming forth into that new birth by reason of the election of that pontiff and this same significance had the dry trunk putting forth new leaves although some said that the matter of that dry trunk was an allusion to the lorenzo de medici who became duke of urbino i should mention that the gilded boy who was the son of a baker died shortly afterwards through the sufferings that he endured in order to gain ten crowns the chant that was sung in that masquerade as is the custom was composed by the above-named jacopo nardi and the first stanza ran thus calui ce de le leghi alla natura e i varie stati e secoli disponi d'ogni bene e cagion e il mal quanto permette al mondo dura ande questa figura contemplando si vede Com concerto piede, l'un secol dopo l'altro el mondo viene, e muta il bene en male, e le male in bene. From the works that he executed for this festival, Pantormo gained, besides the prophet, so much praise that probably few young men of his age ever gained as much in that city wherefore pope leo himself afterwards coming to florence he was much employed in the festive preparations that were made for he had attached himself to bacchio da montelupo a sculptor advanced in years who made an arch of wood at the head of the via del palagio at the steps of the badia and pantormo painted it all with very beautiful scenes which afterwards came to an evil end through the scant diligence of those who had charge of them only one remained that in which pallas is tuning an instrument into accord with the lyre of apollo with great grace and beauty from which scene one is able to judge what excellence and perfection were in the other works and figures 
for the same festivities idolfo girlandajo had received the task of fitting up and embellishing the sala del papa which is attached to the convent of santa maria novella and was formerly the residence of the pontiffs in the city of florence but being pressed for time he was forced to avail himself in some things of the work of others and thus after having adorned all the other rooms he laid on jacopo de pantormo the charge of executing some pictures in fresco in the chapel where his holiness was to hear mass every morning whereupon setting his hand to the work jacopo painted there a god the father with many little angels and a veronica who had the sudarium with the image of jesus christ which work thus executed by jacopo in so short a time was much extolled he then painted in fresco in a chapel of the church of san rufilo behind the archbishop's palace in florence our lady with her son in her arms between sant michelagnolo and santa lucia and two other saints kneeling and in the lunette of the chapel a god the father with some seraphim about him next having been commissioned by maestro jacopo a servite friar as he had greatly desired to paint a part of the court of the servites because andrea del sarto had gone off to france and left the work of that court unfinished he set himself with much study to make the cartoons but since he was poorly provided with the things of this world and was obliged while studying in order to win honor to have something to live upon he executed over the door of the hospital for women behind the church of the priest's hospital between the piazza de san marco and the via de san gallo and exactly opposite to the wall of the sisters of saint catherine of siena two most beautiful figures in chiascuro with christ in the guise of a pilgrim awaiting certain women in order to give them hospitality and lodging which work was deservedly much extolled in those days as it still is by all good judges at this same time he painted some pictures and little scenes in oils for the masters of the mint on the caro della moneta which goes every year in the procession of st john the workmanship of which car was by the hand of marco del tasso and over the door of the company of cecilia on the heights of fiesoli he painted a santa cecilia with some roses in her hand colored in fresco and so beautiful and so well suited to that place that for a work of that kind it is one of the best paintings in fresco that there are to be seen these works having been seen by the above-named servite friar maestro jacopo he became even more ardent in his desire and he determined at all costs to cause jacopo to finish the work in that court of the servites thinking that in emulation of the other masters who had worked there he would execute something of extraordinary beauty in the part that remained to be painted having therefore set his hand to it from a desire no less of glory and honour than of gain jacopo painted the scene of the visitation of the madonna in a manner a little freer and more lively than had been his wont up to that time which circumstance gave an infinite excellence to the work in addition to its other extraordinary beauties in that the women little boys youths and old men are executed in fresco with such softness and such harmony of colouring that it is a thing to marvel at and the flesh colours of a little boy who is seated on some steps and indeed those likewise of all the other figures are such that they could not be done better or with more softness in fresco this work then after the others that jacopo had executed gave a sure earnest of his future perfection to the craftsmen comparing them with those of andrea del sarto and francia Biggio jacopo delivered the work finished in the year fifteen sixteen and received in payment sixteen crowns and no more 
having then been allotted by Francesca Pucci, if I remember rightly, the altarpiece of a chapel that he had caused to be built in San Michel bis Domini in the Via de Servi, Jacopo executed the work in so beautiful a manner, and with a colouring so vivid, that it seems almost impossible to credit it. In this altarpiece, Our Lady, who is seated, is handing the infant Jesus to St. Joseph, in whose countenance there is a smile so animated and so lifelike that it is a marvel. And very beautiful likewise is a little boy painted to represent St. John the Baptist, and also two other little children naked who are upholding a canopy. There may be seen also a St. John the Evangelist, a most beautiful old man, and a St. Francis kneeling, who is absolutely alive, for with the fingers of one hand interlocked with those of the other, and wholly intent in contemplating fixedly, with his eyes and his mind, the Virgin and her Son, he appears really to be breathing. And no less beautiful is the St. James, who may be seen beside the others. Wherefore it is no marvel that this is the most beautiful altarpiece that was ever executed by this truly rare painter. I used to believe that it was after this work, and not before, that the same Jacopo had painted in fresco the two most lovely and graceful little boys who are supporting a coat of arms over a door within a passage on the Longarno, between the Ponte San Trinita and the Ponte alla Caraja for Bartolomeo Lanfredini. But since Bronzino, who may be supposed to know the truth about these matters, declares that they were among the first works that Jacopo executed, we must believe that this is so without a doubt and praise Pantormo for them all the more, seeing that they are so beautiful that they cannot be matched, and yet were among the earliest works that he did. But to resume the order of our story. After these works, Jacopo executed for the men of Pantormo an altarpiece wherein are San Michelagnolo and St. John the Evangelist, which was placed in the chapel of the Madonna in Sant'Agnolo, their principal church. At this time, one of two young men who were working under Jacopo, that is, Giovanni Maria Picci of Borgo, a San Sepolcro, who was acquitting himself passing well, and who afterwards became a servite friar, and executed some works in the Borgo and in the Pieve a San Stefano, while still working, I say, under Jacopo, painted in a large picture a nude Saint Quentin in martyrdom, in order to send it to the Borgo. But since Jacopo, like a loving master to his disciple, desired that Giovanni Maria should win honor and praise, he set himself to retouch it, and so, not being able to take his hands off it, and retouching one day the head, the next day the arms, and the day after the body, the retouching became such that it may almost be said that the work is entirely by his hand. Wherefore it is no marvel that this picture, which is now in the church of the Observantine Friars of St. Francis in the Borgo, is most beautiful. The second of the two young men, who was Giovanni Antonio Lapoli of Arezzo, of whom there has been an account in another place, like a vain fellow had taken a portrait of himself with a mirror, also while he was working under Jacopo. But his master, thinking that the portrait was a poor likeness, took it in hand himself, and executed a portrait that is so good that it has the appearance of life, which portrait is now at Arezzo, in the house of the heirs of that Giovanni Antonio. Pantormo also portrayed in one and the same picture two of his dearest friends, one the son-in-law of Beccuccio Bicchierio, and another, whose name likewise I do not know, it is enough that the portraits are by the hand of Pantormo. He then executed for Bartolomeo Genori, in anticipation of his death, a string of pennons, according to the custom of the Florentines, 
and in the upper part of all these on the white taffeta he painted a madonna with the child and on the coloured fringe below he painted the arms of that family as is the custom for the centre of the string which was of twenty-four pennons he made two all of white taffeta without any fringe on which he painted two figures of saint bartholomew each two brachia high the size of all these pennons and their almost novel manner caused all the others that had been made up to that time to appear poor and mean and this was the reason that they began to be made of the size that they are at the present day with great grace and much less expense for gold at the head of the garden and vineyard of the friars of san gallo without the gate that is called after that saint in a chapel that is in a line with the central entrance he painted a dead christ a madonna weeping and two little angels in the air one of whom was holding the chalice of the passion in his hands and the other was supporting the fallen head of christ on one side was st john the evangelist all tearful with the arms stretched out and on the other st augustine in episcopal robes who leaning with the left hand on the pastoral staff stood in an attitude truly full of sorrow contemplating the dead saviour and for messer spina the familiar friend of giovanni salviati he executed in a courtyard opposite to the principal door of his house the coat of arms of that giovanni who had been made a cardinal in those days by pope leo with a red hat above and two little boys standing works in fresco which are very beautiful and much esteemed by messer filippo spina as being by the hand of pantormo End of section 17. Jacopo di Pantormo, Painter of Florence, Part 2. Section 18 of Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, Volume 7, by Giorgio Vasari, translation by Gaston de C. de Vere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros, Jacopo de Pantormo, Painter of Florence, Part Three. Jacopo also worked in competition with other masters on the ornamentation in wood that was formally executed in a magnificent manner, as has been related elsewhere, in some apartments of Pier Francesco Borgarini, and in particular he painted there with his own hand on two coffers some stories from the life of joseph in little figures which were truly most beautiful and whoever wishes to see the best work that he ever did in all his life in order to consider how able and masterly was jacopo in giving liveliness to heads in grouping figures in varying attitudes and in beauty of invention let him look at a scene of some size likewise in little figures in the corner on the left hand as one enters through the door in the chamber of borgarini who was a nobleman of florence in which scene is joseph in egypt as it were a prince or a king in the act of receiving his father jacob with all his brethren the sons of that jacob with extraordinary affection among these figures he portrayed at the foot of the scene seated upon some steps il bronzino who was then a boy and his disciple a figure with a basket which is lifelike and beautiful to a marvel and if this scene were on a greater scale on a large panel or a wall instead of being small i would venture to say that it would not be possible to find another picture executed with the grace excellence and even perfection wherewith this one was painted by jacopo wherefore it was rightly regarded by all craftsmen as the most beautiful picture that pantormo ever executed nor is it to be wondered at that borgarini should have prized it as he did and should have been besought to sell it by great persons as a present for mighty lords and princes on account of the siege of florence pier francesco retired to lucca 
and Giovan Battista della Palla, who desired to obtain, together with other things that he was transporting into France, the decorations of this chamber, so that they might be presented to King Francis in the name of the Signoria, received such favors, and went to work so effectively with both words and deeds, that the Gonfalonier granted a commission that they should be taken away after payment to the wife of Pier Francesco whereupon some others went with Giovanni Battista to execute the will of the Signori. But when they arrived at the house of Pier Francesco, his wife, who was in the house, poured on Giovanni Battista the greatest abuse that was ever spoken to any man. "'So you make bold, Giovanni Battista,' said she. "'You vile slop-dealer, you little two-penny peddler, "'to strip the ornaments from the chambers of noblemen "'and despoil our city of her richest and most honoured treasures, "'as you have done, and are always doing, "'in order to embellish with them the countries of foreigners, our enemies. "'At you I do not marvel.' you a base plebeian and the enemy of your country but at the magistrates of this city who aid and abet you in these shameful rascalities this bed which you would seize for your own private interest and for greed of gain although you keep your evil purpose cloaked with a veil of righteousness this is the bed of my nuptials in honour of which my husband's father salvi made all these magnificent and regal decorations which i revere in memory of him and from love for my husband and mean to defend with my very blood and with life itself out of this house with these your cutthroats, Giovanni Battista, and go to those who sent you with orders that these things should be removed from their places, for I am not the woman to suffer a single thing to be moved from here. If they who believe in you, a vile creature of no account, wish to make presents to King Francis of France, let them go and strip their own houses, and take the ornaments and beds from their own chambers, and send them to him. And you, if you are ever again so bold as to come to this house on such an errand, I will make you smart sorely for it, and teach you what respect should be paid by such as you to the houses of noblemen." thus spoke madonna margarita the wife of pier francesco borgarini and the daughter of roberto acaioli a most noble and wise citizen and she a truly courageous woman and a worthy daughter of such a father with her noble ardour and spirit was the reason that those gems are still preserved in that house Giovan Maria Benintendi, about this same time, had adorned an antechamber in his house with many pictures by the hands of various able men, and after the work executed for Borgorini, incited by hearing Jacopo da Pantormo very highly praised, he caused a picture to be painted by him with the adoration of the Magi, who went to Bethlehem to see Christ which work, since Jacopo devoted to it much study and diligence, proved to be well varied and beautiful in the heads and in every other part, and to be truly worthy of all praise. Afterwards he executed for Messer Goro da Pastoia, then secretary to the Medici, a picture with the portrait of the magnificent Cosimo de' Medici the Elder, from the knees upwards, which is indeed worthy to be extolled, and this portrait is now in the house of Messer Ottaviano de' Medici, in the possession of his son, Messer Alessandro, a young man. Besides the distinction and nobility of his blood, of most upright character, well lettered, and the worthy son of the magnificent Ottaviano, and of Madonna Francesca, the daughter of Jacopo Salviati, and the maternal aunt of the lord duke cosimo by means of this work and particularly this head of cosimo pantormo became the friend of messer ottaviano and the great hall at poggio a Cano, having then to be painted they were given to him to paint the two ends where the round openings are that give light that is the windows from the vaulting down to the floor 
whereupon desiring to do himself honour even beyond his wont both from regard for the place and from emulation of the other painters who were working there he set himself to study with such diligence that he overshot the mark for the reason that destroying and doing over again every day what he had done the day before he racked his brains in such a manner that it was a tragedy but all the time he was always making new discoveries which brought credit to himself and beauty to the work thus having to execute a vertumnus with his husbandmen he painted a peasant seated with a vine pruner in his hand which is so beautiful and so well done that it is a very rare thing even as certain children that are there are lifelike and natural beyond all belief on the other side he painted pomona and diana with other goddesses enveloping them perhaps too abundantly with draperies however the work as a whole is beautiful and much extolled but while it was being executed leo was overtaken by death and so it remained unfinished like many other similar works at rome florence loreto and other places nay the whole world was left poor being robbed of the true mecenas of men of talent having returned to florence jacobo painted in a picture a seated figure of saint augustine as a bishop who is giving the benediction with two little nude angels flying through the air who are very beautiful which picture is over an altar in the little church of the sisters of san clemente in the via de san gallo he carried to completion, likewise, a picture of a pieta with certain nude angels, which was a very beautiful work, and held very dear by certain merchants of Ragusa, for whom he painted it. But most beautiful of all in this picture was a landscape taken for the most part from an engraving by Albrecht Dürer. He also painted a picture of Our Lady with the Child in her arms, and some little angels about her, which is now in the house of Alessandro Neroni, and for certain Spaniards he executed another like it, that is, of the Madonna, but different from the one described above, and in another manner, which picture, being for sale in a second-hand dealer's shop many years after, was bought by Bartolomeo Panciatici at the suggestion of Bronzino. Then, in the year 1522, there being a slight outbreak of plague in Florence, and many persons therefore departing, in order to avoid that most infectious sickness, and to save themselves, an occasion presented itself to Jacopo of flying the city and removing himself to some distance, for a certain prior of the Certosa, a place built by the Eccaioli three miles away from Florence, had to have some pictures painted in fresco at the corners of a very large and beautiful cloister that surrounds a lawn, and Jacopo was brought to his notice, whereupon the prior had him sought out, and he, having accepted the work very willingly at such a time, went off to Sortosa, taking with him only Bronzino. There, after a trial of that mode of life, that quiet, that silence, and that solitude, all things after the taste and nature of Jacopo, he thought with such an occasion to make a special effort in the matters of art, and to show to the world that he had acquired greater perfection and a different manner since those works that he had executed before. Now, not long before there had come from Germany to Florence, many sheets printed from engravings, done with great subtlety with a Buren by Albrecht Dürer, a most excellent German painter, and a rare engraver of plates on copper and on wood, and among others, many scenes, both large and small, of the Passion of Jesus Christ, in which was all the perfection and excellence of engraving with the Buren that could ever be achieved, what with the beauty and variety of the vestments and the invention. 
Jacopo, having to paint at the corners of those cloisters scenes from the Passion of the Saviour, thought to avail himself of the above-named inventions of Albrecht Dürer, in the firm belief that he would satisfy not only himself, but also the greater part of the craftsmen of Florence, who were all proclaiming with one voice and with common consent and agreement the beauty of those engravings and the excellence of Albrecht setting himself therefore to imitate that manner and seeking to give to the expressions of the heads of his figures that liveliness and variety which albrecht had given to his he caught it so thoroughly that the charm of his own early manner which had been given to him by nature all full of sweetness and grace suffered a great change from that new study and labour and was so impaired through his stumbling on that german manner that in all these works although they are all beautiful there is but a sorry remnant to be seen of that excellence and grace that he had given up to that time to all his figures at the entrance to the cloister then in one corner he painted christ in the garden counterfeiting so well the darkness of night illumined by the light of the moon that it appears almost like daylight and while christ is praying not far distant are peter james and john sleeping executed in a manner so similar to that of durer that it is a marvel not far away is judas leading the jews likewise with a countenance so strange even as the features of all those soldiers are depicted in the german manner with bizarre expressions that it moves him who beholds it to pity for the simplicity of the man who sought with such patience to learn that which others avoid and seek to lose and all to lose the manner that surpassed all others in excellence and gave infinite pleasure to every one did not pontormo know then that the germans and flemings came to these parts to learn the italian manner which he with such effort sought to abandon as if it were bad beside this scene is one in which is christ led by the jews before pilate and in the saviour he painted all the humility that could possibly be imagined in the person of innocence betrayed by the sins of men and in the wife of pilate that pity and dread for themselves which those have who fear the divine judgment which woman while she pleads the cause of christ before her husband gazes into his countenance with pitying wonder Round Pilate are some soldiers so characteristic in the expressions of the faces and in the German garments, that one who knew not by whose hand was that work would believe it to have been executed in reality by ultramontanes. It is true, indeed, that in the distance in this scene there is a cup-bearer of Pilate's that is descending some steps with a basin and a ewer in his hands, carrying to his master the means to wash the hands, who is lifelike and very beautiful, having in him something of the old manner of Jacopo. Having next to paint the resurrection of Christ in one of the other corners, the fancy came to Jacopo, as to one who had no steadfastness in his brain, and was always cogitating new things, to change his colouring and so he executed that work with a colouring in fresco so soft and so good that if he had done the work in another manner than that same german it would certainly have been very beautiful for in the heads of those soldiers who are in various attitudes heavy with sleep and as it were dead there may be seen such excellence that one cannot believe that it is possible to do better. Then, continuing the stories of the Passion in another of the corners, he painted Christ going with the cross upon his shoulder to Mount Calvary, and behind him the people of Jerusalem accompanying him. And in front are the two thieves, naked, between the ministers of justice, who are partly on foot, and partly on horseback, with the ladders, the inscription for the cross, hammers, nails, cords, and other such-like instruments. 
and in the highest part behind a little hill is the madonna with the maries who weeping are awaiting christ who has fallen to the ground in the middle of the scene and has about him many jews that are smiting him while veronica is offering to him the sudarium accompanied by some women both young and old all weeping at the outrage that they see being done to the saviour this scene either because he was warned by his friends or perhaps because jacopo himself at last became aware although tardily of the harm that had been done to his own sweet manner by the study of the german proved to be much better than the others executed in the same place for the reason that certain naked jews and some heads of old men are so well painted in fresco that it would not be possible to do more although the same german manner may be seen constantly maintained in the work as a whole after these he was to have gone on with the crucifixion and the deposition from the cross in the other corners but putting them aside for a time with the intention of executing them last he painted in their stead christ taken down from the cross keeping to the same manner but with great harmony of colouring in this scene besides that of the magdalene who is kissing the feet of christ is most beautiful there are two old men representing joseph of arimathea and nicodemus who although they are in the german manner have the most beautiful expressions and heads of old men with beards feathery and coloured with marvellous softness that there are to be seen now jacopo besides being generally slow over his works was pleased with the solitude of the certosa and he therefore spent several years on these labours and after the plague had finished and he had returned to florence he did not for that reason cease to frequent that place constantly and was always going and coming between the certosa and the city proceeding thus he satisfied those fathers in many things and among others he painted in their church over one of the doors that lead into the chapels in a figure from the waist upwards the portrait of a lay brother of that monastery who was alive at that time and one hundred and twenty years old executing it so well and with such finish such vivacity and such animation that through it alone pantormo deserves to be excused for the strange and fantastic new manner with which he was saddled by that solitude and by living far from the commerce of men besides this he painted for the prior of that place a picture of the nativity of christ representing joseph as giving light to jesus christ in the darkness of the night with a lantern and this in pursuit of the same notions and caprices which the german engravings put into his head now let no one believe that jacopo is to blame because he imitated albrecht durer in his inventions for the reason that this is no error and many painters have done it and are continually doing it but only because he adopted the unmixed german manner in everything in the draperies in the expressions of the heads and in the attitudes which he should have avoided availing himself only of the inventions since he had the modern manner in all the fullness of its beauty and grace for the stranger's apartment of the same monks he painted a large picture on canvas and in oil colours without straining himself at all or forcing his natural powers of christ at table with cleophas and luke figures of the size of life and since in this work he followed the bent of his own genius it proved to be truly marvellous particularly because he portrayed among those who are serving at that table some lay brothers of the convent whom i myself have known in such a manner that they could not be either more lifelike or more animated than they are bronzino meanwhile that is while his master was executing the works described above in the certosa 
pursuing with great spirit the studies of painting, and encouraged all the time by Pantormo, who was very loving with his disciples, executed on the inner side, over an arch above the door of the cloister that leads into the church, without having ever seen the process of painting in oil colors on the wall, a nude St. Lawrence on the gridiron, which was so beautiful that there began to be seen some indication of that excellence to which he has since attained, as will be related in the proper place which circumstance gave infinite satisfaction to Jacopo, who already saw whither that genius would arrive. Not long afterwards there returned from Rome Lodovico di Gino Caponi, who had bought that chapel in Santa Felicita, on the right hand of the entrance into the church, which the Barbadori had formerly caused to be built by Filippo de Sir Brunelesco and he resolved to have all the vaulting painted, and then to have an altarpiece executed for it, with a rich ornament. Having therefore consulted in the matter with Messer Niccolo Vespucci, knight of Rhodes, who was much his friend, the knight, who was also much the friend of Jacopo, and knew into the bargain the talent and worth of that able man, did and said so much that Lodovico allotted that work to Pantormo. And so, having erected an enclosure which kept that chapel closed for three years, he set his hand to the work. On the vaulted ceiling he painted a God the Father, who has about him four very beautiful patriarchs, and in the four medallions at the angles he depicted the four evangelists, or rather he executed three of them with his own hand, and Bronzino one all by himself and with this occasion I must mention that Pantormo used scarcely ever to allow himself to be helped by his assistants, or to suffer them to lay a hand on that which he intended to execute with his own hand. And when he did wish to avail himself of one of them, chiefly in order that they might learn, he allowed them to do the whole work by themselves, as he allowed Bronzino to do here. In the works that Jacopo executed in the said chapel up to this point, it seemed almost as if he had returned to his first manner. But he did not follow the same method in painting the altarpiece, for thinking always of new things, he executed it without shadows, and with a colouring so bright and so uniform, that one can scarcely distinguish the lights from the middle tints, and the middle tints from the darks. In this altarpiece is a dead Christ taken down from the cross and being carried to the sepulchre. There is the Madonna who is swooning, and the Maries, all executed in a fashion so different from his first work, that it is clearly evident that his brain was always busy investigating new conceptions and fantastic methods of painting, not being content with and not fixing on any single method. In a word, the composition of this altarpiece is altogether different from the figures on the vaulting, and likewise the coloring, and the four evangelists which are in the medallions on the spandrels of the vaulting are much better and in a different manner. On the wall where the window is are two figures in fresco, on one side the Virgin, and on the other the Angel, who is bringing her the Annunciation, but so distorted, both the one and the other, that it is evident that, as I have said, that bizarre and fantastic brain was never content with anything and in order to be able to do as he pleased in this, and to avoid having his attention distracted by any one, all the time that he was executing this work, he would never allow even the owner of the chapel himself to see it, insomuch that, having painted it after his own fancy, without any of his friends having been able to give him a single hint, when it was finally uncovered and seen, it amazed all Florence. For the same Lodovico he executed a picture of Our Lady in that same manner for his chamber, 
and in the head of a saint mary magdalene he made the portrait of a daughter of lodovico who was a very beautiful young woman near the monastery of boldroni on the road that goes from there to castello and at the corner of another that climbs the hill and goes to sorsina that is at a distance of two miles from florence he painted in fresco in a shrine christ crucified our lady weeping st john the evangelist st augustine and san giuliano all which figures his caprice not being yet satisfied and the german manner still pleasing him are not very different from those that he executed at the sortosa he did the same also in an altarpiece that he painted for the nuns of santa anna at the porta a san friano in which altarpiece is our lady with the child in her arms and saint anne behind her with saint peter saint benedict and other saints and in the predella is a small scene with little figures which represent the signoria of florence as it used to go in procession with trumpeters pipers mace-bearers messengers and ushers with the rest of the household and this he did because the commission for that altar-piece was given to him by the captain and the household of the palace the while that jacopo was executing this work alessandro and ippolito de medici who were both very young having been sent to florence by pope clement the seventh under the care of the legate silvio passerini bishop of cortona the magnificent ottaviano to whom the pope had straitly recommended them had the portraits of both of them taken by pantormo who served him very well and made them very good likenesses although he did not much depart from the manner that he had learned from the germans in the portrait of ippolito he also painted a favorite dog of that lord called rodan and made it so characteristic and so natural that it might be alive he took the portrait likewise of bishop ardingeli who afterwards became a cardinal and for filippo del migliori who was much his friend he painted in fresco in his house on the via larga in a niche opposite to the principal door a woman representing pomona from which it appeared that he was beginning to seek to abandon in part his german manner now giovan battista della pala perceived that by reason of many works the name of jacopo was becoming every day more celebrated and since he had not succeeded in sending to king francis the pictures executed by that same master and by others for borgarini he resolved knowing that the king had a desire for them at all costs to send him something by the hand of pantormo whereupon he so went to work that he persuaded jacopo to execute a most beautiful picture of the raising of lazarus which proved to be one of the best works that he ever painted and that was ever sent by giovan battista among the vast number that he sent to king francis of france for besides that the heads were most beautiful the figure of lazarus whose spirit as he returned to life was re-entering his dead flesh could not have been more marvellous for about the eyes he still had the hue of corruption and the flesh cold and dead at the extremities of the hands and feet where the spirit had not yet come in a picture of one braccio and a half he painted for the sisters of the hospital of the innocenti with an infinite number of little figures the story of the eleven thousand martyrs who were condemned to death by diocletian and all crucified in a wood in this jacopo represented a battle of horsemen and nude figures very beautiful and some most lovely little angels flying through the air who are shooting arrows at the ministers of the crucifixion and in like manner about the emperor who is pronouncing the condemnation are some most beautiful nude figures who are going to their death 
this picture which in every part is worthy to be praised is now held in great price by don vincenzio borghini the director of that hospital who once was much the friend of jacopo another picture similar to that described above he painted for carlo neroni but only with the battle of the martyrs and the angel baptizing them and then the portrait of carlo himself he also executed a portrait at the time of the siege of florence of francesco guardi in the habit of a soldier which was a very beautiful work and on the cover of this picture bronzino afterwards painted pygmalion praying to venus that his statue receiving breath might spring to life and become as according to the fables of the poets it did flesh and blood at this time after much labor there came to jacopo the fulfillment of a desire that he had long had in that having always felt a wish to have a house that might be his own so that he should no longer live in the house of another but might occupy his own and live as pleased himself finally he bought one in the via della colonna opposite to the nuns of santa maria degli angeli the siege finished pope clement commanded messer ottaviano de medici that he should cause the hall of poggio Arcano to be finished whereupon francia bigio and andrea del sarto being dead the whole charge of this was given to pantormo who after having the staging and the screens made began to execute the cartoons but for the reason that he went off into fantasies and cogitations beyond that he never set a hand to the work this perchance would not have happened if bronzino had been in those parts who was then working at the imperiali a place belonging to the duke of urbino near pesaro which bronzino although he was sent for every day by jacopo nevertheless was not able to depart at his own pleasure for the reason that after he had executed a very beautiful naked cupid on the spandrel of a vault in the imperiali and the cartoons for the others prince guidobaldo having recognized the young man's genius ordained that his own portrait should be taken by him and seeing that he wished to be portrayed in some armor that he was expecting from lombardy bronzino was forced to stay with that prince longer than he could have wished during that time he painted the case of a harpsichord which much pleased the prince and finally bronzino executed his portrait which was very beautiful and the prince was well satisfied with it Jacopo then wrote so many times and employed so many means that in the end he brought Bronzino back, but for all that the man could never be induced to do any other part of this work than the cartoons, although he was urged to it by the magnificent Ottaviano and by Duke Alessandro. In one of these cartoons, which are now for the most part in the house of Lodovico Caponi, is a hercules who is crushing antaeus in another a venus and adonis and in yet another drawing a scene of nude figures playing football end of section eighteen jacopo de pantormo painter of florence part three